So it's my great pleasure welcoming you here today um, in the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg um, at the Aspen Germany Conference on uh, Trade and Tech, the German-American Trade and Tech Conference. It's the second time um, that we are able to conduct uh, this conference together with our strong partners and here in these premises. And I'm really delighted to see so many of you here today, while I know that outside the sun is shining and the first spring is in the air. Um, and uh, given this, I'm particularly happy that so many of you made the way here today. Um, for those who do not know me yet, I'm Stormy Milner. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Germany and have been doing this um, over the last uh, three years. And I am going to be your host and your tour guide throughout the next one and a half days. And before we really get started, um, let me say a few words about the logistics um, of this tour. Um, today and tomorrow. As you know, this is a hybrid event, so I'm really happy to welcome all of you here on the ground, but I'm also really happy to everybody who couldn't make it here today or who is joining us from another country, so welcome also to our virtual participants uh, today. Um, this is going to be, I hope, I, I mean, at least I hope, and it's been that way in the past, a very interactive uh, conference. So we have different formats. Uh, tonight, for example, we have an Oxford-style debate um, where you will cheer for one team or the other. We will be discussing whether or not technology is massively good for democracy or maybe not so good, and you will cheer for your team, and in the end we'll see which team won, in your opinion. We also will have a um, open seat discussion tomorrow morning, where we will have two fantastic journalists talking about the future of transatlantic relations in an open chair. Um, and you will be invited to join the discussion for a couple of minutes, not just to ask a question, but really to engage um, and then hand over um, to another participant to come up here. We also have breakout sessions tomorrow. We call them in-depth sessions, where we will have the opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into individual topics. So if you haven't signed up for one of the um, topics, please do so up at the front at the reception, because it makes us our life a little easier, getting you into the room in which uh, you want to be. And then we can also do a little bit better planning how much room we really need. Um, keep in mind, this is open press. So whatever you say could be cited either on our social media channels um, or in the wider public. Um, you might know Aspen as doing a lot of Chatham House rule events. This is not one of them. So <laughs> please um, also report about the conference, what we have said, um, post on social media. We also have a hashtag. We are really happy to spread um, our discussion as widely um, as possible. The whole event would not have been possible without our strong partners. And one of those strong partners, who has been that over the last years, is this house is the state, the state of Baden-Württemberg. We wouldn't be here without them. Thank you so much for having us. Give them a big applause that we can be here. And also, events like this take a lot of effort, but it also takes some financial resources um, and also the input. So um, today, I also want to very strongly thank our partners and supporters, um, Bosch, the US Embassy, Meta, Microsoft, BASF, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, SAP, the Association of the German Trade Fair Industry, Allianz, Adalan AI, and Dean. And without all of you, we also wouldn't be here. Um, and many of you are going to be on panels and being engaged um, in our topical discussions um, because you are um, a supporter of this event in all means, content-wise, as well as financially. So thank you very, very much, and give them also a big applause. And last but not least, I also want to thank our media partners, um, who have been strong partners over the last years as well. Um, it is Internationale Politik Quarterly. It is uh, the Tagesspiegel background, cybersecurity and uh, Politico. So thank you so much for being here again and partnering with 
us. And certainly, all our appreciation goes to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, if you have taken a look at our um, program, you will see a, um, you might also think, massive lineup of speakers. But I can promise you that um, we will have fantastic discussions. Because what we always want to do is bring always Americans and Germans up here and all different stakeholders. So policymakers, politicians, business representatives, and then you turn up with slightly larger panels, but I promise you it's going to be a fantastic discussion. Um, now I want to hand over to a virtual participant. She couldn't join us today um, because there are a lot of meetings um, and important committee sessions going on currently um, in Baden-Württemberg. So I hand over virtually to Dr. Um, Nicole Hofmeister-Kraut, the Minister of Economic Affairs, Labor and Tourism of the state of Baden-Württemberg. Uh, the floor is you us digitally. Um, thank you so much um, for introducing us to this day. Dear ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and esteemed participants, greetings and a warm welcome from Stuttgart. The state of Baden-Württemberg is very happy to host again the German-American Trade and Tech Conference in our state representation in Berlin, which reflects the importance of dialogue and exchange between our two nations on these two topics trade and tech. Despite the tough global economic situation, the US remains Baden-Württemberg's most important trade and economic partner. In the year 2023, Baden-Württemberg exported goods worth 36.4 million euros to and imported goods worth 18.5 billion euros from the US. Today, as we navigate enormous geopolitical tensions, it's crucial to further deepen and strengthen not only our close economic ties, but also our transatlantic friendship based on shared democratic values. The jointly established EU-US Trade and Technology Council, the TTC, is a good example and an important instrument to expand bilateral trade and investment. In my opinion, TTC can also be the perfect platform to work on economic security in emerging technologies, including secure digital infrastructure, advanced semiconductors, quantum systems, and trustworthy AI. So together, we should strengthen the role of the TTC in fostering our bilateral EU-US trade relationship. Future technologies, such as AI, have the power to transform our economy, which is why they only can be successfully developed in partnership. With Cyber Valley in Tübingen and the Innovation Park Artificial Intelligence, the IPI, in Heilbronn, Baden-Württemberg is already promoting excellent AI ecosystems in order to take advantage of the opportunities offered by AI, while at the same time focusing on the highest quality and ethical standards. Today's conference is a testament to our shared vision for the future, one that embraces the potential of technology to reshape industries, foster innovation and drive sustainable growth. Thank you for being part of this significant transatlantic conference. I wish you a fruitful exchange and great discussions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffmann Kraut. And yes, please give her a big applause. One important thing I forgot to mention, if you do have any questions with regard to logistics or speaker or whatever, I have a wonderful team um, who is always ready to support and help you. Um, and maybe team, maybe you can stand up quickly so that everybody sees you. There they are. So um, if you need any kind of help, just let us know and we will also try to make your life um, easier. So the conference title, as you know, is Transformation Transatlantic Visions of um, in Action. So the transatlantic partnership is one, and if you go onto our, um, the webpage of the German Federal Office, um, you will read the most important pillars of German foreign policy. And this is in part, certainly, because of the big transatlantic market we are sharing um, of $8.7 trillion. And we are certainly very important geoeconomic and geopolitical partners. Um, and in trade terms, um, for a long time, the United States has been our most important trading partner. If you take 
goods and services together, export and imports, quite a bit more important than China. And the same accounts for investment. And if you look at how many companies are on the ground in the United States and how many people then employ, the number I find is pretty impressive, with almost um, 900, uh, 930,000 jobs uh, currently in the United States. But of course, this is not the only thing which connects us. Economics is one thing, but friendships, networks, interactions are another. And um, now I will, in essence style, give you two minutes to turn around to your neighbor and ask them about their relationship to the United States. Or to Germany. So introduce yourself and say, what's your connection? <laughs> So and now I do have to interrupt you again. I'm so sorry. And I almost need the bell. <laughs> okay, what have I done? What have I done? So, could I ask for your attention again? <laughs> so this is exactly the kind of buzz we want to have at this conference. We want you to take the opportunity to get to know each other, to build networks, to form friendships, um, and to exchange on different topics um, and maybe persuade each other of different views. So thank you so much for engaging in this uh, quick warm-up exercise. The transatlantic economy, apart from economics and also apart from um, our joint networks and friendships, is built on a common understanding and values. We all believe in freedom, in a society where we can express our positions, where we can make choices. We all believe in a society which is built on respect, on empathy and compassion. We believe in a society which allows for pluralism, diversity, but also the feeling of belonging. And we believe in justice and the rule of law, and certainly also in a peaceful and security environment. And now you might ask, why is she saying that we know all this? I'm saying this because these values are under attack. They are under attack from within, unfortunately, and they are also under attack from abroad. Um, we are all facing really challenging times. Um, since February 24, uh, 2022, we all know that the worst war since the Second World War is raging on our continent just around the corner. And there is no end uh, in, in, in sight. Um, our chancellor announced a Zeitenwende, not just for German policy, but unfortunately also a Zeitenwende in international relations. Um, but uh, Russia's brutal war against Ukraine is not the only um, a factor or, or trend we are seeing which calls in a Zeitenwende. We see also a, another, a lot of other autocracies and other regimes really challenging all those values uh, which I have referred to. And if we look into the world, lots of new conflicts um, have emerged, some cold, some medium, some hot, um, and it's really worrisome, and uh, I don't have to mention um, the uh, brutal attacks of Hamas um, on um, Israel, and now the war raging um, in the region. So, pen we, we, over the last few years, we have really faced a lot of challenges. The pandemic, economic downturn, new conflicts, new wars. And in this, or in this environment, the transatlantic relationship becomes ever more important. And to know a little bit more um, about where we currently stand in the relationship, we have prepared a poll which we now would like to do with you. So I need my team to um, help me um, guide through this. So um, if we could bring up the first slide with the first well, that is the really important slide. So where you find the poll, um, we are, um, if you either scan um, this little picture, you should come 
to this um, immediately, or if you type in slido.com and this number, you come to our polling. And if you have problems uh, uh, with the access um, of the in internet, um, you can also use Wi-Fi, and this, this is the code. So I hope this is going to work. Give you a couple of minutes. So we bring up the first question. OK. So in our first question, we want to know um, how you would rate the current state of the transatlantic relationship. Do you think it is excellent? Do you think it is good? Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's poor? Or do you think it's very poor? And time is running now. Ah. Okay, it's still going strong, but I think we are almost, almost done. Okay, so um, 50, it's, it's still moving a little bit, but um, 49, around almost 50% of you are saying um, it is fair. 37 are saying it's good, about 12% are saying it's poor, only 2% are saying it's excellent, but luckily nobody is saying very poor. So this reflects um, pretty much um, what also bigger polls are showing us. Um, if you look at the Bertelsmann pools, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, polls um, or also the polls of uh, Pew Research, this is pretty much how the picture generally looks like. I would assume if we had done this, uh, polling four years ago or five years ago might have looked a slightly bit different. Um, so now we want to know also, and we are going to see the next question. And we are asking in this one, and I'm asking um, first to bring up the next slide for us. Perfect. So with, within the realm of trade and technology, which area do you think requires the most immediate attention in transatlantic relations? Would you say it's supply chain security and resilience? Would you say it's harmonization? efforts um, in, um, sci in, in cyber? Um, would you say it is sustainable development and climate change? Or do you think it's navigating the ethical, economic, and social impl implement implications of advanced technologies? Okay. Still moving a little bit. Give you a few more seconds. Okay. And with this, I also close this question and um, not a super huge majority, <laughs> but a majority of you is saying that harmonization of regulatory frameworks to facilitate trade and technolo technological innovation is really important. Um, and for this, I'm very happy that one of our partners and supporters and also speaker of today um, is Dean. Um, could you maybe stand up so that we see you? Because you won this polling question. Ah, could you? <laughs> there she is. Um, and um, you will also join us on a panel tomorrow. So thank you so much um, for, for this as well. But many of you are saying also that cybersecurity and national security is really important. Supply chains as well. Um, and um, the ethical um, implement, Im implications as well as sustainable development are important topics as well. So we come to the last question, and um, this is, we would also like to take a look into the future. So here, and I'm asking also again for the next slide to come up. So what would you say? How do you envision the development of transatlantic trade and technology, technological 
relations one year from now. And obviously, this is after the elections for the European Parliament, and it is after the US elections. So this is interesting. <laughs> the question might also tell us a little bit about what you think will be the outcome of the elections in the US. <laughs> or at least you're not 100% sure. Um, so what this tells us is 34, or at least more than 30% of you think it might significantly worsen. Um, but many of you are saying also it might slightly worsen, um, maybe also depending on the outcome of the elections. Um, but very little, very few of you are saying um, that they are going to improve. And I take this as an important, really important pointer that we do have to do something for the transatlantic relationship. Um, because what that also shows us, and also the last three years, the last four years and the years before, um, in Germany we would say, Transatlantic relations are important, stable, and based on shared values and experiences and history, but they are not a Selbstläufer. doesn't really translate in self-runner. <laughs> but they do not come always automatically, but there can be conflicts. Um, so throughout the day, what we want to discuss with you is we will start um, with a fantastic panel um, on um, how the US and Germany are advancing the green transition and the digital transition and also investing a lot of money into their economies. Um, and some is undiscriminatory and some might be a little bit more discriminatory. Some measures might uh, bring us closer together. And last year, we discussed intensely the Inflation Reduction Act. Some some measures might also drive us a little bit further apart. Um, and this is what we want to start out with. Then we will also talk about um, cybersecurity issues, and I'm being given um, a sign that the ambassador is on the way. That is, that is perfect. Um, and she is just coming in from the front up here, from the side. Very good. So thank you so much. Um, this, is, this is good to, to know so that I don't go over time. Um, we will look at cybersecurity and cooperation. We will also take a look at the multilateral trading system and the WTO. And I know that some of you are fans and some are not so much fans anymore. We will look at export controls. We will look at investment screening. And we want to look at, uh, at greening the economy. And we want to do something which is really dear to my heart. We also want to take a mirror and put it in front of ourselves by inviting representatives from uh, emerging economies to talk with us about the transatlantic relationship, what we do, and if that is the correct way. So that we do get out of our own bubble and also hear and discuss what they need, what we can do together, and how to strengthen our partnerships. So I want to end my introductory words by um, uh, quoting um, our chancellor. And he said, transatlantic relations are better than they have been for many years, particularly between Germany and the US. And he says, trust on talking and discussing with each other again and again. And that is what we want to do talk with each other, build trust, and build new networks. And with this, thank you so much for coming. Um, and I would now invite the US team to join the room with the ambassador, which is going to be a very special treat that she took the time uh, to join us. So, yes, well. <laughs> So Emily is giving me the sign that we still have two minutes. <laughs> I could invite you to continue the discussion with your neighbors, but I'm not going to do it because it worked so well last time that I almost couldn't get you back. <laughs> so we're just going to wait a couple of minutes.
This is, uh, this is the minute of suspense we have been building up. Um, <laughs> and this is like um, the Hollywood star coming into the door and everybody waiting um, and cheering. Amy Goodman, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we know that you have an extremely busy schedule um, with everything going on. Um, and we appreciate very much that you take uh, the time being here with us uh, today. Um, you all know the ambassador. She doesn't need an introduction. Um, she has served her government, but also the transatlantic relationship, and also us over the last two years. I remember um, after the election of Biden, um, when we all did not yet know who was going to be the ambassador, and then you were announced, um, some might have thought, oh, a university professor and a university president becoming ambassador, that's a change. That might be different. Um, but many, many also said immediately, um, she's going to be the right woman for the right job, the right time, because you bring um, along so much personal uh, compassion, empathy, um, the desire to allow for exchanges, for learning, um, for bringing in young people, for building up the transatlantic relationship from below, from the middle, from the above, and really to bring us uh, closer um, together. And I can say, if we would now do a vote or a polling for if we can keep you for, <laughs> for another three or four years, I'm very sure it would be 100%. We want to thank you very much for the service you have done um, for the transatlantic relationship um, and uh, for being here. And with this, without further ado, I want to give you the floor because now you are the woman of the moment um, and I want to um, ask you to come up here. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Stormy and Dr. Hoffenmeister Kraut and Aspen. Please, uh, really, thank you all for inviting me here. And I want to say a few words, if I might, that puts the topic of this conference into. Uh, important global context. Uh, this is an incredibly important year. It's an important year for many reasons, not the least of which are elections taking place in Europe, the United States, not that anyone has noticed that, right, and around the world. Uh, more people than ever before will go to the polls this year. According to the New York Times, some two billion people, wrap your minds around that, two billion people, about half the adult population of the world, will have the chance to vote in over 60 countries in the United States and Europe, where all 27 member countries of the EU will vote in parliamentary elections, in addition to national and local elections. Nevertheless, according to Freedom Watch, which monitors the health of democracies, global freedom declined for the 17th consecutive year in 2023. 17 years in a row has seen the decline of democracies worldwide. As you know, Stormy has said, I'm a scholar of democracy. I've taught it, I've written about it, and I've practiced it now as ambassador. I learned it actually, the importance of democracies at the feet of my father as a child. Uh, from the youngest age I can imagine, my father told me the story of the demise of Weimar Germany, a democracy. Uh, he died when I was 16. So everything he taught me became really, really important to guide me in life. And he taught me how important it is to stand up, speak out, 
early and often for democracy, against hatred, against anti-Semitism, and all forms of hatred if we care about preserving our democracy. So the question is, democracy we know is on the ballot. And these elections will have, have effects for human rights, for economies, for international relations, and the prospects for peace in our world. So what is the question? The question is, will democracy win? That is a question that is on the ballot and on our agendas. Will this year be a milestone in democracy's long journey to an ever more equitable world? And the answer isn't in a crystal ball. The answer is it's up to us. The stakes are really high. It is literally up to us, the citizens of the democracies of the world. And the fact that it's on the ballot is clear in the challenges we face. Putin's continued war on Iraq, Hamas's terrorist attack on Israel and the war in the Middle East, the market distorting behaviors of authoritarian leaders, and the potential disruptive and advancing effects of new technologies. From the beginning of his administration, President Biden has shown a deep commitment to strengthening the transatlantic alliance, a commitment for our shared values and interests, including the vigor of our transatlantic economy. In June 2021, less than six months after taking office, President Biden and European Commission President von der Leyen launched the idea of the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council as a platform for collaboration on trade and technology. The TTC, as it's called, abbreviation, recognizes that the United States and Europe, representing almost half of the world's GDP, working together we can have a tremendous, a tremendous and lasting impact on the rules and norms that affect both trade and existing and emerging technologies. The fifth ministerial meeting of the TTC was in January of this year, and the sixth ministerial will take place next month in Louvain. There are 10 working groups on issues ranging from climate and clean tech to data governance and export controls. Much of the work of the TTC takes place um, in Washington and Brussels and between Washington and Brussels. And the content and tenor of the discussions are not very well known in Berlin or Baden-Württemberg. Uh, they exist largely in a kind of Brussels bubble, if you will. But in this super election year, the issues on the multiple TTC platforms, the tables, are of enormous relevance. And that's what I want to speak to today. These issues include the resilience of transatlantic trade and international relations and investment, the strength of sustainable supply chains, the impact of emerging technologies, and the interrelationship of geopolitical and economic challenges. The TTC continues to address issues ranging from technology standards and export controls to non-market policies and economic coercion that we're seeing from authoritarian autocratic governments. What we're doing together is working to protect sensitive technologies so that they can't be used against us, and we're also moving to reduce unwanted dependencies. Uh, we are working to ensure that we have diversified, resilient, and secure supply chains in areas like critical minerals. 
And that's super important because if we are completely dependent, for example, on the People's Republic of China for certain critical minerals, then Xi, who is an authoritarian ruler, really has it in his power to shut down enormous parts of our economies. We've set very high standards for development, financing, infrastructure, and trade. And we've moved, very importantly, to advance climate goals, protect the environment, improve pandemic preparedness. Does anyone remember the pandemic? It's easy to forget it. Um, in our daily lives, it's pretty hard to forget those years and how traumatic they were. But we have to keep that in mind that we have to prepare for the next one. Because if we're going to avert pandemics, we have to be prepared. And we also want to promote macroeconomic stability. And those are just a few of the really important things we need to do together. TTC is an indispensable tool in facilitating this transatlantic economic cooperation. It's helped us to stand up to the challenges to our democratic values and our economies that we hold so dear and the freedoms and our security that we hold so dear. And if anyone doubts the ongoing challenges to those values, they need look no further than the death of Alexei Navalny last month. While we were at the Munich Security Conference, my colleagues and I and many people from Washington and many people from Berlin, um, including the now widow of Alexei Navalny, um, we were given, as if we needed it, and I hope nobody here in this room needed it, a grim reminder of the brutality of Putin and his government to anyone who opposes him, including Russian citizens, Russia's neighbors, and other countries. We are transatlantic partners. And as transatlantic partners, the United States and Germany have stood together to support the brave people of Ukraine in the face of Russia's aggression. That is really the story of my start as ambassador, Stormy, just two and a half, not even two and a half years ago. This was my third Munich Security Conference this year. But I began with the priorities of encouraging, urging Germany to end Nord Stream 2, to modernize its military, and to get up to 2% in its commitment to NATO. Very shortly after the end of the Munich Security Conference, February 24th, to be precise, 2022, Russia reinvaded Ukraine. Germany had said to us, if that happens, we will be with you. We will be with you, and we will stand with you, and we will stand with Ukraine. Three days after the reinvasion, February 27th, Chancellor Schultz declared a Zeitenwende. It was the word of the year, right? And now Germany is the second largest contributor to Ukraine's security and humanitarian needs. Nobody would have predicted that three years ago, indeed two and a half years ago. But I heard that commitment at the Munich Security Conference. And that commitment, along with saying, we know we do things slower than we wish and you wish, but if we say we'll be with you, we will be with you. You can take our word. And indeed, Germany has lived up to that promise. And Germany plays a greater role in NATO and the EU today than perhaps ever before. And that's not a luxury. It's a necessity. And as much as Germans will say to me how much 
we need, as Germans say, the United States. You need to know the United States needs Germany. We need our transatlantic partners. And we need them for security. We need them for the defense of our democracy. And yes, we need them for trade and investment because those three things are mutually interdependent. Those three things are what makes not simply or not even mainly the political classes or the business leaders and the business CEOs or the heads of foundations move forward and thrive. That's what makes our citizens security and freedom and prosperity possible. We should never, ever take that for granted. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine was a stark reminder of the risks of dependence on authoritarian states for critical components of our supply chains. Dozens of countries came together to deny Russia much of the technology that they need to conduct the war. And through that effort, we've built new bridges between our alliances and Europe and in the Indo-Pacific. And make no mistake about it, we will be with Ukraine as long as it takes. Chancellor Schultz has said that. President Biden has said that. And that is a bipartisan view in our country. Despite the problems of our Congress, the vast majority of our Congress people and the majority of Americans are committed to stand with Ukraine, as are the majority of Germans. That is incredibly important. And it's really important that we continue to build new bridges in our alliances with Germany, Europe, and in the Indo-Pacific. Transatlantic security is intimately connected to this conference focus. Trade, tech, and transformation. As innovation moves forward at an exponential rate, we need to apply what we've learned from our cooperation and collaboration to future technological challenges. Future economic growth will largely be driven by advances in artificial intelligence, in biomedical sciences, and the green economy. And these are three areas that as president of the University of Pennsylvania, I was heavily invested in, in moving them forward at the level of discovery and seeing those discoveries move into the marketplace, including with BioNTech, which is in Mainz, Germany, and a partnership between a then small company and Pfizer propelled by messenger RNA technology that was discovered at the University of Pennsylvania. That's our future, and it will be critical to us leaning into that future to advance our economies and the global economy and to stand up to global challenges. Autocratic countries also work really, really hard to establish global rules based on their own values. Their values do not call for a level playing field. They do not call for a free press. They do not call for a free civil society or open markets, let alone democratic practices. We need to take our own side in this argument. And if we don't take our own side, we know others will not take it, they will take us over. Transatlantic cooperation can help our companies maintain competitiveness and inform our work as we develop rules of the road for emerging technologies that reflect our shared values and interests. So the TTC has also given us room to air our respective disagreements. And so nothing I say Nothing I say is meant to paper over the fact that allies and partners have disagreements. I don't know about you, but anybody who's been married or had close friendship knows you have your disagreements. 
you work them out. And you don't work them out through violence, because otherwise those relationships end. What the TTC has done is given us room to air our respective differences and work them out. Um, we have rebuilt trust. It's enabled us to find solutions to problems when we didn't see eye to eye. And one example is the continuity of transatlantic data flows that underpin our one and a half trillion dollar transatlantic relationship. In the summer of 2020, a decision by the Court of Justice of the European Union invalidated the framework on which more than 5,000 US companies relied to conduct transatlantic trade in compliance with EU data protection rules. Through the TTC, we were able to come to a resolution that met the requirements on both sides of the Atlantic through the new US-EU data privacy framework. It's an ex excellent example of how partners and allies work together, friends. Because when you're sitting around a table, you develop relationships, bonds of friendship, work out their differences. And they're generally through compromises. Nobody gets everything from their original position, but everybody feels and does move forward. We're now working on a global steel arrangement that prioritizes trading partners that have green steel, green aluminum, and sustainable sources of energy. Tremendous progress has also been made on the alignment of technology standards to strengthen resilience in supply chains, particularly in semiconductors. Incredibly important. We're working together in the implementation of the CHIPS Act the Commerce Department alone has $50 billion of US taxpayer money to invest, and the EU is also putting a great deal of money in energy and climate-related initiatives. And we're working together to counter the non-market practices of the People's Republic of China, practices that include Beijing's adoption of measures to favor Chinese enterprises over their foreign counterparts, trade dumping, interference in foreign enterprises operating in China, and pressure on Chinese enterprises to engage in intellectual property theft and technology transfers against foreign enterprises. So together, the US and Germany are pursuing an approach that is competitive without veering into confrontation or conflict. We do not seek confrontation or conflict, but we do want to compete on a level playing field with China. Last summer, Germany published its first ever China strategy. The strategy shows that Germany and the United States view the challenges posed by the PRC in much the same way. There's still a lot of work to be done in aligning specifics of our approaches, but what we have shown is essential, which is that we can work together to support our free market practices and to counter the abuses of our rules-based approach. Look, the United States and the EU are each other's largest investors. We account for the largest bilateral trade relationship in the world. And together, we have to build the architecture of the global economy of the future. And if we don't, our adversaries will. We need and we are committed to building one that's founded on the rule of law, on transparency, on free markets, and on our shared democratic values, which underpin our ability to work together well. The United States, EU, and NATO, and other international partners need to work even harder to incorporate our shared values into the new global challenges that we face. So, as ambassador to Germany, my mission and the mission of the embassy here in Berlin 
and throughout our five consulates in Germany is the strength and resilience of the U.S.-German partnership. President Biden and I believe that this strength and resilience is absolutely critical, absolutely critical to the overall health of Euro-Atlantic relations. And this belief long precedes our presidents and my beliefs. And that's what I really want to emphasize, that this is not something that comes and goes. For almost 80 years, our two countries have staunchly supported each other. From President Truman's order of an airlift to save Berlin, to President George Herbert Walker Bush's support for German reunification at the Cold War's end, America has stood by Germany's side. Yeah, thank you. When the United States was attacked on 9-11, Germany did not hesitate for a moment to invoke Article 5 of our NATO alliance to stand with the United States. We also owe you eternal gratitude for that. And now we are working shoulder to shoulder supporting Ukraine. Despite changing policy priorities and the coming and going of different coalition governments and administrations, our deep partnership has met every challenge and will continue to meet every challenge. Is it easy? Hell no. Is it important? You bet. And don't ever bet against the transatlantic relationship. Never. This, yes. So I want to end with something that happened quite recently, which was the third Oval Office visit of the Chancellor with President Biden. I was there for all three, and it was all have been memorable. The last one, just a few months ago, um, Chancellor Schultz described our interdependence as a strength pointing to the increasing number of both U.S. direct investments in Germany and German investments in the United States. It is important, I quote, he said, that we do everything we can to ensure that these economic relationships continue to develop, end quote. The Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council, TTC, and also conferences like this help to move the needle to make sure that happens. We all have to work to make sure that happens. It doesn't happen automatically. There are a lot of pressures in the reverse direction. But together, we can, we should, and we must resist them. By discussing our approaches to the advancement of our shared values and goals and the risks and opportunities as we go forward, we can find ways to deepen our cooperation and collaboration, both on a bilateral basis, the U.S.-German relation, and a multilateral basis, EU, U.S., NATO. This will make our nation stronger and more secure. This is also how we can all stand up for democracy. And democracy stands for the values we share. Standing up and speaking out for democracy in our trade and investment relationships, in our healthy competition, that underlines all our work at Embassy Berlin in U.S. Mission Germany. There's nothing more resilient and stronger than our ongoing increasing trade and investment and our relationships at the civil society level. Our exchange programs between German and U.S. citizens, that we have now had over a million alumni of those exchange programs that Germany and the United States invest in. And some of you are undoubtedly products of those exchange programs. That creates the friendship 
and the understanding that is irreplaceable and the business relationships that occur between our countries. Again, it creates the relationships and the friendships that are irreplaceable. Is there competition? Yes. Is it healthy? Hell yes. That's the way we move our economies forward. So I want to end by simply thanking you again, Aspen, and to the representation of the state of Baden-Württemberg and all the sponsors for bringing us together, supporting this dialogue, and please continue to be proud as I am and very thankful for the fact that together the US and Germany is standing up, speaking out, and working hard, working to further our democracy and further our mutual economies. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. When the ambassador gave her first speech um, uh, in her tenure, uh, she did so down in Dahlem at the Free University. And she said that um, her goal and her mission um, for her ambassadorship is uh, advance our alliances, innovate inclusive inclusivity, and defend democracy. And I think um, she just underlined um, with great emphasis that she, what she has been doing and what she is continuing um, over, hopefully, um, more than this, uh, this year. So we can't give her another applause because she was already whisked away. Um, but <laughs> it was really wonderful that her team made it possible um, for her to be here today. And also um, a great thank you to the embassy for supporting um, this conference. And since she also mentioned Mainz, I can tell you that we have just returned from Mainz. Um, and she also mentioned exchange programs. Um, we also have one of those exchange programs. And we bring together state legislators um, from the United States, 10 of them, from Canada, another 10, and from Germany, another 10. Um, and we um, do so for the course of a whole year. They join up and they talk and discuss one specific topic. This year it is critical infrastructure. And we build bridges, um, not just across those three countries, but also across party lines, because we have just as many Republicans and Democrats. We have our parties um, and also the Canadian parties, and we try to build um, better understanding um, across sometimes also divides. Um, and we are very happy to show you the results of this uh, cohort um, at the end of the year. So now it is my great pleasure to lead us forward to take the journey further to our first panel. And um, since um, one person in each panel always has a lot of work in preparation, then takes the effort to making the panel really go well, um, and then in the end doesn't get often warm words or an applause, I want to give her um, an applause in the beginning. So um, it is our moderator for the next panel. Um, Julia Wackett, um, please come up here and join us on the stage. <laughs> So, Julia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you um, are reporting for Politico, exactly. um, an exciting, um, long-time U.S. political, I mean, not just for political buffs, um, but for everybody, magazine, which is now very strong also in Europe um, and, uh, and in Germany. Um, and um, since the moderator usually doesn't take a uh, position of herself during the moderation, I want to take that opportunity to ask you about your position. And wanted to ask you, um, thinking about the questions we asked in the beginning, where do you st think stands the transatlantic relationship? Good, medium, not so good. <laughs> well, as, a, as a German born in the United States, uh, actually, I, I of course have to say good. And as a journalist, I would also say good. But with the um, 
opportunity for some improvements in, in some areas uh, which are of importance to both our countries, like the automobile industry, of course, the solar industry. Uh, we're going to discuss that now in the panel as well. So. And with this, I hand over the stage to you. Thank you so much Thank for you being so much. here. And I hand also over our speakers and panelists to you. Yes, Thank perfect. You so Thank you so much. <laughs> So welcome everyone. It's nice to be here for the first panel of the conference. Um, and yeah, so please let me ask my dear panelists to the stage um, um, so I can introduce them. So maybe first come in so the, the whole audience can see you. Andreas Aldrich, a member from the German Bundestag party of the Green Party. Um, maybe you can sit next to me. Uh, Susan Demigian joining us from, from Washington, from the a uh, U.S. trade representative for small business market access and industrial competitiveness. Hildegard Müller, a president of the German Association of the Automotive Industry, VDA. And Klaus, um, oh, you switched seats, so uh, Jörg Wohan first, advisor in the Americas. <laughs> no, no, you can say, I just have to introduce you the right way. Okay, now we have uh, Klaus Michael Stahl, uh, deputy general secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, HUC and Jörg Wojan from the European Commission, joining as uh, advisor in the Americas Directorate of the European Commission, DG Trade. Great to have you here. <laughs> so I don't want to introduce too long because uh, we're short on time, but I think there is no longer any doubt uh, looking at the, the topic of our panel, a race to the top, IRA, EU, EU Green Deal and the competition for green tech that um, all states have industrial policy as their main, on their main agenda. And um, US having started with the IRA, um, which was a big uh, success, but now also discussing a bit the consequences, like a race for more subsidies, potentially rising debt and inflation. So I want to um, have a first very quick round so we can get to know the, the positions of the panels. Um, what measures should governments take to achieve the green transition and competitiveness of their industries. Maybe we can start from the end. And um, so what, what should governments do uh, to achieve the green transition? Yeah, good, the good thing is when I start, I can paint a broader picture. Now at the EU level, we are convinced that we need a policy mix and you have all followed this. And we started off from a very liberal uh, position, economically, not in the American sense, uh, uh, with emission trading system, with uh, making emissions, CO2 two emissions an economic factor, and thereby um, and nudging companies to take this into account in their economic behavior. The second uh, dimension we are following at EU level is um, the uh, regulatory approach, um, where we think we need this to ensure a level playing field between companies, something which you cannot necessarily uh, only achieve through something like the emission trading system. And then there is a third dimension, and this is a bit to what you alluded, um, it's uh, industrial policy in a broader sense. Um, and uh, it is uh, admittedly uh, triggered to a, to a certain extent through the American approach, uh, which made everybody realize in the EU that we need to do uh, more uh, on that level, but it was already there before, so you don't get blinded now by the IRA discussion. Think back to the time when uh, we prepared, prepared the uh, um, um, financial framework for the EU, so the long-term EU budget, where we factored the green transition in, all, already into our cohesion policies and into our um, research uh, program Horizon Europe, uh, where we wanted to channel all the funds in those directions. And then um, so you want, I think uh, because oh, it's just okay. a very short first round, uh, and then we will come back to each panelist. Uh, Mr. Stahl, can you give a labor union perspective? What? Sure. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you for being here, and thank you for starting with musical shares. I thought it's, it's just very to get a good overview. Also Never for had the, that start before. Yeah. No, so, so, so very quickly, trade union background, and, and of course the, the main priority for us is to ensure that we, we talk about what, what underpins and what's embedding uh, the green transition and, and competitiveness, and that would of course be, be all of the social conditions, functioning in childcare, schools, uh, public services, healthcare, uh, the fact that there are trade unions, uh, fair wages, uh, 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 and all of that. And that's seldom discussed in, in these uh, settings. And, and I think that's where, where Europe has its competitive advantage as well. So, so, so I think that's something I'm going to bring forward a lot today. And, 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 and the need for social when we talk green, uh, because without social there will be no green transition, because it won't work. 
people yeah. want support it. I'll stop there for now. <laughs> Short. Great, thank you. Ms. Müller, uh, what is your perspective? Yeah, also, just a short uh, beginning. Um, I think the, uh, to make the location as competitive as possible, I think that's uh, the overall picture that we need from uh, states, uh, whether it is from Germany or from the um, European Union, that makes it first to do our own homework, and then the second step should be much more treaties than we have uh, at, the, at the time. So I think we can follow up these two ideas. Great. Ms. Demijan, yeah. Well, thank you, um, and thank you for having me here. I think, likewise, when you look at it from a government perspective, it is a, a broad mix of policies. Green transition is two simple words, but it actually covers a lot of different things, you know, from research and development and technical innovation to workforce development, um, you know, supporting uh, disadvantaged communities as well as our industries. So it's a whole range of policies, and I, and you know, the mix is going to depend on the economy and its industrial base and its uh, uh, transition needs. So it's hard to pinpoint, but it's it's a, a very broad mix of domestic policies, international cooperation, trade, uh, investment. It's everything, really. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Ardrich, the German <laughs> perspective. <Yeah. laughs> I'm trying to pinpoint, as you said, uh, on maybe three points and a kind of catch-all fourth point. First, uh, investments. We are looking at changing the way how we are producing fundamentally. Each and every company will change in a very profound way, so that needs a lot of investment. Um, that is, on the other hand, uh, incentivizing private investment a lot, so both belong together. Second point is we need very clear regulation because um, uh, the clearer regulation is, the better companies know where to go and where to invest and how to invest. Um, third, uh, um, I um, would say we need uh, good conditions for people, proper wages, because people have to feel in the end that what we are doing is for their benefit. They have to have in the end a feeling that it's going to be better in future. That's a main aspect, and actually I think we neglected this a lot in Germany, and there was a time when it was neglected in the United States as well, and that's a huge problem. And my kind of catch-all fourth point is make things work more easily, less bureaucracy, uh, 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 cheaper energy prices, things like that. And Mr. Aldrich, to continue on that, you recently visited uh, Pennsylvania and West Virginia in the US, so you've seen how the IRA has played out in, in practice. Uh, what lessons did you take with you uh, for Germany? Can Germany really apply these things, given that we cannot even give tax credits uh, to our companies mm -hmm. like the US is, is doing? <laughs> Uh, we should, actually. Um, I'm very convinced that um, the way that the United States uh, uh, is going at the moment is the right way. They made a huge decision to uh, start not only looking at prices, where uh, there was a start in Europe and talked about the prices as well. It's not bad looking at prices. We need all the different m um, measures. But investing and making sure that jobs do exist and will exist more in future, that's a main thing. And I've seen, for example, um, in uh, West Virginia, um, a place, there was a um, steel company, old steel company, 12,000 people used to work there, and uh, it was about to end. Like over the last years, all these 12,000 jobs uh, um, uh, didn't exist anymore, and now, just as I was there two, two weeks uh, ago, it was announced that it will shut down, and 500 meters away from there, a bat battery cell factory is built up with IRA um, uh, money, and the people that I was talking to there, they said they raised a certain amount of private investment, private money, then there was the IRA, then there was the situation that uh, they knew it will be worth it investing, and suddenly they were able to, uh, to raise a lot more private capital to, to get this uh, company going. And this is a model we need as well. We have technical problems. We just discussed a lot with our lender, with our states, um, the way how we can actually get to these tax credits. It's a pity that we didn't manage again. Um, so we are this Friday. having, uh, no, yeah. this Friday, the Wachstumschancengesetz, this law, uh, I hope it's going through, but um, without that mechanism, we were fighting a lot for it, but in the end, 
Um, I'm not blaming anybody. I could, but I'm actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it tomorrow. Um, uh, for the moment, it's a pity that we don't have this, but at least. On Friday, yes, we have to get this uh, law going uh, to uh, do something for the economy. Yeah, maybe Ms. Müller, I can uh, because you were looking a bit uh, <laughs> interested in the arguments. Uh, would you, you <laughs> share the viewpoints? Is there not a danger of a, a subsidies raise if we continue the points that Mr. Aldrich uh, just made? If we just copy the things in Germany? Now, at the beginning, I come to some other conclusions because uh, I think what the common the economy is not needed is more regulation to have a have a framework. We have enough regulation, you have enough bureaucracy and regulation and so on. And the IRA, for me, the fascinating point of the IRA is that the states is looking for the for the root causes, for the overall conditions companies need to be competitive as possible. And then they are they are technology open. The overall game is to reduce CO2, the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, whatever it's possible that can be done. Here in Germany and Europe, we are uh, much more regulated with technologies. I think that's it's not an impact for the green tech we can develop. The, um, for, the, for example, the automotive industry will invest in the next four years 280 billion euros in research, new technologies, and so on. And uh, the wider the possibilities are, the more green tech we can develop and the more green tech we can develop for different uh, solutions in the world because the world is also on, on different points. And that's I really support in the IRA. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's not the tax credit. It's also a point. But I think when you look at... and look how competitive we are here with, with the United States. For example, just look at the energy prices. And there we support and, uh, the Wachstumschancengesetz, but there's only a drop in the, in the ocean we need to be open. When the energy prices, for example, are up to three to five times higher here than in the United States. And then I can continue with other um, uh, framework and conditions. That's what I mean with root cause, with, with the problems we have. We, have. we don't need support with a subsidy for one company. We need a competitive framework uh, to, to be, um, to, yeah, to stay here in Europe, to stay in, in, in Germany, in a world that's really globalized. What I criticize at the IRA, I mean, we, we talked uh, a lot about this, is the protectionistic elements, and that I really underlined what the ambassador said, but um, the relations are not so good as they could be. So we have to come back to, um, uh, to the question, what we are doing now with the TTC, for example, and so on, coming back to a really, uh, to a really joint forces also. Uh -huh. Just jump in with the yeah. protectionist element yeah. that you were saying. Do you mean there that the tax credits for electric vehicles are not applied to, to German uh, co companies, for example? Yes, or? for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh, the domestic standards we have and so on. And that I, I'm convinced that um, uh, this is a barrier. It's, um, it's um, not, not a kind of free trade. I mean, we had a lot of discussions with the European Union. And the answer can be other sanctions and other, su so other subsidies, other sanctions, and then it's a spiral. <laughs> um, so... Um, I think especially Europe and the United States. So, yeah, due to several reasons we have at the moment, also the geopolitical, the geoeconomic um, um, perspective we have, we need urgently to work better, better together than we are at the moment. And I don't want to talk about TTIP and Klohinchen or whatever, but uh, the mistakes in the past shows us now that um, uh, what we have to do in the future. Mm. Um, Mr. Vujan, maybe I can hear your perspective. So Ms. Miller just said no more subsidies are, are needed. Would you agree to, to that view from the Commission? I said you have to point the money in the root causes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a bit of subsidies, but not yeah. too many. Uh, how would you describe it from the Commission uh, viewpoints? Do uh, you looking at subsidies, uh, speaking of um, critical industries or are you more focusing on issues like the emissions trading system where the market comes more into play? Yeah, from Ms. Müller indeed said uh, that we also need to look at the conditions, not only at the subsidies. And I appreciate that because, of course, the conditions and the level playing field, this is what we are, we are fighting for in the EU. And this is also to reply to your question about the subsidies. We have to also ensure that we have a level playing field here inside of the EU. This is one of the reasons why the EU was created, uh, to ensure that not the rich countries out-subsidize uh, the other member states. And... Um, 
Of course, in Germany, I will then often hear the argument if German economy is going well, everybody will be going well. Uh, but uh, this is not going so well. Sounds a moment. little <laughs> bit uh, self centered approach sometimes, so we have to keep an eye on that. But of course, as I said, we come from the emission trading um, uh, system approach and we still hold to this because it has proven to be very uh, effective. But we also see now that there is a need for um, state aid uh, to uh, sectors and we are uh, trying to calibrate this very intelligently. Um, we want to, uh, on the, in the first place, uh, sensitize the member states that they do not enter in such a race, and uh, secondly, to see what we can do at a European level. Uh, we're using our cohesion funds. We also su suggested now a European instrument uh, for, for uh, industrial uh, uh, transition, uh, green transition. Uh, so we have to use green. everything that's in our t uh, toolbox. You mean the Net Zero Industry Act, correct? Uh, that's uh, part of it, uh, but also STEP, um, which is um, a European instrument to um, help uh, the transition uh, of industries to greening. We don't have a lot of money at the European level for that, nothing compared to what a member state like Germany could, uh, uh, could shell out, but uh, I think that's an important first step. Mm. I want to uh, circle again a bit back to the electric uh, vehicles issue, um, just because we touched on it earlier already. Um, Mr. Mijian, uh, when Ms. Muller is uh, talking about the tax credits um, for electric vehicles, uh, was that an issue that you were thinking of when designing the program as well? How will it impact our European partners? Is it a possibility to still bring it in or is it a done deal now? That you well, cannot have it? well, first of all, the IRA was a piece of legislation and it was created by our Congress. And they determined the, the credit levels and the eligibility criteria and so forth. So now we are implementing that. And it is within the guidelines that Congress has given us. But I think focusing just on that, it does not really address the issue of, of using our industrial policy for the purposes of, of our green transition, because this is in the in a global context. This is not just a US and EU issue. It is um, a, a global issue because these are global markets. The pressures we're facing, our companies are facing, are um, with regard to global market distortions that we're trying to overcome because we will not be able to accomplish our decarbonization objectives if the companies and industries that are responsible for it um, cannot remain competitive. So from our perspective, we need to think about this in the broader context, not just in the transatlantic context, and to see how we can work to cooperate on, on the approaches that we take so that they help our companies, whether they're in the US, in the EU, jointly across the Atlantic, um, be able to address these competitive pressures. And electric vehicles right now is a very significant one. And whether it's the US tax credit, the, the IRA tax credit is not going to make or break how our EV industries um, evolve and, and, and remain competitive. So I think from, we would like to continue to work on, on ways to address these issues in the, in the environment that our, our companies and industries are operating in. Mm. So you were <laughs> describing the issue without mentioning the big name, uh, the, the big elephant in the room, China. Um, it's also a view that the, the China strategy is, is quite different from <coughs> Europe uh, versus uh, the US. Uh, could you maybe give us some insights again how China, uh, why is uh, the US so worried about China and um, will it change with the President Trump or will it uh, probably most likely, <laughs> but uh, maybe give us some well, insights into the China threat? Well, I can't speak to, to the election, election outcomes, but I'll say, you know, our, our auto industries have evolved different, a little bit differently. We have, we have been focused on the North American market. We have not had much Chinese penetration in the auto sector into the United States. And certainly the business plans of US companies or, North or companies operating in North America have been perhaps different than what they are in the Europe context. So in that regard, uh, the, the potential for the type of uh, uh, pressure that uh, heavily subsidized uh, Chinese electric vehicles can bring into the North American market is of concern. And, you know, the, the political environment of an election year makes, makes that an even uh, bigger focus of attention. 
but I think you know we we face similar pressures. It may have started more much sooner here in Europe, but I think there we're facing the same problems. Mm. Yeah, um, Mr. Stahl, maybe to to bring your perspective also from a, a labor union trade union uh, perspective. How do you think? Uh, what is our competitive advantage in Europe uh, when dealing with these threats from from China and other? Um, Uh, states that have maybe less uh, strict standards than we have? Well, so competitive advantage is the fact that we have democracy, we have freedom, <laughs> we have trade unions. I think these are, are very good things to, to have when you compete on, on a global uh, scene. We have the same things in, in the United States as well. And I think that's something to, to cherish and to, to hold dear and hold close to our hearts. I was in the discussion yesterday with, with some, some business leaders and I was quite surprised to hear the willingness to embrace China uh, when it came to, 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 to the efficiency of markets. They, they make a decision and that happens. They build motorways in, in overnight and so on. Yes, all fantastic, but it's not the place to live, I think, if, if you are a worker. So, so I think there, there, there has been quite some, some na naivety around China uh, for a long time. I think the Americans are, are, are showing that that, that, end of, uh, that period of naivety has come to an end. Certainly so with, with what happened in Ukraine mm -hmm. and, and, and the global uh, uh, situation we are in today. So, so, so mm -hmm. I, th I think that's, that's our important elements to, to bring into the discussion uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to China. I would just ask maybe Ms. Müller because uh, I mean the Chinese market is very important for the the German auto industry and uh, would you share the the same points that Mr. Stahl just just made or I mean I think nobody is naive in this question. Um, then I th secondly I think the un the US is much more related to China than we are at the end. I think uh, the the American economy has also a lot of questions uh, due to this. For example, when you look at products coming from Mexico, China is very much investing in Mexico and, and so on and so on. So it's not only the, the naive Europe that's uh, looking only at the markets there. Uh, the, the third thing is, uh, it depends a bit, is uh, China just a production facility or is it also a consumer market? I mean, to be open, from the consumer market, the 1.4 uh, uh, a billion Chinese people, we earn the money that we can invest in the tradition. We don't, uh, uh, at the moment, it's not possible to earn the money, for example, in the European market. We are still in the market development under 2019, uh, uh, before the COVID pandemic situation and so on. So when you want an economy that's investing money, you have also to look for consumer markets. Um, the fourth thing, I think it's, uh, is it better non-negotiations and non-trade or is it better to have trade and have relations with country? Um, I think, uh, um, and, and I, I underline not to be naive, I know this, uh, the Silk Belt project, I know everything, but uh, uh, when we want to be competitive, when we want to handle it, then at first of all, we have to do our own homework. And I think at the end, to, begin, to be in a better position to negotiate with China, we have firstly to do a lot of questions we have here in Europe. And we have, for example, in uh, working close together between the, um, the United States and Europe. And then the IRA, the protect, protectionistic element of the IRA are not helping. Because the bigger the uh, power is we, we can bring together, the better uh, are our conditions to uh, negotiate with China, for example. And mm. so it's not an only yes or no question, do you want to invest in China or not? What is we see with the discussion from the European Union we want to have? Uh, all the discussions are stopped, for example, at the, uh, the question how we can yeah, discuss about the, the um, 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 Investitionsabkommen, mm -hmm. the investment yeah, uh, the, agreement. The, yeah, the investment agreement. Be, yeah. So there are no, no negotiations at the moment. I think that's a problem and also yeah. that we have to... If, uh, well, if the Chinese think. ban half of our European Parliament members from entering China, it's a bit difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know everything is difficult, yeah. uh, but it's uh, not doing anything. It's not better. And the EU anti-subsidy uh, um, 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 thing we have at the moment, I think that's not the correct answer to the... Um, The, to the challenges we're we probably have. also hinting a bit at the, the trade agreements that are not uh, moving forward. Uh, so, uh, Mr. William, maybe you can elaborate. Is the EU happy with this? Pro I mean, Mercosur is on hold. Uh, the trade agreement with India, I think, is on, on hold. And uh, CETA. Australia. So, yeah, it's just uh, how. Better is fight CETA. 
Yeah. Is there not a danger that then again China and, and other states can jump in and, and take our markets away from us, potential markets? Yes, yes, I appreciate uh, Mrs. Müller's optimism. We should have agreements with China. We can't even have agreements with South America, with countries which are all democratic, which are uh, very close to Europe historically. But here we have uh, um, movements inside of the EU. We have member states who don't want these agreements. We have next, uh, no, this uh, Thursday there will be a vote in the French Senate, this is the first chamber of the French Parliament, and there is a high risk that they will vote down an existing trade agreement, the one with Canada, CETA. Mm -hmm. And for God's sake, if we can't even uh, make uh, trade agreements with Canada, with whom are we going to conclude trade agreements? A little bit indirect answer to your wish for agreements with China. So we are really um, uh, in a, in a diff difficult situation here, and the, the undercurrents in Europe are very different ones. Uh, I can only assure you and uh, reassure you that we as European Commission, we are uh, the, the standard bearers for trade agreements and we'll still continue to, to negotiate them and then put them on the table for the member states. Uh, and uh, we'll always be happy for member states who then see the advantages of these uh, trade agreements as it happened eventually with uh, CETA here in Germany. But it's not an easy task these days, uh, also inside of Europe. And I keep telling, and we keep telling people, if you want, talking about South America, if you want to deliver uh, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and uh, Uruguay to China on a silver platter, well, go ahead. Hmm. Um, Mr. Stahl, you, you, were, you were arguing before about also um, more labor rights, probably also environmental rights. Now we're discussing this issue. Uh, what would you say, why is there still an argument to make these trade agreements uh, very big and, and combine a lot of elements in them. Is there then not the danger to what we just discussed that they will go to other other markets? So, so, so in, in our opinion, trade agreements is not only about buying and selling stuff. It's also about changing the world and, and putting pressure on, on, on a certain development, going in a certain direction. And, 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 and of course, you will get your hands dirty in that process. Uh, you will have to make compromises. I know a lot about compromises. <laughs> I've been doing them my whole life uh, as a negotiator. Uh, but there are certain things that need to be, 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 be sacred, holy. And, and, and that's where I think that naivety comes into the play. We thought we could change China. But I think China has, 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 has changed us more than we have changed China. So, so now it's time for us to, to, to become much bolder uh, in how we negotiate. That doesn't mean that we have to put all of our agreements on hold, but, but, but it is a way to push for change. But just one <laughs> comment, without any trade agreements, our influence on climate protection, on human rights, on whatever we want is zero. So when we don't have any trade agreements, like Mercosur, like CETA, like whatever, uh, then our influence uh, uh, on, on, the, on other regions is zero. So maybe it's better to start to step with 50 or 80 percent, even if they are 20 percent. I mean, Mercosur, yeah, that's agriculture. Uh, uh, Mexico, that's energy. And so on. In, everywhere is some point, but we want to fulfill a 150% perfect trade agreement. We will fail, at, in my opinion. So we have to learn to be quick, to start, to build up trust, to, to negotiate with other countries, to be in deeper relations. And in a world that's changing so rapid, time is really urgent, uh, one of the main points. And for example, when, when you look at the negotiations with Mexico, I mean, we have elections, they have elections, so when I was there, I said, yeah, it stopped for one year. So, yeah. But China is not stopping negotiations with Mexico for one year. Yeah. Mr. Mijia, maybe you can give a view from <laughs> the transatlantic perspective. You now heard how we have troubles in, uh, in Europe, right, so moving forward. Um, why, what would you say to, to, I don't know, Mr. Macron or other people that are now uh, holding up uh, the trade agreements, uh, why it is so important to conclude them uh, to uh, Mr. Mijian, sorry, but just oh, because you, um, you, you have, a, I think, more um, tougher view on China, right? Also on the threat of China from the U.S. Yes, and uh, as you know, uh, trade agreements are, are not our primary form of trade engagement at, 
uh, in the United States these days, but that doesn't mean that there's no other way to address some of these issues. We do have engagements in the Asia Pacific, the Western Hemisphere, because other countries are, are also looking for ways to not be dependent on China. Um, and the ways to do that is to foster environments that support investment from the United States and from Europe and an and understanding of the standards that we need and uh, the expectations that we have um, in order to be uh, compatible trade partners, but also so that our companies feel comfortable investing and moving their supply chains from China and Asia into other countries in in. Latin America, uh, Asia, and Africa. And, um, you know, I think it's, it, it takes a certain level of understanding, a, a commitment to engagement to be able to do that. And, it, and just because we don't have a signed legal document uh, does not mean that we can't make progress in those areas because I think we do share a lot of similar interests and, uh, and there's a lot to work with. So we, we have found those engagements to be very valuable and we continue them with, uh, with the Western Hemisphere in Africa and in, in Asia. And um, you know, we have a very robust agenda with each of those areas on, on these very issues. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, let's move the topic, uh, the discussion maybe again to another uh, area of focus, uh, the solar industry. I thought it's also a good uh, area to, to discuss because their US policies also impacted Germany uh, quite a lot. And Mr. Uh, Audred, you are involved in the solar package discuss, uh, um, debating how the German state can maybe aid the German solar industry. Um, we just uh, heard that Maya Burger, I think they closed the factory and uh, have to mm. let go of 500 people. So it's not looking uh, too good uh, on the solar industry. Can the German state give some hope to these companies? Or, or? Um, the solar industry is a very good example for many things that we just heard and that we were discussing. We actually started the whole thing in uh, uh, Germany here, um, bringing up the solar industry. And now we are 99% dependent on China when it comes to the solar industry. And something must have happened on the way that is just wrong. Yeah. Like, there is no other solution to this question. And um, yes, I think it's, it's, it's very good to clap on that because Uh, that the same situation we see in many other parts of economy. If we are not investing in heating systems here in Germany, in heat pumps and other modern technologies, these technologies will be gone. It's as hard as that. China will produce. And if we are not investing in electro vehicles in Europe, the industry will be gone because China is investing. They are doing strategic decisions. They have the question in mind, who will be leading in the 21st century? And they combine a power play on the one hand to an econom economy question on the other hand and climate technology on the third question. And they made the decision coming back to the solar industry to at a, in a, on a, at a moment when we in Germany said, okay, we are withdrawing subsidies for the solar industry when they were growing. They went into that uh, uh, and they invested billions. And the, so, uh, the solar industry will be bigger worldwide than the car industry in the future because on each and every roof there will be solar uh, uh, energy. In Africa, in Asia, wherever. And this economy is rising. And we are dependent 99% on China. And that's where there comes something in that the United States did. The United States at a certain point said, we are doing a directive uh, uh, concerning um, uh, um, um, like child labor and, um, and forced labor. And they said, that's why we are not taking in solar panels from China anymore. The result is that all these panels are going to Europe and that our markets are destroyed and they are destroyed on purpose and by China. And that's why also I'm coming back to the question that we were talking about taking strategic decisions and always saying, we are just doing everything. Technology is open. We are not taking any decisions. Will lead to 
the loss of the power play with China will lead that we are not having the technology here, will lead that we are not having wealth here, will lead that we are not having the jobs here that we need, and will lead in the end that our democracy is going to collapse because that's what people need. They, they need jobs, they need wealth, they need all of that. And so the question that coming, back, like to, coming a... back coming back to this, we have to dare as politicians to take decisions, and that's the problem over the last 15, 16, 17, in whatever years, um, that in Germany there was no decision taken. And when I'm, for example, coming back to the car industry for one second, when we are talking about that in 2035 there won't be fossil combustion engines in Europe anymore, and this is questioned now, leaders of German big car companies are trying to get appointments in my office and we are sitting there in my small office and they are begging me not to let it happen that this is drawn back again because they are saying they're investing billions now. They're going for it all over, uh, uh, over Europe because they want to take on that competition. So we need to have clear regulation. what you're describing, and, Mr. Odich, and, and I have to jump in because yeah. we have limited solar, solar, time and <laughs> uh, we need to hear the other panelists solar, as well. Solar industry, just one sentence. We are negotiating. We are not done yet, but it's a struggle. And you haven't even told me, uh, unfortunately, so, if you have the subsidies or not, because so it's still in we, discussion. We, we started with uh, a program for the solar industry already that uh, um, uh, goes into the production side. Um, but yes, we have a problem in, on the demand side. That is uh, a problem because when we have this, the solar panels, panels coming in under the production price. It's, it's, it's cheaper than production yeah, price. I think we understand. But so the, then we need, the then we need to do something for the demand side, and that's the struggle that we're having in the government at the moment. But I think what we heard now from your uh, talk as well is the problem that everyone tries to, to save their industry, tries to save their job. So uh, is that not maybe to a question to all of the, uh, the whole panel, um, a problem? Like everyone tries to keep their industry at home, keeps the job at home, so how then can we be cooperating uh, if everyone is just trying to save their own solar industry, their own electric vehicle industry? Um. I mean, we learned, especially in Germany and you, we learned that international trade is uh, and international um, supply chains are the yeah, are responsible for the welfare we had in the past. And 70% of the jobs in Germany in the automotive industry are linked to export. So it's a really a so difficult situation we are sitting on. We will build 50 million cars until 2030. Uh, we, but where do we where do we build them and who will sell them? And uh, because uh, at the end of the day, when we don't have a charging infrastructure that the consumer wants, they won't buy they won't uh, uh, buy these cars. For example, that whole Greece has uh, um, oh no, better say Hamburg has double as public charging infrastructure than the whole Greece. So um, it's far away from reality for the people to stand over. So we produce these cars, and they are standing still at the moment because the people are not convinced that in their life circumstances we have, it's possible to charge the cars. That's the That's reality, good. for example. And once again, but where do we, where, where do we build these cars? I mean, 70% of the jobs are linked to expert. At the moment, more and more investments are going out of Germany because our location is not competitive in every question. So, and that's not uh, unpatriotic or something to say this, it's a reality. I mentioned the energy costs, and I can continue with a lot of other factors who are responsible for the question, where do we have to invest now? I said well, that we invest 280 billion euros in the the next four years and we need decisions and we need from the current government decisions and not looking what's happened in the past good or bad or whatever we now need the decisions from the government to make uh, Germany as competitive as possible and this the Wachstum Chancen Gesetz is only as I mentioned small. a really small yeah, point yes. in yeah. every in yeah. every important question the government in itself has not the same opinion of what it's doing and that's a problem right now we have um, <laughs> Mr. Mijia, and maybe uh, before we open it up soon to the to audience, because I'm sure they want to ask their questions as well to, to all of you. Um, so what would you say, Mr. Mijia, how to align the policies better between the US and Germany? Because we just touched on it. It's having huge impacts on each other's markets. Well, 
our systems are very entrenched and they've developed over decades. So we're not going to be doing the same thing the same way. Um, it's, it's not going to be possible. But I think, you know, as the ambassador was talking about earlier, the, we need areas of cooperation. Right now we are working with the Trade and Technology Council, which has a number of working groups that are trying to find areas where we can align what we do so that we can reduce the burdens and costs um, of our uh, of our programs and, and our um, intentions, um, and also uh, find joint responses. Because again, the issue that we're dealing with is, is a global uh, market and a global trade environment. And the way that we can counteract the, um, the influence that China's uh, market distorting policies have had is for us to work in an alignment, not only together, but with others, because we need an equal amount of market power to be able to, um, to make the changes we need and to keep and to sustain them. Because it's one thing to, to support the infrastructure development and everything that we're doing in the United States, but we all, our companies will want to know that, that they will remain competitive and that they will be able to continue to operate in the global market um, over the longer term. And I think that is what we're trying to do in TTC, is to find these areas. They're, some of them are very technical. They're not you know, things Easy you put up in lights. to the public. Um, and, uh, but they will hopefully be, make a difference so that we can maintain the same objectives and work towards them and not think of this as a, just a bilateral co competitive environment, but one where we can both benefit. Great. Thank you for uh, explaining that. And uh, could we open it up to the, to the audience? So are there questions from the audience to our panel? If you could maybe introduce yourself and uh, like sure. from which industry My name is, from. I'm not from an industry. I'm in academia at Queen's University in Canada, but currently... You can stand at, up if you want, yeah. I'm currently at Free University of Berlin. I just wanted to, um, there, there was a fascinating discussion. One thing that didn't really came out was the trade-offs between jobs on the one hand and the speed of the green transition on the other hand. And there I wanted to push back a bit against you, uh, Mr. Aldrich, because he said, we need the solar industry, we need these jobs. Yeah. But isn't China doing us a massive favor by subsidizing solar panels, driving down the, pr the price of solar panels? We have lots of jobs in solar installation. And I didn't really see you grappling with that challenge of, on the one hand, it's helping us to get to um, renewable energy much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And the, yes, we don't have a, a solar industry in that sense, but but isn't it worth it if really we need to achieve our climate targets? Yes, Mr. Aldridge, do you want to respond? I, I, I can, yeah. Um, it, it's a very interesting question because you're right. And uh, we do need cheap panels. That's why we are going a different way that, uh, than the United States. Uh, we are not saying we are keeping these panels out because we want these cheap panels here because we want to put them on our roof. And at the moment, we see the rise of uh, solar panels uh, in Germany. Ex it, it's exploding. We are really uh, building a lot of clean energy at the moment, solar, wind. Um, it's going t through the rooftop. So, yes, we need this, but if we end... In, uh, after a few years at a point when, where we are not able to produce anything anymore here. Then we are in big trouble. And if we, we look at the other branches, talking to people about the steel industry, they tell, some people tell me, we can buy this from abroad, no problem. We don't have it here anymore, but we can buy this from abroad. And if you go further, if you talk tonight, I'm, I'm meeting... Um, the, the chemical industry, chemical, chemical the chemical uh, industry. So I want the chemical industry to be here, and I want the steel industry to be here, and I want the car industry to be here, and I want the solar industry to be here, because we need the jobs here, and we need the, the wealth in the end here. So that's why I'm saying I'm not keeping out solar panels from China, because we need the cheap, uh, cheap panels here. But we need to do something about the situation that we need to have industry in Germany, that we need to have industry in Europe. And then we can either say on the one hand, last sentence, <laughs> all right, I'm talking about, I'm in academia, in academia and I'm talking about an ideal world, competition worldwide and no problems. 
but it's just a lie, and we have to be clear on that. There is power play in this world, and there is unfair behavior in this world, and we have to react to this. Otherwise, we are as naive as Germany has been for years concerning Russia. 55% of gas Brian came from Russia, and we saw what happened. We shouldn't make this happen give again. give the perspective from the uh, European view as well, right? Uh, that it's not as easy... As exactly. I, I would subscribe to this. Unfortunately, you said the R word already, and I thought this this the was word, the thinking. Russia. The thi Russia. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yes. this, this was the thinking until. Um, Thank you. Exactly. Well, I think the the last. <laughs> I thought essentially the last person in Europe understood it uh, when the Russians second time invaded and cut the gas, or we had to cut the gas. Everybody in this country was relying on cheap gas. Cheap Not gas everybody. was. Yeah, there's um, differences in political parties and opinions and what we said. Agreed, uh, but many people um, um, uh, built on the cheap gas because of this thinking. And I thought everybody in, has understood that this is not reality anymore. We have to come uh, to our senses here. We have to think in terms of economic security. We have to uh, be sure that we don't make ourselves again completely dependent on one country. And uh, that's uh, why I can only second what you're saying. And this is what we're trying at European level, whether we always do exactly the right thing at the right time. This is a different dis discussion, but I think this is the underlying realization we have to make. Mm. But then there was another... Just one, one second. Then Very we, quick. Our, in our interest, it must be to uh, support and empower the WTO. And I wish, for yes. example, also from our American friends to support this idea to, to empower the, um, the standards and the possibilities there. I mean, we all know the problems, but that's not the solution at the end. And I think it's, it's worth to, to empower our uh, activities in that question. Great. I saw another question, two questions. Um, maybe the, the <coughs> gentleman there in the fourth row. I think the microphone is coming. Um, Günther Tauer from the company TBS. We are talking about the past and the present, you know, so regarding solar industry. But we have to even to talk about the future. Mm -hmm. You know, we are here in the, in the Baden-Württemberg. It's not only the motor automotive industry, it's a machinery industry. Mm -hmm. And I think we are missing a chance if we are not looking on robotics. You know, I think yesterday it was in the FSZ that maybe 2024 will be the year of robotics. I don't know what the Chinese are doing there. Mm -hmm. But when I see, for example, you know, Tesla in uh, Greenheide, you know, they are, it's complete, no, nearly completely automatic, so far as I've seen it from the outside. And we have still these strengths. And so what will you do, you know, for the future for these industries? Um, I just want to give also maybe to Mr. Stahl uh, perspective. How do you answer to this question also from a labor first union perspective? What to so do with robots? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, what to and do then maybe also from another the from the panel. Well, uh, well, something connects with cars uh, is, is, is a very famous uh, situation that happened in the United States in the 1950s when, when, when the trade union leader was showed around a factory and the, 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 the car maker was very proud over his factory and how he cut down costs and could lay off workers and, and, and it was all very fantastic. But he had one simple question, who's going to buy your cars? Yes. And, and, and uh, I think that comes then, what we come to here is, is technological development and, and it happens all the time. I think in that sense, green transition is, is just uh, another transition in, in many ways, uh, but it is a very important one. And this change will, will have profound uh, uh, challenges to, to our societies. And I want to, 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 to end my contribution here with a quote from a, a, a Swedish uh, trade unionist at the time, and he was also an economist, went to, to OECD later on, but he said that one has to change to, to choose between the safety of the shell or the safety of the wings. And, 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 and as we go about these changes that we're having now, I, I would very much uh, like to, to make sure that we don't uh, force people into the safety of the shell. Uh, because they will defend themselves, they will defend their jobs, they will defend themselves against robots, uh, and they will not be able to buy any cars. Uh, but if you provide people with the safety of the wings, they're going to embrace the future, they're going to gonna buy cars, they're going to be optimistic, and, 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 and I think that's also important now, looking forward, how we talk about the future. Is the future open or is it closed?
I would like us all to, to, to agree that it's much better to be in a place where the future is open. Yeah. But still, thanks for the question because it's an important issue as well. I just want to take one more uh, or two more questions because we're slowly running out of time. So maybe the gentleman uh, next to the door was the first one. Yes, uh, my name is Jürgen Zottler. Uh, I'm research fellow at the Global Center for Economic uh, for uh, Development in Washington. Before I was executive director at the World Bank and director general at the ministry here. Uh, BMZ. And uh, I would like to say a word on uh, um, on uh, technological neutrality, because it's it's so much discussed. And um, couldn't when when we look back at what happened with the German automotive um, industry, uh, couldn't one argue that there was not enough uh, guidance from public policy? Because we were in a way sleepwalking into that dire situation uh, we are now in. If there had been a little bit more of guidance and perhaps industrial policy, uh, then perhaps we could have avoided uh, this uh, problem. And then also, isn't it a myth, this whole thing about uh, neutrality? Uh, there are figures saying that there's a heavy bias uh, in uh, policy in favor of fossil fuel industry. So perhaps it's a myth and uh, we shouldn't really use this, these arguments in, in such a way. Could you uh, maybe say who you're targeting your question to, yeah. or would you, yes, you would, would like the comments? I would like uh, to, uh, I mean, to I just ask can give a, Müller, because <laughs> you made two comments I just can give a, uh, a short comment to a long story, but uh, I, agree, I disagree, really. I'm really supported from the, from the possibility of electromobility, and that's a solution, for example, for the European market, if we are not only have cars, if we have also a charging infrastructure and much more. But it's not, not the only solution for the whole world, and when we want to reform... Uh, uh, mobility and so on, there may be other technologies, for example, fuel cells or something like this. And so I disagree completely. I think it's not on the politics to make the a competitive decision for, for companies. You can fail as company, but uh, 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 to, to make the, the corridor so small, that brings us not enough solutions for the world. Mr. Voya, just uh, you were shaking your head. I saw it. <laughs> Maybe just very quick answer. Not up to me. <laughs> Not up to you. Uh, but the no, you see the Euro no, no, the <laughs> European uh, policy on this is very clear. 2035. Um, end of the combustion engine and there are many good arguments and this would be a new discussion which we don't want to open here. Um, yeah. Okay. But different different opinions, of course. Um, a last question to the gentleman in the in the front here. Yeah, good afternoon. My, my name is Ralf Lange. I'm coming from uh, Hamburg. And um, my question is, may sound a bit or sound a bit delicate, because I haven't heard it so far anywhere. But um, given the current geopolitical shifts we see, also on security, I still miss the debate. And I have seen now the move of the European Union probably appointing a commissioner for defense industry. Where is the discussion in Germany about defense and security business? Because we know we have massive opportunities between the continents, Europe, and I'm, if I compare the budget for the economic development policy they're currently dividing in Germany, about four billion, I think it's peanuts, combined with the opportunity of the defense business, which is massive all over Europe, I'm missing this debate. Thank you. Yes, um, so I guess we need our German speakers either. Maybe first Ms. Müller and then Mr. Aldrich. I, I, I really support it. In our ESG targets, it's not possible to finance um, uh, 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 because it's not sustainable. Maybe at the end of the day, it can be one of the sustainable investments we can do to uh, have a, a defense industry that uh, is able to protect us uh, against uh, aggressors. And Mr. Aldrich, maybe a very quick... Yes, uh, for us Greens, it was always easy to say we are investing in clean techs. It was not easy to say we are investing in weapons for a very long time. But there was a situation, and situation changed, and that's why we're saying, yes, we have to invest in weapons as well. But then we have to change taxonomy, ESG... Basel 1 bis 3 and whatever to make the framework financing co uh, conditions to make this possible. I really think it's one of the points that's very necessary to have an open debate in the European Union and also in Germany. 
think. Great. I think we're running out of time. So um, maybe anyone who wants to take the last question from me, um, are we competitors? Are we partners? Uh, what is the future for the cooperation on these Part important issues? <laughs> partners please uh. but competition can be a part of that actually i don't say that partners can't compete so we should compete but be partners in the end you agree from that the that's exactly what i would say as well i think the the forces that we are dealing with are outside of our borders and they are um, they affect our economies as well as our, our relationships with our trading partners um, and we really if we have if we are seeking to maintain the competitiveness and improve the competitiveness of our industries and secure our supply chains um, we need to be partners uh, because we have similar goals and um, and we need to work together to reach them great so I have to say thank you to this wonderful panel thank you for the questions and have a good uh, rest of the conference. Thank you. Before we run out, we do a quick group picture of all of you. Ah, so okay. if you would <laughs> so thank you so much for the panelists, but also for our great moderator. Um, this is really Aspen style, bringing different positions together from unions to the business community, from the commission to the European Parliament, different parties. And um, it is totally OK. Oops, I'm so sorry <laughs> to also say on the panel, I disagree and then take it outside and continue with the discussion. Now we are continuing with another um, really important topic um, for the resilience of our societies, but also our, um, our economies. And that is the issue um, of cybersecurity. Um, and this is the start um, of our first two-on-one -on -one discussion. And for this, I would like to um, ask our moderator, Johannes Steger, to come up here and give him also a big applause. <laughs> Because you are, um, you have been on our moderator, one of our moderators for the last three years. That's true. Um, hmm. yeah. um, you also have been um, uh, uh, our media partner for the last two years for That's our um, ethic and AI conference and also for our transatlantic trade conference. But you also have a normal job, right? Yes, yeah. yes, actually okay. I do. Like write sometimes. Yes. That's like just yes. Beside. And and you also publish uh, something which all of our audience participants should read uh, on a regular basis, right? Yes. So we have like two, no, three different outlets now, which I am responsible with my great colleagues. Uh, it's called the Background Digitalization. You maybe all know it. It's daily, and we have two weeklies: on, one on cybersecurity and one on smart cities. So lots to do. And where do they find that? Online. 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 <laughs> and you get it in your uh, email account every morning. So, yeah. So, again, um, as a moderator, he isn't supposed to have a position while he moderates. Um, but we also want to know his position. So I'm asking you, you also a question before I hand over to you. And that is, um, do you think we are well prepared for the next big cyber attack? Mm. Mm. Okay, million dollar question. <laughs> I think there are some people might... No, let's uh, talk. I think we are better prepared than some years before, and I think there is a lot of attention and um, projects that are addressing it, also transatlantic ones. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if we're well prepared or enough prepared. I think you can't be enough prepared, to be honest. Um, but I think we are getting there. Hmm. Yeah. And how maybe we should discuss it now. Yeah. And with this, I hand over to you. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. So, uh, I think we can all agree that um, the danger or the threat is kind of real. 
I think you all heard of the battery producer Vata, who has to slow down the production because of a cyber incident and is now delaying the reports, which also have financial um, consequences. In the US, the healthcare giant United Health is attacked. That leads to a big debate about the uh, security of uh, health data in the United States. And maybe you remember communities being uh, unable to uh, issue formal documents because their IT provider was uh, hacked. So I think we all know the problem. And I think we all can agree that the answer to this can't be local, it can't be national only, and it can't be only regional. I think it has to be a partnership with like-minded countries. And to talk about this between the United States and Germany, I would uh, invite Claudia Plattner on stage. She is the president of the BSE, the German agency for IT security. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you. He is not here with us, but he's digitally here. And it's Brendan Wales. He's executive director of the Infrastructure and Cybersecurity Agency, CISA, in the United States. Hi, Brendan. Hi, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for making the time. And um, great to have you here. So maybe start with um, Claudia Plattner. You uh, worked in IT for quite a long time with the European Central Bank before starting the, your job at the BSE. Uh, how did the threat landscape and maybe also the way we discuss cybersecurity evolve uh, since then? Well, I have to say that, um, first of all, hello. Hi. Um, good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I would say it, it has evolved immensely. So, um, first of all, cybersecurity or actually cyber attacks, cyber criminality has become a big business. So that's, that's one of the major shifts we've seen over the course of the last few years. Um, it has become big business, and it's also become a very professional business, and that's really the part that worries us the most. Um, you have very professional attackers on the other side, and um, they partner up, and they have really the, the, sometimes really the perfect workflow that we're all striving for in our businesses on a daily basis, but they have it, and, and that's really worrisome. Mm. The other thing is, <coughs> Uh, cyber security, or actually cyber attacks, um, have become part of a, of, a, of a political landscape. They're being used in hybrid scenarios. Um, so we're seeing a whole new world opening up there. Um, and that's the bad news. The good news is uh, cyber security, the defense side, has definitely moved into focus a lot more than it, than it was like 10 years ago. Um, so we, we do see uh, um, our economies, our societies, starting to adjust to this scenario to those scenarios and really getting the measures in um, and I'm I'm an optimist I believe we can handle this but uh, to come back to the question you've just been asked there's still a lot of work to do thank you um, mr. Wells maybe from your point of view you worked in homeland security f before you worked with CISA so what is your take on how the threat landscape evolved and maybe also um, how the threat actors evolved since then uh, sure. So I think it's, and I'm going to build off what Claudia said, because I think we have seen uh, what I would probably argue is um, kind of two major trends that have led us to where we are in the kind of current threat environment. One, as Claudia said, um, the kind of cyber criminal elements have gotten far more sophisticated and a lot more specialized uh, to the degree where you have some actors that are focused just on gaining initial access, these data access brokers. You have some actors who are building tools for the less sophisticated cyber criminals that can then leverage. And that is somewhat democratized cyber criminal activity where um, even if a criminal is no longer executing the attacks, they're now just building tools, making them available in the dark web, and um, has allowed kind of less sophisticated and a broad array of cyber criminals to get into the game. And I think we have seen um, the, the rise of ransomware kind of run rampant across the entire globe with significant impacts on multiple countries, um, all enabled by this type of acceleration in the cyber criminal elements. The second uh, major trend is the um, uh, growing willingness of nation states to both prepare for and conduct attacks. 
Uh, so we have seen most recently in the United States where we have discovered evidence that Chinese uh, state cyber actors have gained initial access uh, to U.S. critical infrastructure with no intelligence value. Um, the only purpose of their um, uh, pre-positioning on this infrastructure is to launch future disruptive or destructive attacks. Um, and you know they're not they're the most recent country for us to discover, but they are certainly not the only one who wants that capability and is seeking that type of leverage. Um, we know other actors like Russia and Iran are doing uh, or, or have similar efforts underway or have attempted to in the past. Um, and I think long term uh, that poses probably the most significant uh, risk, uh, particularly if they're willing to launch destructive attacks against the uh, infrastructure most essential to our way of life. Thank you, Mr. Wells. But um, Mrs. Plattner, when we look at the evolution of cyber threats, um, Mr. Wells mentioned the state-sponsored actors, which have like uh, immense capability and also resources. Um, we talk a lot about AI getting accessible by every one of us. So do you see that this is also used in the threat landscape, maybe by criminals to, to, uh, to enter an organization? Um, let me start off by saying that the biggest problem we're currently facing in Germany, and I think it's somewhat the same for the US, um, <clears throat> um, the most urgent problem we're seeing, maybe not the most, the most important, but the most urgent problem we see is ransomware attacks. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the, that's the biggest challenge really. Um, so we keep on joking about it, uh, as in there are cities in Germany where you cannot get married anymore because basically all their systems are down. Uh, <laughs> all right, maybe, <laughs> maybe that, but anyway. Um, and uh, we, we do see companies that are, that are really being victims of, of ransomware attacks not being able to continue their business. And um, that is, of course, a huge problem. And um, what happens here is that in this particular threat type, if you will, um, AI is so far not playing a huge role, but we do see it increasing. Let me put it this way. Um, so what happens here is that speed is of the essence. Usually vulnerabilities which are there have to be exploited within days, sometimes even hours, and are exploited sometimes even within hours. And um, what uh, Brandon has just pointed out, you know, having all those specialists in line that, that you can just book and use technical APIs to just basically put them into your, your process as an attacker makes it very easy to attack, very, very easy. And here AI is helping. It's helping with uh, things like really putting the process together. It's helping with, well, if you need to, to tell them basically where to, to basically send the ransom, you have to do that sometimes in their own language. And their K uh, AI comes in very handy by just translating what needs to be done. So it really it speeds up the process. But we do not see this as the major tool uh, for, for attacks yet. But we do see an, uh, um, um, an incline there. Um, what worries us there is With the attackers being very far away, it's very difficult to get at them with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They are very often state-sponsored or at least state-approved, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, let's put it that way. So they're very far away, and there's, there's very few possibilities for us to actually get at them. The next thing is we're still a rich country, and that means, of course, it's attractive to, mm -hmm. to uh, attack us. And last but not least, it's way too easy, way too easy. And the last part, as in um, being victims that are easily attacked, becomes easier with new technologies. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that also puts us in a position where we can use exactly the same um, technologies to defend ourselves. And what will be of the essence here is speed. Mm -hmm. We have to, to use and develop those technologies at the same speed at which the attackers are using them to attack us. Mm -hmm. So those would be my views on that question. Thank you. Mr. Wells, would you like to add something? Yeah, no, I, th I think um, Claudia is exactly right. What we are most, what we are seeing now is the initial stages of experimentation by groups about how to use these AI tools. I think it's, um, uh, we are seeing the same in the defensive world. How do we exploit new AI technology to enable stronger cyber defenses that are better able to predict anomalous activity and detect uh, never seen before uh, malicious malicious code, et cetera. So I think both sides are kind of jockeying for uh, how do we take advantage of this unique moment. Um, we are not yet seeing kind of 
uh, AI being used uh, at scale to be weaponized against us. But, you know, like all new technology, that's probably only a matter of time. Um, I think what we have before us is this uh, unique opportunity to not repeat the mistakes of the Internet age, where we decided not to focus on security up front. And we are now struggling uh, to build in security to systems that um, uh, were never really designed uh, to be secure uh, up front. And I think we should not repeat that same mistake in the AI age. Um, and we need to find and identify ways in which we can build stronger security mechanisms, stronger safeguards into this technology. And I think we are trying to focus increasingly on ways in which um, uh, security is a paramount importance along with uh, features and cost and and speed to market uh, that is that is driving uh, the the technology ecosystem. Mr. Wells, you said um, it's very interesting because you said building secure pro uh, products, and uh, for a long time the idea was the problem is in front of the screen, like the human. And uh, maybe it's a little bit unfair because a password, as some researchers say, is the most inhumane security uh, measure that you can probably think of. Um, and we saw that in the United States cybersecurity strategy that there has been a mindset shift to be more like from the human to the product to the companies that sell these products. We have this in the European Union with the Cyber Resilience Act, for example, security by design. Do you think <coughs> that there's a, uh, uh, Ms. Platner, do you think that there's a mindset shift? Not exactly sure that it's a mindset shift, people's responsibility and, and, and the necessity to make them aware of, of what are the risks um, won't change, I think. But nonetheless, um, we have to look at all sides of, uh, of, of the whole story. I mean, for, for now, there's the, the two biggest attack vectors, the two biggest uh, problems we're facing are, are, first of all, vulnerabilities in systems. So that's that's one of the major issues. Um, you know, some some gaping holes in the systems that can be exploited, and the exploits are out there. And uh, the other one is um, credentials. So that's exactly what you were getting at, as in um, having credentials, um, for example, from someone who's left the company and and the login still exists, or passwords which are just not set properly, or put somewhere in the code so that easy password spraying attacks really get you what you need in order to then enter a system and then find your way and, and uh, enhance your your um, credentials in there. Um, all of it has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. All of it has to be addressed, and the responsibilities lie also. Yes, with the producers of software and systems, so that's why the Cyber Resilience Act will play a major role. Um, and that's the one thing, so producers will be responsible for the cybersecurity of their products throughout the product's life cycle. Mm -hmm. And that in itself makes perfect sense, right? If you buy a car, then you want to make sure that for, I don't know, at least the next 10 years, you're, you're able to, um, or you're you're it's possible to buy spare parts, right? So that's kind of like the same thing, making sure that there are updates and stuff. And on the other hand, we have another piece of regulation, the so-called NIS uh, 2 directive, um, which basically says the, the users of software, as in the companies, the institutions, they also have to play their part and take proper care. Just because there's an update and a patch for a problem does not mean that automatically the patch and the problem, uh, the, the, the patch will be applied. The company that uses the software will also have to apply it. So it's really it's it's a twofold thing. So both sides have to play their part, and passwords and credentials do come in. And of course, we also fa um, advise you all to use two-factor authentication for anything <laughs> that's important. And yes, things will become bet better with pass keys instead of passwords. I hope so. Mr. Wells, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wells, what is the uh, U.S. take on security by design, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, this is obviously a, a major priority for uh, for CISA, and I think, as you noted, um, it is something that has been, is part of one of the major policy shifts that has been called for in the, in the new U.S. cyber strategy, um, which basically says that the burden for cybersecurity should be placed on those best able to handle it. And I think... Um, it is clear there's always going to be some burden on the end users, whether that's individual users to ensure that their own devices are secure or um, uh, companies and critical infrastructure to uh, put in place reasonable security measures. But I think we have seen for too long that security is an afterthought uh, in critical in, in technology and 
we have a multi-billion dollar cybersecurity industry because we have a insecure multi-trillion dollar technology industry. And if we are going to attempt to secure um, uh, infrastructure one patch at a time, uh, that, is a, that is a losing battle when there are 18,000 new vulnerabilities every single year in, in critical technology. Um, and so we have been uh, working uh, you know, both things seen and unseen related to how do we improve the technology ecosystem. Uh, we work with a number of international partners, including our, our colleagues in, in Germany and in other parts of Europe on a series of products that seem to kind of start to identify what are the kind of key elements of uh, secure by design regime. Uh, we've gathered feedback from industry themselves uh, to help us make sure that when we are making recommendations, uh, uh, we can, um, uh, we you know, we can speak with with one voice and have it resonate in industry. Um, but I, I think, you know, some of this is going to be challenging, um, and but some of it is not. I mean, we have seen major uh, campaigns, uh, major vulnerabilities being exposed, um, being exploited by ransomware operators for simple design flaws that have been fixed for years. So. Um, Large companies around the world were impacted by the uh, vulnerability in MoveIt uh, file transfer software. That was a simple SQL injection vulnerability, um, which, again, a few lines of code that have really been known for more than a decade, and that problem could have been avoided. We have still have large numbers of vulnerabilities in because we continue to use uh, code base relying on non-memory safe coding languages um, when there are memory safe ones available today that are um, uh, can be used. And I think we have seen some companies start to say that they're going to, you know, all their new code will be in memory safe languages. So we're starting to see that move. Um, but this really needs to be at, at a much more significant scale, given the, just the size and breadth of, of the global technology ecosystem. When we talk about um this ways of uh, helping and foster and making societies more resilient. Um, we also talk about cyber norms, for example. Um, Mr. Wells, what is your take on cyber norms? What should they be, especially when we work together as Germany and the United States? I mean, I, I think that um, the US and, and Europe and others have been establishing cyber norms for for more than a decade. Um, there has been work both through through the UN through and through other fora um, that seek to identify kind of what are those basic principles in cyberspace. But I think one of the areas that we need to continue to focus on is ensuring that we are calling out bad behavior uh, when when countries, when organizations, when criminals are acting outside of those acceptable norms, because that is the way in which we're going to make and set clear acceptable boundaries uh, for what type of behavior is, is you know we are willing to accept um, in cyberspace. I think it is one of the reasons why the United States has been um, so aggressive in calling out and attributing malicious cyber activity uh, when and where we see it, both affecting the United States directly, but including uh, attacks that are that are have impacted others in Europe. So, for example, the Russian attack against Viasat in the uh, early days of the of the war in Ukraine, uh, the disruptive effect that it had on critical infrastructure in multiple other European countries. Again, those types of attacks we see as um, unacceptable in in, um, in in the global cyber ecosystem. And I think we are looking for as many like-minded countries to join us as possible when we do that, because that is the way in which we're ultimately going to ensure that those norms have meaning and have impact. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Platner, um, when we look at cooperation, cyber norms are one, um, one aspect. What other fields of cooperation do you see? Oh, there's plenty of fields. Um, so uh, the things we're working on, um, one that is very, very technical um, has to do with standards, like just normal technical standards. If you agree on, on, on safe protocols, for example, for communication, for how to build things, everything becomes a lot easier. Um, and that's also from an economic point of view makes a lot of sense to just agree on a few things. But this is, this is global, and that means we also have to play our part in those negotiations, because if they are just left to the other side, then of course we end up with standards which are not so much focusing on security. 
So that's that's one thing. The next thing is everything around um, um, certifications. So if we define what we consider safe, and we agree. There's also a big market for making sure that we mutually recognize and harmonize uh, um, between our countries um, and, and in yeah, like-minded countries where we basically say we can, we can increase the market. Because if we build on, on secure products and we recognize the security mutually, that also means the markets get bigger. And that binds us closer together. So that's another thing. When it comes to cybersecurity itself, uh, one very important step is exchanging information. That's like the most important part, exchanging intelligence, threat intelligence, to make sure that others do not run into the same problems that you've just, um, uh, just realized can be solved in a certain way. You know, saving each other from from the harm that is that is going on there. So there's there's plenty of opportunities uh, to 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 go about this. We have this huge initiative, counter ransomware initiative, where we try to work together on these problems. So there's there's plenty of possibilities, all the way up to law enforcement, really, um, or finding finding um, the way that finances go through cryptocurrency uh, markets and and finding what we can do there. So there's there's plenty of possibilities to tackle this problem together, and I think we have to because it really it doesn't end at the border. Um, bits and bytes don't really care about borders, not at all. Not one bit. <laughs> Bite. So I have uh, a thousand remaining questions, actually, but um, I got a sign in the front row, and it's still only five minutes left, so I would love to open up the discussion for the audience for questions, and I have C1, two, maybe, yeah. There, there. That means short answers, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, Gunther Tau from the company TBS. Uh, I've been last week with Johannes at uh, Tagesspiegel, and we were talking about uh, cybersecurity. And, well, this time I was missing one point is, you know, when we were talking about ransomware. Well, ransom have been in the 80s with Soros and the speculation on the pound. And there has been the Asian financial crisis, 97. So are you, Brandon and Claudia, including, you know, um, not only hardware attacks, but, you know, I, I would call them soft attacks, which can collapse the whole economic system in some states or even globally? I'm not sure uh, that I fully get the question. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. But, you know, well, <clears throat> you were talking a little bit about hardware and the resilience. And I'm talking about a little bit of soft, you know, the soft tools to make ransoms regarding, you know, attacks on the financial market. So like hybrid attacks, like disinformation? Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay, now I, now I get it. Well, there's, there's usually a hard element in that as well, but anyway, um, maybe I, I start, Brandon, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so what we do see, I'm not sure that I fully got it, but let's try. Um, what we do see is um, um, the element of, of disinformation or actually information sometimes or um, hack and leaks for, is, is a very good example, where basically what you do is you try to extract information, usually in a, in a, in a way that is criminal, for example, by, by hacking some, some famous people, some celebrities, some politicians, whatnot. And you basically take that information and then you leak some of it in order to support a narrative. And then you basically try to drive that narrative in form of a disinformation campaign. So that's one of the things we see, for example, before um, um, elections. Um, so those are the things we also see. And they have a political dimension because they're steered. Um, they're, there's a target behind this. Um, and we do see that as well. Um, we are also, f of course, looking into the financial market. That's one of the examples you, you were saying. Um, we do see that as well. Um, and, and here our colleagues from a German institute called BaFin, they are the institution that is responsible for this. They take care of this. And, and I have some experience, of course, from the European Central Bank. This is indeed also a topic um, that is under scrutiny and where we have to, to pay attention to. It's not just ransomware attacks. It's also espionage. It's also sabotage. It's also disinformation. So it's a whole range of, of things we're looking at. And I think before I hand over to you, Mr. Wells, it's very important what you said. It's cooperation also between institutions, right? Because yes. Because Baffin, for very example, important. sharing information. But Mr. Wells, maybe you can add, especially when it comes to inform election security. 
Yeah, so um, I, you know, I think that there is a natural relationship between the uh, security world and what we expect in terms of building longer term resilience uh, that we need against a variety of types of threats, including um, uh, influence operations as discussed or potentially other types of uh, shocks uh, to critical systems, whether those are supply chain shocks or destabilization of markets. Some of that is obviously outside the responsibility of organizations like mine and, and Claudia's, but we tend to have to work very closely with them. So, for example, we work very closely with the Treasury uh, Department in the U.S. that's working with the financial industry to try to build longer term resilience. Um, uh, where cybersecurity is just one of, of many risks that they need to take seriously. Um, on the disinformation front, obviously, this is a significant challenge. It's an area where I think we will see AI risks m most profoundly um, uh, come to life in the, in the short term. Um, and again, there, it's really a matter of how, what does resilience really mean? Um, how do we build both uh, societal resilience to uh, make ourselves less susceptible to these types of, of influence operations? And then how do we create mechanisms to counter them quickly by kind of pointing to trusted voices within the community? For us, that's because of the decentralized nature of the way elections are conducted in the United States. It really has to do with kind of how do we um, uh, amplify the voice of local election officials who often are the ones with the best available information and who, because they are often local uh, community leaders, um, are are the ones who can be who can be trusted, um, as opposed to someone speaking from Washington D.C. far far from uh, uh, from that community. And so um, that's a lot of the work that uh, that we're doing on that front. Thank you. I saw another question here and there. And there, sorry, the the um, gentleman in the third row was first. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, no engineer would ever build a bridge like we build modern software and operating systems, and no customer would accept it. Um, uh, but if uh, you deliver software that isn't safe, usually you don't have a problem. The customer has a problem, which is not your problem. So, uh, um, and the second part is we learned that security can't be uh, patched into software and can't be tested into software, but either you design security into software or it is insecure. So how could we fit this together? Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, we accepted that uh, the responsibility and the liability are not bound together for this kind of product. Uh, product. Uh, should we maybe think about steering in a different direction? Hmm. Excellent question. Brad, well, I'll, you, I'll, you I'll want to take the one? Start. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, it, you know, because this issue is again raised in the, in the last year's national cyber strategy in the US, where we do need to look at um, changes to the liability system. You are correct. Um, today, all the burden for for vulnerabilities in and defects in software um, are borne by the end user, some people who are least often least able to actually address the underlying uh, underlying issue. That needs to that needs to change. Uh, the prospects for liability reform in this area are kind of not um, probably uh, great politically in the short term, uh, but it is an issue that needs to be worked because we do need to find ways of really fundamentally changing. Um, uh, the market here uh, to get the type of security outcomes that we want. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Um, there is uh, the lady with the green jacket. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank <clears> you. <throat> Sylvia Kalmar is my name. I'm uh, MD of uh, Public Affairs Agency Erste Lesung, and I would like to profit from this opportunity. Thank you for the Espen Institute you having you both on a panel, which doesn't happen that often. My question is focusing on security versus sovereignty. We see it in Germany pretty often if we are talking about the digitalization of the public sector, that it's always a question how to increase sovereignty uh, and held a decent level of security. So I think I can elaborate on that for a long, but you both know the material better than I do, so I would be very very interested in your thoughts on that. As better, would you start? Um, first of all, I would not see this as mutually exclusive or a balance I have to keep between the two, um, not at all. And if we want to talk about keeping balances, then let's throw in another one, which is really important in my opinion, which is digitalization itself. 
which also has to work. Um, so um, it's a it's a it's a complicated field, no doubt about it. Um, the question for me is, how do we proceed from here? Where can we actually gain ground and gain traction um, when it comes to moving forward and evolving our digital landscapes in such a way that indeed we pay um, proper attention to cybersecurity? We will not be able to do digitalization without cybersecurity. And we will also not be able to um, evolve over the long term if we don't have enough sovereignty in it. Uh, but sovereignty is not just only about um, um, products. It's also not to be confused with autarky. That's another thing. What we need to figure out in Europe is what part of the digital value chain do we want to place our focus on? And that is a very, very strategic decision. We need to be know what we are good at. What are we good at and what can we contribute to the digital value chain? And there are things where I believe that our partners, so good to have you here, Brandon, um, might be way ahead of us. Do we really have to copy that or can we just combine our forces and see what our respective partners are good at? The example I usually bring is uh, car manufacturing. Despite Tesla, I still believe we, buy, we build pretty good cars, you know? So on the other hand, we don't produce all the different spare parts ourselves. So, for example, we don't produce wheels, car wheels. Um, 18 out of the 20 biggest uh, wheel manufacturers on this planet are not from Europe. And nonetheless, we would consider uh, um, the European automobile industry as a pretty strong one. So we, you can have sovereignty without being totally um, um, independent of everyone else. So for me, the important part is how can we combine our forces in the digital value chain and make sure that cybersecurity is at the right place in all parts of the value chain. Coming back to security by design and by default, it has to be built in. Thank you. You built the perfect bridge for me, actually. Oh. Thank you. And before Stormy kicks me from the stage, I would love to uh, ask the final question. And Please, a one-sentence answer. Uh, cooperation and um, is also learning from each other. So when you look at the United States, um, Ms. Platon, what is the one thing that you consider a best practice and something which we as Germans should adapt? Oh, I love the guys you are, uh, are doing business. Uh, so I really do like the way you're taking risks, um, um, calculated risks, and just run with it. Thank you. Mr. Wells, what's the German thing you want to establish in America? Um, <laughs> yeah. Thought I had muted that. Um, so uh, that is uh, that's a it's an interesting question. You know, I, I don't know that there's one thing that I want to uh, establish, but um, I think what we are trying to do is to further the partnership so that the, the cyber defense cooperation between the two countries is seamless. Um, I think we have an extremely close relationship with BSI. We do a lot of expert to expert exchanges, particularly in some of the more critical areas like uh, operational technology, control system security issues. And I think what I'm hoping is that we continue to mature that uh, to the point where uh, our countries are equally protected and, and, and well secured and um, we'll leave some of the broader policy making to others. So partnership on eye level, great. Thank you so much for your time and talking to us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Of course, we have another very exciting panel coming up. Um, and as I said, there are still some really nice seats up here. It's uh, so crowded already in the back. And it's a large panel because, as always, we want to bring together different uh, positions and different opinions and different experiences. Um, we now want to take a closer look at the nexus, the relationship between new technologies and uh, democracy. Um, and I'm welcoming back everybody, also our online uh, participants. And um, if you haven't been able to join us um, earlier today, um, you did not see yet that I'm always um, welcoming our moderator in a special way. So Terry Martin, please come up here and give him a special applause. 
Thank you. A special applause, right? I like that. Did you get the picture? <laughs> well, Terry, thank you so much for moderating this. Um, we've also been um, uh, well trusted, um, if not old partners, um, <laughs> you and I, and also the Espen Institute. Um, you are um, a journalist, a moderator, an anchor person. Um, you moderate for Deutsche Welle, but also um, privately. And you are also a transatlanticist um, and an expert. Um, oh, an expert. Oh, oh an you. expert too. I don't um, get called that very often. Yeah. I'm yeah, a generalist. Well, you're a generalist with an, with, with an expert view on foreign policy making. Thank you. Um, so where do you think, um, on a scale 1 to 10, um, does the transatlantic relationship currently stand? I, uh, we, we had a poll, if, if, if some of you were, were here, I, mean, I guess most of you were here at the beginning, uh, we had the, one of these excellent polls, and I, I put it kind of in the middle, right? It's, um, hmm, it could be better, it could be worse, and uh, uh, the prospects for it getting better are there, but there are serious risks as well. Yeah. And this is who you are, a great med mediator, <laughs> right in the middle. Um, and with this, I hand over to you um, to end to our panelists and give them into your trusted hands. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce our, our distinguished panelists. Uh, th thanks, th thanks so much, Tom. I, I just want to do express my appreciation to the Aspen Institute for having me here for this uh, extremely important topic. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then we'll jump right into it. Uh, so, beginning with uh, Tobias Bachela. Uh, can we get Tobias up here first of all? He, he's a member of the Bundes, uh, German Bundestag, the Bundes uh, 90 Grünen. If you would sit right here. Uh, and he's also a coordinator of the Digital Affairs Committee on, in the Bundestag, is that right? Of the Green Group. In the of the Green Group. In uh, in the, of the Digital Committee, yeah. Okay, which is a member of the government, in case anyone uh, has forgotten that. Yeah, uh, th thanks for being here. Benjamin Bracke is with us as well. He's uh, Director General of Digital and Data Policy at the German Federal Ministry of Digital Affairs and Transport. And I should mention too, and this, this makes, makes it quite interesting, that before that you spent 10 years with IBM. So you were in the Indeed. private sector and have a view of how things are going with IBM. We're going to be talking a lot about artificial intelligence today, and IBM, of course, is very, very strong in that as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Caroline King, Head of Global Government Affairs and Business Development at the enterprise software company SAP. Uh, anyone in Germany will know who SAP is, but I would just... Just to add to that, I looked it up. SAP does have the highest market capitalization of any company in Germany at the moment, right? So technically the most valuable company in the country. And just one little fact I found out too about SAP, uh, you can tell me if this is true or not, that roughly three quarters of all revenue globally touches an SAP system somewhere. That's beautiful. I didn't even prep you for that. I, I no, no. It's, uh, I, I just thought, wow, that's, wow, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, so back, you know, back offices everywhere have SAP running. So, and Hanna Muller is head of the division political systems, hybrid threats, and disinformation at the Federal Ministry of the Interior and <laughs> Community. I don't need to add anything to that. That no. is just an absolute uh, amazing thing. I know you also have a lot of experience in China, having worked with Germany's uh, Federation of German Industries before that, uh, which also brings some interesting insights to this panel. Semyon Renz is Public Policy <laughs> Director for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland at Meta. And if any of you aren't really sure, you know, Meta, of course, you know this by now, it's the company behind Facebook, uh, also the company behind Instagram, also the company behind WhatsApp, uh, and these are, these are apps that I don't know how the world would function without them anymore, at least the last two. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jeremy Rawlinson, finally, uh, uh, Rawlinson, rather, head of EU policy, government affairs, and uh, European government affairs at Microsoft. He's based in Brussels. Thank you for coming to Berlin to be with us. Uh, we'll uh, I'll mention a detail about your biography later on. We'll get to that. Anyway, Ooh. thank you all. Um, I'm looking forward to, to a discussion. We're going to have, I'm going to do a quick thematic introduction and then we'll, at, we'll jump straight into the discussion. And at the very end, I hope we'll have 20 minutes left over to get input from all of you. So if you're thinking about questions as we go along, uh, just earmark them and we'll, be, we'll take them at the end. I want to compliment the organizers also for coming up with a really catchy title. Unfortunately, it's not on the, on the board. Oh, there it is. Look, good tech, good democracy. 
I mean, whoever wrote that could get a job writing headlines, right? If AI wasn't going to take that job away anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll sit down. Let's get started. Um, this discussion couldn't be more timely. Uh, we were just having some, a chat before we got started. And, uh, AI is just the term that we're all is on everyone's mind at the moment. Um, and I say this, this is timely for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, as Amy Gutman, the US ambassador mentioned earlier, uh, 2024 is a mega election year. There are around 60 national elections being held around the world this year. Uh, we've got important elections, obviously, in the United States. Everybody's looking at that with bated breath. We've got EU parliamentary elections, and we have a couple of uh, three key elections coming up here in Germany as well. These elections are being held at a time when democracy is under immense strain to uh, not least in Germany and in the United States, it must be said. Uh, you may have seen the latest VDEM, um, VDEM democracy report. They track uh, how democracies are doing versus autocracies, autocracies in the world. Uh, that report just came out last week and again confirmed the uh, trend toward autocracy and that the number of democratizing countries in the world is declining. Uh, the second thing that makes this discussion timely is where we are in, in, a, in terms of the development of digital technology, because we're at really a, a watershed moment, at a critical moment there. People are inc increasingly inf informing themselves, of course, through digital media, through, uh, particularly through social media, which is awash with disinformation and misinformation, it must be said. Uh, and that's now being turbocharged by artificial intelligence, right? So, uh, and meanwhile, governments are struggling, scrambling to understand uh, how to deal with all of this, the implications of AI, and, and to respond with appropriate regulation. Now, our discussion here today will focus on the United States and on Germany, uh, how these countries can harness the positive potential of technology while mitigating its uh, adverse effects. We'll look at efforts to foster transatlantic standards, combat disinformation and digital authoritarianism, and discuss ways to incentivize, and this is really important because we have strong re representation from the private sector here on this, on this panel, how to incentivize the private sector to play a constructive role in this endeavor and make, make it work for you guys, right? Because you're also at the innovative cutting edge of what's going on. Now, we'll jump straight into the discussion without prepared statements. And as I say, the last 20 minutes, love to hear from you guys. Just to kick things off, I'm going to throw a couple of quotes at you and get you to respond. Uh, the, the first, uh, these statements were made, by the way, over the past two days at the, at the Summit for Democracy that's currently underway in Seoul, South Korea. You guys might be aware of that. That's still happening. Uh, the first quote, and I'm going to get uh, Hannah Müller, Semyon Renz, and Tobias Bachele re to respond to this uh, first. The first quote is from the South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol. He said, and this is a summit for democracy, right? Third year going. He said, fake news and disinformation based on artificial intelligence and digital technology not only violates individual freedom and human rights, but also threatens democratic systems, right? He stated, stated it quite bluntly. So my question then to Hannah Müller, Semyon Renz, and Tobias Bachler, how much of a threat do you think that AI and digital tech pose to democratic systems? And we're going to start with you, Hannah. <laughs> I was hoping. Since no. that is your job, really. I know, it, I know. It's your job profile very well. <clears throat> yes, um, I would totally agree. Um, however, I think there are two sides uh, to that. So I think that disinformation, misinformation is probably as old as humankind. <laughs> so uh, the topic of disinformation is not, you know, here because we have AI, but of course it facilitates uh, things. And we as governments, um, of course, uh, have to make sure that we are right on track with that. And this is probably one of the challenges we are having. Like, we are not known to be like the fastest working <laughs> uh, sector, so to say. Um, so it is a huge challenge. And of course, uh, the possibility to manipulate information is a huge challenge for us and, and is harming dem democratic uh, systems. Samian Renz. So overall, I would agree that, of course, AI can pose um, a threat to democracy if used by bad actors. 
uh, with regard to disinformation. Um, but of course, there are two sides uh, on this coin. And um, basically, like uh, as working for Meta, on the one hand, we are investing heavily uh, in artificial intelligence and excellence in this regard. Just in 2024, we will invest 37 billion in developing uh, artificial intelligence. On the one other hand, as you mentioned at the beginning, we are um, providing social networks uh, who can be used for democratic and political discourse. So we have a clear responsibility um, with that in mind, but also, of course, when we are deploying and developing artificial intelligence. Um, I would like to say that AI is both um, a sword and a shield uh, when it comes to um, disinformation. So if you have a look at where our AI program is coming from, it started actually uh, with the idea to tackle disinformation harmful content on our platforms. We have over 3.5 billion people using our services, so artificial intelligence and machine learning tools are essential to tackle these. Um, and that's where the starting point was, actually, sure. for our AI program. That's a huge responsibility. That many people are using your, your programs. Uh, absolutely. Right. So, um, but that, that's exactly where the starting point was. And um, there are many brilliant examples of how a AI can actually serve democracies and public discourse. Um, so far, if you look at the elections we have observed um, already in this year, we have not seen any major use of artificial intelligence to interfere uh, with, ele with elections. That was, I think, reflected also on the panel we just had here before with uh, the president of the BSI. Um, I, I would double down on that, that this is so far the case, but I mean, it is a realistic threat that it will be used. And, and we we're looking at technology, you're talking about elections. Uh, we've already had an election in Pakistan, and we noticed in Pakistan that the government decided to just shut down you know, mobile communications and, and the internet uh, at, a, at a critical point towards the end of that election. So it's just an illustration of how, uh, of how uh, governments can intervene to, or how, the techno how technologies can enable or uh, prevent people from, from interacting. If I may respond Please. directly to that, um, that's of course something we observe, especially around, uh, especially with regard to authoritarian regimes around the globe, that they are shutting down uh, access to internet services ahead of elections. But there are many other uh, threat angles, like hack and leak tactics. Um, we have seen there are. Um, um, uh, uh, attacks on, on media publishers um, like... Uh, sure, of course. Uh, Semi, I, I, we can uh, get back to this in a moment, but I just want to give everyone an opportunity to kind of you know, kick in here at the beginning and then we can go into more detail. Th thank you. Uh, Tobias Bachele. Oh, sorry. Um, no, let me see. We've got... Yeah, Tobias. Um, well, I would argue probably we're going to talk a lot about uh, the malfunctioning and the manipulation of distribution systems. And I think their AI can be helpful and not so much of a threat. When it comes to uh, gen AI and disinformation, I would argue, yes, it's a problem, but mainly we lack two things, or because we lack two things. And one is transparency. We're still not able to identify um, AI edited or manipulated uh, pictures or completely generated pictures that could be could be changed when it comes to content credentials or something like that, and it could be shown why on is, the platform. Why is that a problem? Because um, I think it's very important to know context and uh, to know that something has been changed, edited. Because if I have an AI-generated image and I know this is AI-generated, then it's not big of a deal. Then it could be satire or could be to illustrate something. So like if I believe it's opinion. right, if there is an intention to fool me, then that's a problem. And this could be broken by that transparency. And the other thing we lack is a general digital literacy and knowledge of what's possible. Um, and I think this is, this is very important because on the first, first look, um, two, three years ago, when we had first gen AI uh, tools around, the, we had the dancing Putin, and I think no one really believed Putin would be dancing like that, and of course it was also uh, not a really good video and everything, so it was pretty clear. But of course the advancement is so fast that it's really hard for people to keep track and to identify the little glitches um, that often are still involved in those uh, generated above all videos. And I just want to take this to, the, so we, know, we know that that can happen, that there's manipulation, but why is that a problem for democracy? Because in the end, democracies um, run on debate, and uh, those debate rooms need somehow or a certain degree of agreeing on truth 
and a certain capability, a capability to, well, not be flooded by shit. Well put. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Now, um, now we got the second quote here that we're going to throw out there, um, and it's from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. You might, might have seen this uh, come through yesterday. Uh, he said, again, in the context of this summit for democracy, an author as authoritarian and repressive regimes deploy technologies to undermine democracy and human rights, we need to ensure that technology sustains and supports democratic values and norms. So the question is then, how do we do that? How do we ensure that technology sustains and supports democratic values and norms? Benjamin. Ben. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps two things to that. Uh, first of all, I, of course I would agree with uh, Secretary Blinken. Um, the question is how do we operationalize this? Um, from our point of view, and you mentioned that there is a declining number in states that are democracies and a rising number in states that are more authoritarian regimes. So we need to close the ranks in somehow. So we have the G7, we have the OECD, we have established international formats where we can actually put these questions to the floor where we can discuss and where we can ha actually have conclusions out of this. The code of conduct, for example, on the G7 level is that is a value-based document on how we would like to see generative AI put to practice. Um, so now the second step is how are we going to institutionalize this? What kind of international organization could actually handle this? Might it be the OECD, for example, because those are the open democratic economies. That might be a step forward. But a, a condition to this is transparency and openness on both sides, on, this, on the side of the companies. And you mentioned that uh, I work for IBM and uh, Zemion made the pitch for, for, uh, for Meta. Uh, companies very often, as politicians and governments, by the way, as well, very much focus on the good that they are doing, that they are investing a lot in transparency, that they are investing a lot in transparent systems. But you we, see that happening? Samuel just made the pitch. So um, I think, and from the and from the uh, from the side of the government, we always say we have the, this regulation in place. We are going to have these kind of safeguards here. These are the international guidelines. But we should be very honest. This generative AI, this discussion around AI in general, is it a threat or is it, uh, is it um, how to say, of value to our societies? That also demands an openness and to be, to be very open to say, this is an endeavor, this is a journey on which we are. We don't know what might be the shortcomings and what might be the advantages of this. And I would like to be I, I would like to, I would wish for more honesty on, on both sides because that is what we need if we want to have a sound debate among the value-driven partners that we are, especially in the G7. So transparency and some common framework for, for approaching it, plus investment in the positive parts. Good. Uh, Jeremy. Well, I think I would agree with a lot of what Ben just said. I think if, if you asked Brussels, and that's where my role is based, I think Brussels would have a regulatory answer for you as well. <laughs> but. I think the only thing I would add to what Ben mentioned is, you know, there's an important point around access. You need to make sure that everyone has access to this technology. And that doesn't mean providing the bad guys access to the nefarious ways they can use it, but there is a democratizing effect of making sure that the most powerful parts of this technology, in some use scenarios, sure, there may be national security issues around that, but it has a very democratizing effect when you're looking at AI more broadly. We want to make sure that has as much reach as possible. So I think that's an important part. Some might say that even carries risk. I'm trying to emphasize the fact that it's not a good thing if it only becomes concentrated in the hands of a few players in a few markets in a few parts of the world. So I would just double down on the access point. And I do think that when we talk about responsibility, Tech companies have a huge responsibility, but they can't do it alone. So we definitely, and you saw some of this at the Munich Security Conference recently and some of the partnerships that we're striking, everyone has a role to play there. And I haven't heard a lot about education yet, but that has to run in parallel this way. I think the watermarking solutions that we're coming up with, to answer your example about audiovisual content, there's a lot of promise there. But we also need to make sure that as this space involves, we're educating folks to ask the right types of questions when you're engaging with that content. We shouldn't just think we can solve all of it by a watermarking solution. Mm -hmm. Caroline. I think it's, uh, I would underscore also what Jeremy's just been saying. It's, it reminds me too of the discussions we have in other, other fields as, as cloud technologies developed or around um, 
uh, regulatory standards now globally, we need a industry as much as government needs a level playing field. So we need a, a, some kind of framework. The EU uh, AI Act is an interesting example um, and, and could become, as GDPR did, a kind of a gold standard uh, for, uh, for the global scene. I, the concern is there has to be a level playing field. There has to be also um, a transparency but, um, and a harmonization. And I think from our perspective within SAP, we're kind of an oddball on, or I'm kind of an oddball on this panel because we work in the B2B world and not B2C. Um, so we have the advantage, I suppose, of working uh, with our own customers' data, which we already have vetted and we know is reliable, and we uh, have to work in a responsible fashion with that data. So it's, maybe it's an easier game for us to play than in the B2C world. But the concern we have is with these uh, kind of plethora of different frameworks that are emerging uh, internationally. So definitely, as Benjamin says, either within the OECD or within G7, that there has to be, a, uh, as I say, this level playing field for AI, just as we had in the past, and with CC around regulatory standards or data privacy discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got a, a, we've set the scene here now with uh, responding to the two strains of our discussion. One is the threats posed, the risks associated with technologies, and particularly with artificial intelligence, as that is the dominant question that's hanging in the air right now in a transformative technology. The other is how to exploit its, its positive potential and, and use it to, as a benefit for democracy as opposed to something else. Now, I'm gonna get, now we're going to get into more specifics. Um, and Tobias, I, I want to start with you. The, you sit in the German parliament. The German parliament itself uh, has been attacked, uh, you know, is un under cyber attack as we speak, I suspect, uh, and you're still working through some of the things in the past. Uh, Germany is often criticized, also particularly within Germany, for not having the digital infrastructure kind of that it should have to support industry and to support a number of things, including uh, democracy in terms of how people can participate in the public life. Um, let me ask you, to how well is Germany prepared to deal with a world that is now turbocharged by artificial intelligence and is driving ahead, leaping ahead with digital technology? How well is Germany prepared for this? Depends. Depends on, <laughs> on what aspect you, you want to look, look on. I, I would say, on the one hand, we have... Uh, we have, of course, the issue that we need to modernize our public sector, that there is a lot of uh, data available that, or sh that should be available that is not yet available from the public sector. But also when it comes to data sharing in general, which is in the end fueling AI, there is a huge potential in Germany, but uh, there is little knowledge or experience mm -hmm. in it. And this comes to personal data as well as um, data that is being produced in all the companies we have. We have so many SMEs, which is great, and this is amazing for our, uh, for our economy and also for our social um, structure, but it's, you have a lot of players, you need to agree that they are now sharing data to, to train an AI in their field. And so there we are opposing challenges on, on a big potential. On other fields, I would argue, of course, we have the AI Act, which is, I think, a strong framework to to, to re regulatory framework, of course, um, to when it comes to deployment of AI. And then we have this very, where I'm really not sure about this, 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 this threat to democracy, the question on how much is, is, is our public debate fueled or manipulated by disinformation, by disinfo ops, and so on. And I would argue we have incredibly strong actors and knowledge on that, but it's hard for them to get hurt. And it's hard for, for us as a society to have that understanding implemented in all the different branches, in all the different peer groups, age groups, and so on. And I think the idea of lifelong learning is not new to Germans, but in this speed, it's sometimes challenging, and I think this is this is kind of the biggest challenge we are facing. That people need to adapt to those changes, um, and and this is an extreme 
We're in this process of adapting now. And uh, I mean, the same question I need to put to you, of course, as well, Ben, if you want to respond to, to what Tobias just says, because you're sitting in the ministry that deals specifically with this, trying to support Germany's, the development of Germany's digital capabilities, both for industry and for public, the public sphere. Uh, where, where, do you, where do you see Germany? You, you, you worked for you know, a big corporation before that. You kind of have an understanding of, of where Germany stands in relation to other countries in relation to the U.S., for example. How do you see it? I mean, I, I can't speak for IBM any longer, but when I was working with IBM, IBM um, decided to invest heavily in Germany, so um, they opened up um, a huge center in Munich, uh, so-called Watson Center. Um, one of the last thing um, I was involved in was bringing a quantum computer to Germany. So um, with regard to how attractive the standard, uh, the the, uh, the market is, or um, Germany is in general, um, I mean, I, I would let speak it for itself, uh, the, the facts here. And I, I think Microsoft uh, has announced also uh, quite of a, a huge investment in, in Germany. So um, it's it can't be really unattractive. Now, looking into the facts, perhaps just a couple of things here. First of all... Sorry, just... Uh, yeah, sure. Interrupt, like, Go ahead. Digital infrastructure in Germany, is that, yeah. like, really good? Would Digital you say? infrastructure, when There's, you look at the facts... When I don't you look get at, that impression. You know? Yeah, I, I know. But when you look at the facts, for example, at 5G, 4G, um, actually, um, we are also, um, with the measurement of the European Union, we are, um, we are actually in the frontrunners group in, in Germany. So... Frontrunner within... Europe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Scandinavian uh, countries. It's not. Decide, it's not. Know. I know public services. Is, it's an. Uh, it's another story. Um, education, because you mentioned also education. Tobias also mentioned uh, literacy. Um, there's something where we where we need to speed up. But let me perhaps mention one thing, um, especially when it comes to the digitization of of companies, um, of the private sector, because we have one particular goal in our digital strategy that is to provide all sectors, private sector, uh, civic society, education and research with more and better data. Very often I get a feedback from, uh, from companies that they don't know where to look for data, for, for example, for enhancement of their business models or for innovation. Um, and they want the state that the state is, pr is providing more and better data. And they are right. But there are already, when I then mention, for example, that there are already established platforms where data is shared in their constituency. Within, in the con within the limitations of the German uh, pr information privacy. No, 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 no. It's, right. it's not about personal data. This is about, for example, weather data. This is about oh, okay. machine data. Um, this is about um, mobility data, for example, to give you a very concrete example. We have the so-called mobility data space where a company can come together, buy and sell, like for money, data, work together or apart on new data-driven business model. But the problem is, and this is something that is perhaps a bit dif difficult to understand from a liberal ministry, um, I need to really also urge the companies to get involved. It's not only the state that has to provide this, it's also the companies that they, they need to get involved. Sure. I know that there are multiple challenges. There's a lack of qualified workers, inflation, high energy prices, and now the German government is coming around the corner saying, please invest in data. So I, as a CEO, I would probably also say that uh, I need to focus on, on like one or two things here. But it's not that there is no data available in Germany. Okay. No. Th thank you very much. Uh, the you know, I th I'm sure, anyway, we, we can maybe pick up on that later. Um, Caroline, your your company serves clients around the world, right? You, I mean, we talked about talked about that at the beginning. It's just phenomenal. Where how deep SAP is ingrained in the global corporate uh, architecture. How do you you know? Many of your biggest clients are in the U.S. How do you juggle the different regulatory frameworks when it comes to technology, digital technology in particular? Uh, well, just as an example, between Europe and the United States, how do you juggle that? Right. Well, that's. A, a, I could just repeat what I said in the, to the first question. I think that is a concern, of course, with these different regulatory frameworks. But um, the the cooperation is very close. I did want to say, you know, it's not, a, it's not a national game. The technology innovation, we've talked about decoupling and de-risking, but honestly, we've, been, we've become more integrated. It's a, it's a global uh, innovation. It's a, it's a global game. And we can't manage it as one player, either in SAP or just Germany alone, without multiple partners. All the companies that are sitting up here are all partners or customers or, or both uh, uh, in, in one shape, way, one way or another. We also work with the 
SAP's um, in you know 120 markets globally. We have uh, in all of our key focus markets, and America's probably still the biggest partner and market for us. Um, but it's the same is true for uh, Singapore, or uh, who's just brought out a very advanced uh, AI governance framework. We have to sit down with these governments and participate in AI ethics advisory committees, uh, in 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 tech in tech advisory bodies. So we it's a it's a partnership model. It, you can't just see that innovation on your own. One specific question, and we could do a whole uh, panel on this, but just to, what about the this new European Artificial Intelligence Act that was just passed? Uh, that is now going to require that companies respond, start you know, telling the, the commission what they're doing exactly. This is very relevant, of course, for, for Meta and, and Microsoft as well. Um, the, is, is this something that y your company is now going to have to like, conform to, and is this, is this a big challenge? This is a moderate, has a moderate impact on SAP, and that's what I said at the outset, because we're B2B and not B2C, so for it, it has an impact on our high-risk scenarios with regard to HR processes or uh, where we, our machine learning solutions are involved. Um, it's manageable from an SAP, I'm just okay. speaking, oh, strictly from an SAP okay. perspective. Good. May I ask a question? Is it triggering innovation? Because you said it's manageable. <laughs> I mean, that is a wrong approach to regulation. It should trigger innovation. It's risk-based. It's not as invasive or burdensome as we expected it to be. And the innovation <laughs> has been happening already for 10 years. I mean, AI has been around for a long time. That should also be, we should remind ourselves, this is not some technology that just popped up with chat GPT. We've been working with machine learning uh, SAP from SAP side for, for 10 years. So the innovation is driven uh, by demand and, uh, and the, the growth of the, of the markets on the uh, IT side altogether. So... Um, <sighs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's a good thing you're not moderating that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I appreciate, I appreciate the question. Uh, I, I, you, you guys can feel free to offer questions to your colleagues here on the podium anytime. Um, I, I want to give uh, Semyon and, uh, and, and Jeremy a chance to respond to this, kind of, this question as well. Um, but while I'm doing that, I want to, I want to put a question uh, to Semyon. And it's a question that it's been around for a long time, but it's now taken on new relevance with artificial intelligence. The ability for, for state actors and individual political interests to manipulate information uh, are perhaps being amplified by artificial intelligence. I just want to ask you, how does your company balance the need for content moderation, like in an election year, for example, uh, on the one hand, with the temptation to amplify dodgy content that generates more engagement and hence revenue. How do you balance that? Maybe uh, two points. Uh, first of all, I mean, content which is not of value is not helping us at all. I mean, it's not getting traction. It's creating an environment where no advertiser would want to spend their money. So we do not have any interest in amplifying content which is uh, not valuable. Um, the second one, uh, which I've... There's still quite a bit of misinformation out there, isn't there? I mean, a lot of, like, <laughs> no? no let, let, let me uh, no? dive a bit deeper into that. So how we think about disinformation and misinformation, you might have heard about, like, the ABC model. So you can have a look as a company how we think about <coughs> disinformation is. You can look at the content someone is posting. That's the most complex thing, because, for example, in Europe, it could be illegal under the Digital Service Act. It could be violating our community standards. It could be n not violating any of the two, but could be misleading nevertheless. So that's where fact checkers, for example, coming in. But it's highly complex work, because you have to interpret the content. You have to look at the context and so on. So it, this is a challenge. That's why we deploy over 40,000 people in this regard and use AI, for example. The more interesting angles are um, behavior and actor. And let me explain that a bit, because that's also interesting for, for AI. So, while content um, is difficult, as just mentioned, we can look at like, whether an account is authentic, whether the account is communicating with other accounts and spreading content which might be misleading or disinformation. And that is something which is very neutral because you don't need to look into the content. So that's how we detect, for example, Russian-based disinformation. 
Um, and that is where AI is excellent at, at looking at these patterns of behavior between different accounts on our platforms. And that is where we are looking into, and that's the most important part where AI is actually deployed, as I just mentioned, as a shield um, against such foreign actors. May I okay. also react to Ben's question? Uh, yeah, yeah, very, 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 brief, very briefly. Uh, very brief. Go ahead. No, I, I, I really would want to, and I link it to the security-related question. I think it's a really important point. I mean, f for Europe, what worries me the most is that Europe is falling behind in terms of investing in AI. I mean, in the race, especially with authoritarian regimes around the globe, it is important also to protect our democracies to be a technology leader. And so far, if I look at the global landscape, most of the direct investments into artificial intelligence is in the US at 74%. And just last year, it dropped, I think, from 40% to 9% in the European Union. So it's decreasing. Um, France just got a boost, right? Sorry? France just got a boost in AI, I think. Yeah, anyway. Uh, but in, in, the, in, the, in the global comparison, that's uh, right, still, still minor. Not much. And let me come to the regulatory um, question. Of course, uh, the AI Act is, uh, is, from my point of view, it's not boosting innovation in Europe. And that's maybe uh, the most important thing that, of course, regulation should also look at this side should also enable companies to grow. Yes. And for us as a global technology company, the AI itself is not that much of a problem, but it's the, the regulatory landscape in Europe overall. It's so highly complex uh, with data protection rules, which in itself is also not a problem. Um, because it makes sense, of course, the GDPR, and there was good intent behind it. But the enforcement uh, of the GDPR, for example, and maybe also with the AI Act, is highly complex between these 27 member states. And that is, I think, thing, think something uh, Europe really needs to work on. OK, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear also that, that Meta is still investing heavily in content uh, you know, screening or whatever, uh, moderation to some degree, as opposed to the platform X that used to be Twitter. There's, uh, you know, there's great concern about what's happening there. So you know, not all platforms are operating in the same way. Uh, Jeremy Ronson, uh, I, I told it, you know, I said I'd bring in another aspect yeah. of your biography uh, here that, that, that is relevant. And, and I'm going to do that right now, uh, because I, in reading through your, your bio blurb, I saw that you've led uh, public policy and stakeholder, public policy campaigns, stakeholder engagements related to AI, right? So you've been out there talking to people, listening to their concerns, bringing that back in and trying to plug it into your company. Uh, not just AI, but privacy, cybersecurity. I just want to ask you, what did you learn through those experiences with stakeholders and those campaigns? That's a fair question. Um, I still wanted to address Ben's point, but I can do it with your question. <laughs> I can do it with your question. I've learned, because all of that has really yeah. happened in Europe. That, that's where I've been based in different companies. And I would say that, you know, with those tech innovation ambitions and leadership ambitions that Europe has, I, I do think if to be successful at AI, European SMEs need to hire lawyers when Californian SMEs are hiring engineers, I, I think you know who would likely win those races. And when you have to, it's early days on the AI Act. I mean, that's the honest answer. So I think it's almost too early to say what yeah. impact this is going to have. But if anyone is spending as much time as we are, you know, kind of now trying to understand, well, what do they mean by this word exactly? Or what does this word even mean? Or how would it work mm -hmm. in this practice? If you think of the attorneys that we have spending time on that, and we have a big company with a big footprint across AI, and it's different. But then you add the Data Act, you add GDPR, you add proposals in which the ink is barely dry. There's a number of proposals there. It's not a question about regulating or not, but the complexity is a question. And I think with your question about pro-innovation, it's about that complexity and how you navigate it. So to your question, when I leave Brussels, I hear a lot of excitement about these technologies. You see all kinds of startups and capitals all over Europe with this new idea of leveraging this or leveraging that or wanting to hire these people or hire those people or work with this or work with that or get bought by these guys or bought by those guys. So the you don't hear the same help. level of concern that you hear in Brussels. And I think a lot of that is, of course, when you, you know, the only tool you may have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. But at the same time, what have I learned from all of those engagements is there's a lot of excitement around these technologies. There's also a lot of risks, and that is the purpose of regulation, to mitigate it. But complexity matters. And I think sometimes simplicity is 
you can have just the strictest rule in a shorter sentence, uh, and actually is more helpful perhaps than just the <laughs> complexity that has been characteristic okay. over the past five years. Final, final statement from, uh, from Hannah, and then we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, uh, Hannah, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that you, before joining the federal ministry, you were dealing we were working with German, German industry uh, abroad, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, in China specifically. Uh, I wanted, want you to draw on your China experience and what you know about China and share with the audience here your concerns regarding China uh, moving forward in how China might deploy uh, new technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, in the, th in the sphere that you're working in now, which deals with cyber threats, et cetera. How do you see that? Do you see China perhaps all maybe playing a, a positive role? Because we're getting, we're getting some kind of really upbeat you know, assessments here of, of where, where AI is, is, is going, and, uh, you know, which is one Wonderful. We'd like to hear that. China is going to continue to be a big player. Uh, we're seeing it maybe sanctions right now in the U.S. Uh, with, with, uh, in terms of TikTok, the mm. platform. Are we seeing you know, kind of you know, efforts being made there to, to push it back? How do you see China as a player in this sphere in the, moving forward? So first of all, let me answer Ben's question. No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 I'm not <doing> <laughs> um, if it comes to China, I mean, th the biggest actor we're dealing right now and we're dealing in, in the past two years is, of course, Russia. And I, I had a colleague um, from Australia who's basically telling me, like, Russia is the hurricane and, and China, China is like climate change if it comes to disinformation and foreign interference. And I think this is true. We are all focusing right now on Russia, but one of the main actors is, of course, China. And if we think about data as being the new oil, <laughs> Um, th then th this is where, where China comes in. And I've been living for quite some time myself in China and, and all the questions and discussions we are having here in Europe and in Germany about data is, is kind of ridiculous if you, if you live there. Um, like every time you, you take a bike or uh, you pay by WeChat, you know that you know, data is there. What concerns me more um, in the field of disinformation and foreign interference if it comes to China is in comparison, especially to other actors, is what you don't see. Um, I mean, Russia is like, um, they are disturbing the information space. They put uh, pictures out of context. Um, they, may be, they make use of, of deep fakes and all of that. Um, we saw a lot as well within, uh, since the 7th of October. We saw a lot of pictures which have been put out of context. China is, is able with AI that you don't see any, so people just disappear. Um, so you don't, you don't have a chance to say, okay, this is AI generated. It's, it's just not there. So I used for industry, and I was at a presentation from Xiaomi, like the mobile phones, and, and they were so proud in order. I was living in Beijing, and, and normally if you take pictures in Beijing, the sky is cloudy <laughs> um, because of the air quality. And they were so proud in order, like, you can take a picture and you don't see that it's cloudy anymore. And, and you know, people were kind of like, wow, that's super cool. But if you think about what that means, if you can just, you know, let, let facts disappear and what that means for the reception of people, then it's really frightening. And I think we you should focus more on, on China in this regard. Another uh, panel discussion I see in the future as well. Um, so we're, we're going to open up the floor now. We only have about 10 minutes left. I know that uh, Ben has to go. Uh, he's uh, very promptly. So uh, if um, let's start picking up. I'll pick up two or three questions. Two questions. First, uh, first the gentleman here, if we can get a microphone to the gentleman uh, over there. And then you, sir, we're holding up the pen. And then uh, woo, and we'll move from there. Thank you very much. My yeah, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor. Uh, you mentioned frameworks and guardrails and the G7 and OECD, but Carolina said it's a global problem. Do you see any role for the United Nations? There will be a report from a high-level committee in July, and probably they will propose a new UN organization for AI. Makes this sense? Thank you. So first question about uh, regulation at, at UN level, and then we're going to, I'm just going to collect two questions and then we can get them to the panels. Was that for any particular uh, panelist or Caroline you mentioned? Uh, any others? Yeah? yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, sir, c can you get a microphone to the gentleman in the third row, uh, second from the middle? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not so sure if there's anybody from computer science on stage. 
But could you identify yourself, please, sir? I'm Kay Pustschi. I'm a professor uh, of business informatics. Um, is there anybody from computer science on stage? No? Um, because I liked what uh, Mr. Bachale said on transparency, but when it comes to transparency, uh, you're pretty much uh, uh, on, in the market see the definition of computer science, which means uh, transparent has to say that the user has no knowledge about where it happens, what happens, and how it happens. Um, so if we look at social networks, for instance, uh, or if we look at AI, we just uh, saw a little surprise with Google's Gemini, um, uh, nobody has the slightest idea how this black box works. Uh, that's not my understanding of is, transparency. Do you, okay, so, okay, question about... Uh, what do you think is a question? Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Within the concept of so transparency and regulation at EU level. Um, the first question, I think it was directed, we'll, we'll take... Um, yeah, perhaps uh, Wolfgang Kleinwächter is a, a long-standing member of the multi-stakeholder community when it comes to internet governance, just to put this into context. And, um, well, we have to wait for the report, but I think it's uh, you, me you mentioned one really important thing is that, um, especially when it comes to uh, freedom, uh, openness, and a democratic and strong internet, um, Political decision makers are highly dependent on the multi-stakeholder community. Um, th this is why we, as Ministry of uh, for Digital and Transport, are investing heavily in the IGFD, um, where we try to help to put this on track again. This is also uh, why we support uh, the the IGF in general. This is also um, why we um, support European formats in this way. Um, we have against a very challenging background when it comes to the budget. Um, jointly achieved that we have a bit more money for the international community, especially for multi-stakeholders. So to put the, yeah. UN. Yeah, so the UN. I I, we have to await for we have to await for the uh, the, uh, the the um, the document, the report. Um, but I can tell you something. I'm not the biggest fan of parallel structures, and there are established formats for the multi-stakeholders, especially with regard to uh, the internet governance, and we should put our focus on strengthening the existing ones. So a risk of lack of harmonization when it comes to dealing with uh, a regulatory environment. Okay, the second question uh, concerned the issue of transparency. Uh, anyone wish to address that? Yes, go ahead. You know, I think it comes up a lot, you know, and it's come up across a number of these policy files, in fact. I think the transparency that he was mentioning earlier is more when you interact with an AI-generated piece of content. And that's a different type of problem than transparency around models and all of the different ways they were trained and the like. I think it is important to recognize some of the limits there. Like, I don't have transparency in the way an airline is developed, but I have trust in the airline when I step on board that it's been vetted by the right experts with the right standards, with the right scrutiny <laughs> bodies. Recently. So I do think it comes up a lot, but there's different contexts for the transparency, and I think his comment was more about AI-generated images and videos and the like, I think. Yes, yeah. it, yes, it was, definitely, but I would still argue that transparency is a very high value also when it comes to AI models, although the black box will always remain to a certain degree. I think, um, for example, when it comes to the question what uh, data was the AI trained sure. this is a very important question to ask, and I think there needs to at least to be a certain chance on transparency, at least if we have some problems with the AI, for example, if we have a bias. And also the documentation on the bias needs to, to be transparent to a certain degree. Um, and, and I need to take the opportunity to, to one, because Meta did uh, us a favor on transparency in algorithm, although it was a very bad idea what they did arguing that they are downgrading or taking out political content on the on, on their on the on the feeds um, and I think this is very important to know if I interact not only with an AI generated image but also if I interact with the platform because I need to know to a certain degree why a platform is pushing something and why it's not pushing something. And in the end, this is also a matter of power balance, because I, as an individual, I, as a politician, I might have access to a certain knowledge and to a certain capacity, my team, and maybe also state capacity, which 
is not as much as other companies have or as other database driven um, institutions have, but it's still more than individuals have. What do we all need to understand on what playing field we are doing our discussions? And Great. therefore, the, the idea of transparency, I think, um, comes in, in handy on, on, on many, many, many perspectives. Samuel, give it, please respond. Yeah, just to add on that, I mean, uh, transparency is of course key and to, to praise some uh, German regulation, I mean, the German Intermedia State Act, uh, Medienstaatsvertrag, a very German acronym, um, that actually tackled a couple of years ago exactly that, demanding transparency on how algorithms and social media work. And I mean, that is something we voluntarily implemented, for example, because it is a good idea to have this transparency to a certain degree. As, as Jeremy said, it of course needs to be reasonable and understandable, understandable for the user um, and shouldn't be too complex. And that's always a difficult balance to strike, but the general idea is absolutely right. Maybe one more question and then we're going to have to wrap it up because I know Ben has to catch a plane. Uh, sir, back in, yep, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, my name is David Schmanko, working for TÜV Nord, and I want to pick on something uh, Semyon said earlier about GDPR implementation uh, that, in his opinion, doesn't work, and maybe a question to all the private sector representatives, whoever feels <laughs> they want to answer, uh, is if we now have the AI Act being, being implemented, and what would maybe your, be your wishes towards the representatives of, uh, of politics uh, what could be made? What should be made dif or done different in implementation in regards to like oversight? That we don't have this many like implementation issues that GDPR posed. B big topic, kind of opening up here in our last two minutes. Um, uh, but would anyone Sorry. care to make a very quick uh, statement about that? Yeah, I, I can quickly. make that. I mean, as I said, for me, it's not about like one single law. Uh, GDPR is just an example of where uh, the enforcement is very different from France. And within Germany, I mean, we have 18 DPAs, data protection authorities. Even within the States, it's very different from time to time and how they enforce the GDPR. And the reality, and not just GDPR, many other laws uh, in the European Union have the same development. So it is very often not possible to scale as a startup in Berlin to, for example, Lisbon. And that is a problem in the digital single market. So there's a lot to do in this regard. Uh, and as I said, it's not about the GDPR itself. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, um, uh, the regulation, but it needs to be really fully harmonized in the European Union, also when it comes to enforcement. Thank you very much. Uh, a warm round of applause for all of our speakers. We're gonna have to wrap it up here. I know Ben's got to catch a plane. I, th I think we've learned a lot today about the risks and opportunities and the challenges that we're all facing moving forward, dealing with new technology and particularly with artificial intelligence. Thank you very much to all of you and thank you also to the Aspen Institute for hosting this important session. Thank you. Vielen Dank und bis bald. For this. Thank you so much for this very engaging discussion. Um, and thank you so much, Terry, for the wonderful moderation. Um, that wasn't so easy up there. So um, hoot up for the great moderation. We are changing uh, the scenery um, because we have another one on two or two on one um, coming up. And um, it is my great pleasure um, now to get up to the stage um, a good friend, uh, co-author, and partner in crime, Claudia Schmucker, come up, uh, come up and join me and give her a big applause. <laughs> 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 
So, Claudia, you work for the German Council on Foreign Relations, right? Mm -hmm. Where you are the head of the geoeconomics and geopolitics uh, department. Yeah. Um, and you are still one of the few people standing um, and being a supporter of the World Trade Organization. Yes, together with the youth storm. <laughs> <laughs> um, why is that so? Um, because I believe in a rules-based global trading system. I mean, Germany is an, a country that's very much integrated into the world economy, and we very much rely on transparent and global rules, and the World Trade Organization is the organization that presents these rules for us. Well, so well said. And with this, I hand <laughs> over the panel discussion and our panelists <laughs> to you, and I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about where the WTO stands. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. Audio. Um, I welcome to the stage Peter Peterson, Head of Trade Monitoring Section of the World Trade Organization, and Clarissa schulze Bar, Head of Unit EU WTO Trade Policy at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. So a round of applause for my two excellent <laughs> panelists who can actually uh, answer Stormy's question much better than I can. I was a bit... Uh, anxious about her question, but I think you two are excellently here um, to answer the question. So the future of the world trading system. Um, as Stormy said, um, it's an important topic, but it definitely is a topic that's also very divisive. Um, we did have the ministerial conference, the 13th ministerial conference, MC13, last month in Abu Dhabi, and the feedback about the outcome of the conference was very critical. So I, I want to just just point to a couple of outcomes, and I start with the positive side, because I hope that we find a lot of common ground on why the WTO is still re relevant. So, the WTO added two member states, um, the Comoros and Tumor Lest, uh, which proves that the organization is still relevant. We did not have a single country that left the WTO, and I hope it stays like that, but we have two more countries. So we have a global organization with 166 member states. WTO member states agreed to extend the e-commerce moratorium, which is very important um, for European and German business. And WTO members agreed um, to adopt new rules to facilitate trade and services through the plurilateral agreement on services domestic regulation. So I think these three points are very important and should not be underestimated. Unfortunately, the negative side of things is a bit longer. So no agreement on the dispute settlement reform, which is expected to be, or where member states agreed to have that in 2024. We did not agree on a work program on agriculture. Member states could not agree on a second wave of the fisheries agreement. And these are just the three main points that I want to mention. And the problem is we have the rule of consensus. So if one country is not willing to cooperate or to agree of these agreements, uh, we will not have these agreements. And I think this happened a lot in Abu Dhabi. So the question is, where's the WTO heading? Um, we do have about 15 maybe a bit more minutes to answer this question. I don't think it should be a problem for you. And then I would like to have about 10 minutes, probably a bit less, um, from questions from the audience. So feel free to think about really critical questions because we have these excellent panelists who can answer all of them. So I have three rounds of questions and each panelist only gets two to three minutes, unfortunately, to answer them. And I would like to start the first round um, to focus on MC13 and after. And Peter, I would like to start with you. Um, what are the lessons that we learned from MC13? And as I said, it was a bit disappointing in the outcome. Do you think member states will now increasingly um, implement measures that are no longer WTO compatible because MC13 did not have the positive outcome that we expected? You have two minutes, unfortunately. <laughs> That's a big challenge. <laughs> now, I think, so there's no, no two bones about this. Uh, the, the outcome of the ministerial was, was a big disappointment. Uh, we didn't have any substantial outcomes on, on what you mentioned, agriculture. We didn't have anything on environment. The, even the e-commerce moratorium, let's be honest, uh, it's not that fantastic of an outcome. Um, I work for the WHO, so I have to look at this as, as a glass half full. And there are many things that we have to reflect upon in the aftermath of the MC uh, in Abu Dhabi. I think that overall it has something to do with what is the role of ministerial conferences, bringing 
ministers together for four days to try and, and hammer out agreements that perhaps should have been, could have been better prepared back back in, in Geneva. Um, there is a lot to be said about the connect between the Geneva process and also capitals in terms of, of development of, of, of policies. Um, and we have to also, uh, again, take into account that we're dealing with an organization of 164, soon to be 166 members, with vastly different priorities. Um, those are things that make these meetings incredibly difficult. Now, from my point of view, uh, and from seeing the operation of the WHO on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's encouraging, still encouraging, that uh, members are not uh, putting WTO rules aside. They still implement WTO rules, they follow them. When they put in place their policies, they, they, they look to see if they're combat compatible with the WTO rules. We saw this in the context of the global financial crisis, we've seen it in the context of COVID, and we've seen it also in the context of the war in Ukraine. Members may implement policies that are slightly uh, debatable initially, but subsequently they generally put them into a format that's compatible with WTO rules. That's a positive thing. I think it's also positive to, to note that, that despite many issues being raised now in the WTO or used by members in, in the implementation of trade policies, such as national security, overall uh, WTO rules remain a guiding light for, for members. That's hopeful. Yes. And maybe it wasn't expected. Uh, Clarissa, you were also in Abu Dhabi. Um, what are the next steps that need to be taken now? And do you also have a positive view? Do you see a landing zone for some reform of the dispute settlement body or the fisheries agreement? Well, uh, thank you. That's uh, an excellent question and a difficult one to answer. And I, I have to um, admit that I share both of your assessments on um, the outcome of MC13. So to us uh, and to me, uh, we see an organization which has not regressed, but it's stagnating, certainly stagnating. And it is true, we need to think uh, very hard on how to move this organization forward and to keep it relevant. And therefore, um, it is not easy to uh, map the next steps, I think uh, Peter has already pointed to some general problems. There's a disconnect between the Geneva discussions and the capitals. There's a lot of pressure on the ministerial conferences. Often they are overwhelmed with open issues that are not resolved in negotiations in Geneva. So, and then um, you already alluded to uh, the consensus principle. Members are in a position to block any outcome they wish. And so uh, with a view to that, uh, MC13 was really disappointing for us and um, a, a mere stagnation. Now on, on the question of dispute settlement, I have to say it is very difficult to imagine how we can keep to the timetable of solving this problem in 2024. As, as you might know, there's a deadline set by MC12 to uh, come to a fully functioning and well-functioning dispute settlement by the end of this year. And even though there has been quite some progress in informal discussions in Geneva, uh, we have not uh, really dived into the, the core question, the appellate body itself and how it will function and how it will be shaped. And this is a very important question and I'm a bit skeptical if we can solve this without a political steer and without a ministerial conference ahead of us and in an election year in the US. So um, to us right now, we are thinking about bridging arrangements. How can we ensure that members don't appeal into the void? We could uh, envision, for example, uh, a best endeavor clause to not appeal into the void. Uh, we look at the MPIA, the multi-party interim agreement on arbitration, and look if we can maybe expand it to new members. Uh, the MPIA, MPIA now has, uh, I think, about 50-something members. And uh, if we uh, are not able to solve dispute settlement 
till the end of the year, we expect that maybe more members will join. Uh, that would be a good sign. And apart from that, we really um, yeah, have to look at the Geneva process. The facilitator for dispute settlement is unfortunately no longer present there. We need to find somebody new and need to really work on the open questions. Yeah, that will be the main uh, take uh, from my side and, and it's the key priority for Germany to get this system working again because I think without the dispute settlement system uh, we don't need to talk so much about new rules for the WTO. We need to, to get this uh, sorted out uh, first. Thank you. Um, the second round of question is maybe a bit shorter because the third one should be the most difficult to answer. So the second one is the way forward. And um, as we said, the consensus principle is a problem, but we do have these kind of coalitions of the willing, the plurilateral agreements. And so, Peter, how do you see what, what how can be the role of ne uh, plurilateral negotiations to evolve within the WTO framework and how might these negotiations uh, strengthen the multilateral trading system? I think, I think one of the things we have to be very clear about, I think, certainly from watching the process over a number of years, is that the whole idea of big rounds and, and trade-offs within a larger uh, scope of, of issues, I think that's a thing of the past. So we have to figure out um, different ways to move forward. Um, in the WTO, over the years, what has been required for progress has been leadership, political leadership by the big traders in particular. And unfortunately, that's not there at this point. Um, so I think that on specific issues, uh, we're seeing a number of countries come together to try and start discussions uh, on issues that would it will be difficult to move forward within sort of a more formal framework at the WTO. And that includes uh, investment facilitation for development, uh, it includes e-commerce, uh, it includes uh, discussions on, on, on mis, -mis uh, enterprises, um, and it also um, included domestic regulation, of course. Um, these joint initiatives uh, have a role to play. I'm convinced I'm a multilateralist. I think that the most important thing would be to move things forward multilaterally. But we also have to be realistic. The, the, the reason for putting or for, for, um, uh, for doing plurilaterals is, of course, to avoid hostage taking. And if we don't know what that means, then you just look at ministerial conferences in the past. So I think from, from our perspective, it's getting clearer and clearer that plurilaterals somehow will start playing a larger role in the system. We have to figure out a way whether these are uh, placed in what's called Annex 4, which requires uh, uh, really a consensus for that to be, to be taken forward, or whether these can somehow uh, evolve differently. But there's no doubt in my mind that they will uh, play a role in the future. I think those who oppose these uh, plurilateral initiatives will also have to make up their mind at some point about whether they will continue to oppose them and see these uh, agreements, potential agreements, uh, happen outside. Look, it's no, it's, no, uh, it's no coincidence that we have 365 uh, regional trade agreements that are notified to the WTO uh, and that we have 50 more that haven't been notified. Countries are doing these things. They're faster maybe among more like-minded countries, and they're perhaps more efficient in dealing with issues that the WTO has not been able to deal with. So there will clearly be a discussion about how these can move forward. Thank you. Clarissa, what's the view of the German government towards plurilateral negotiations? And um, Peter already mentioned some that are negotiated. Do you see additional topics where a plurilateral negotiation could advance reform? Yeah, I think uh, more or less the same analysis uh, as, as Peter has already <laughs> put forward. Um, plurilaterals are, are there to stay and they are very important initiatives and they can reinvigorate uh, topics at the WTO that cannot be moved forward uh, in a multilateral fora. So um, to us, it's the way forward currently. It's not the best solution, but it's the only solution to avoid uh, a complete deadlock 
at the WTO. And uh, we have uh, been very strong supporters for especially um, the plurilateral initiative on e-commerce. And we have also been strong supporters on, of the IFD initiative, so investment facilitation for development. And um, we see a great traction of these um, processes. Uh, with IFD, we now have 120 countries joining. It's a big group. There was almost, uh, it was almost on the agenda of uh, MC13 to be integrated in the WTO rulebook, but it got uh, dropped from the agenda. Now we have to look if we can um, install and insert uh, this agreement into the rulebook. This requires um, consensus. And um, we, we are hopeful and we hear that resistance might be reduced a little bit uh, and that there might be some room for maneuver to come uh, to an agreement to integrate IFD. Um, you, you asked about additional topics. I mean, one of the key um, elements that we wanted to achieve at MC13 was to have a work program on industrial subsidies and to really look at the rule book and the gaps in the rule book and to start a process um, deliberating on this important issue because it's, it's a key issue for global trade. And it was unfortunately not possible to agree on a work program in this field at MC13, uh, but it continues to be a topic that we want to push forward. And so this is an area where we would like to see plurilateral uh, engagement. And there are, of course, others uh, that are already ongoing, especially in the environmental field. We have uh, plastic pollution, we have the TESTI, uh, we have fossil fuel subsidies. These are all important um, initiatives that we, we hold dear in support. Thank you. So now we have the third round of questions, and I hope that I can take two questions afterwards from the audience. So now we come to the systemic challenges. I think that's the most difficult part. Um, so, Peter, what measures do you think should be um, taken to ensure that the WTO remains a relevant forum in face of evolving global trade dynamics, including the rise of protectionist policies and the proliferation of subsidies? This is what you mentioned also in the area of, of green transition. Well, I think there, there are two, perhaps two, two answers to that. First of all, I think that our DG is right when, when she says that we need to, as an organization, start you know, to responding to the issues that people care about. Um, uh, pe people care about the environment. Um, there's a lot of these issues that have to be addressed in a multilateral set setting. Environment, climate change, subsidies is another one. Uh, fish is, is another one again. We have to address these issues. These issues also include, uh, you know, looking at how our system uh, responds to the demands or the, the challenges faced by, by small and medium-sized enterprises. We need to be more sensitive to hold the whole trade and gender uh, issue and, 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 and paying more attention to this. We have to, as an organization, to stay relevant, to be seen, to do something for the thing, for the, on the issues that people care about. Um, I want to just say one thing is that, so on, in our trade monitoring exercise, which is a, the only cross-cutting sort of systemic transparency exercise in the WTO, we have done that since the, the global financial crisis. And we don't see any generalized protectionist revival. We don't see it. We see bits and pieces here and there. We see localized tensions that result in, 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 in protectionist policies, no doubt. But we don't see a blanket revival of protectionism. What I do think we need to, to be very clear about is that what we have seen over the last, I would say maybe especially the last eight years, is a, a surge in, in subsidies, industrial subsidies, agricultural subsidies, environmental subsidies, and those are all very important to discuss, and we need a conversation about that. I think that in, Do in, in Abu Dhabi there were some discussions about that. A conversation is needed on that. Once we have that conversation, and when, once people are ready to have that conversation, 
then perhaps we can decide whether this is something that should be negotiated. Thank you. So now we come to the second systemic challenge, that's China. So the question is, how do we keep large players, uh, also like the United States, but also others, engaged in the WTO? And this means, how do we address the systemic challenges with regard to China? Two minutes to answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's an easy one, <laughs> I must admit. No, I think, um, you know, we could pose the opposite question, how to do it without the WTO. I mean, China is a true challenge. And as I mentioned, industrial subsidies is one area where we see gaps in the rule book, we, where there are no rules that really capture non-market economies' mm. behavior. And that is uh, very painful, but I think it's worth working on those gaps and engaging on them and keeping countries that are members to the WTO accountable use the system, use the tools, use dispute settlement. I mean, there have been a lot of cases, successful cases against China by the US, by the EU. Sometimes uh, they work together and these are uh, pathways that are okay. It takes time. It is painful. There's a lot of evidence needed. It's hard work, but I think it's, it's reasonable and it's reasonable to stick to the rules ourselves the US and the EU, and to avoid uh, getting into a purely power-based global system. This will be not manageable to neither of us. And uh, to leave the WTO to China would be, I think, the biggest mistake we can do. So uh, my, my answer would be we, we have to fight the fight. We have to stick in there and, and remain engaged. Thank no you, way sir. out. Thank you. So I would have two questions, one from each side. So we have this gentleman over there and this gentleman over there. So do we have a female uh, speaker who, who, a question, who might pose a question? <laughs> I uh, well, probably stormy. I add stormy to the. As we know, <laughs> I'm beginning, so really yes. brief. I'm sorry, we hardly have time. As we know, we have different kinds of trade agreements. Some days ago, with great interest, but not in Germany, I read about a wonderful trade agreement between Switzerland and India. And my question is very short. How do you evaluate? Is this a trend more to bilateral or back to multilateral agreements? OK, Switzerland signed also for Norwegia, Liechtenstein, EFTA memberships. And what's your personal opinion about this fashionable agreement? What was not mentioned in Germany? Thank you. Thank you so much. And the gentleman over there. Um, thank you for the great discussion. Um, I'm Nicholas Lamb from Queen's University. I want to dig down a bit deeper on the US-China uh, question, the systemic challenge, because, um, uh, Peter, you said um, members mostly still pay attention to WTO rules. That's certainly true, but it's not true in the US-China relationship, right, which is essentially happening outside of an abrogation of WTO rules. And, of course, I know it's very sensitive for a WTO official to say, point that out, but I'm just wondering, how, how, do, you think about, um, uh, how do you think about how do you deal with that in your, in your daily work, the fact that this massive trade relationship is actually happening in abrogation of WTO rules. And then to, 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 to Clarissa, um, similarly on that, as much as we could imagine like a restored WTO dispute settlement system, the thing that makes it kind of imagine uh, impossible is, again, the US-China relationship. Because how would the US agree to bind a dispute settlement with China, given that the state of the trade relationship uh, and, and, again, the, the massive tariffs that are in place? And so my question to you is, is uh, don't you think it makes more sense to think about models of dispute settlement that maybe structured around the MPAA that would exempt somehow the US-China relationship from binding dispute settlement and making that a way to bring the US back on board? This is an easy question. Stormy, would you like to add one brief question? No, okay. So on the road to MC14, I will add a question. What's the one step that we need to take until then to make it successful? Peter, I start with you. 
for, for to make the M M C14 successful. successful. Just to add that to the list, but you only have um, I, one minute. Okay, well, that, <laughs> <laughs> then I'll pass on that one. Okay. Um, I, let me just uh, perhaps answer the gentleman's question first. I, I think on the, on the Switzerland-India agreement, I think it's symptomatic of the the sort of trade. Uh, developments we're seeing right now. I think that there are many countries that are deciding to negotiate bilaterally because they're able to define the terms and the areas where they want to, to negotiate uh, and are able to do so fairly quickly. Um, we don't necessarily see that as a, as a problem. We have a, a long-established uh, uh, committee that deals with these agreements that are notified normally to the WTO to ensure that there is a level of transparency surrounding these agreements that that, uh, that is acceptable and, that's, and, that, and that helps others understand what these agreements are about. With respect to the US-China relationship, what we specifically see in the case of trade monitoring is of course that uh, whenever something happens, and this goes back in particularly to 2017, 2018, when, when the trade war was, or the, the trade tensions escalated between them, what we saw instantly in trade monitoring was a, a, a massive jump in terms of the trade covered by, by uh, restrictive measures put in place by, by both economies. Um, what that then subsequently leads to is that we will then see, and, and in that I should say, and many of those measures, of course, have stayed on. There is a tendency for, for economies that once they put in restrictive measures, that sometimes or very often they stay. And so what we've seen also, and this is referring to my daily job, is we see that the stockpile of, of, of trade restrictions in place continues to grow. And that's obviously a worry. Um, so that's that's my answer to that. Thank you so much, Clarissa. <laughs> so quickly on the on the China U.S. question, that's of course a very tricky one. I think uh, that that the approach uh, should be, uh, you know, go to dispute settlement. But there are of course uh, a lot of ways to really settle outside um, the dispute settlement system itself uh, via transactional approaches via arbitration and there's already a lot of flexibility within the system and I think uh, it might be true that big players would you know agree their disputes outside of uh, the fora of a panel I can understand that and see that and MPIA might be one option but the US is unfortunately not on board for that so um, China is uh, and we'll, we'll have to see uh, how, how this difficult relationship is, is moving ahead. But uh, no clear answer, sorry, on that one. Mm -hmm. And MC14, <laughs> that's, my, that as well. that's my favorite one. I will skip it. Yes. I just cross my fingers. I and, asked uh, you afterwards. <laughs> so uh, we had the panel on WTO and MC13. And I think whenever someone hears WTO, it's either they roll their eyes or they say it's doom and gloom and nothing worked out. But I'm very glad. Um, that uh, we have two speakers who both pointed out to positive things that are also uh, working. So Peter said we have no increase in WTO incompatible measures when you look at the trade policy review. And you also mentioned progress through plurilateral agreements, even though there might be some deadlock on the multilateral level. So I think this is an excellent uh, feedback that we get from both of you. So I thank both of the speakers. I thank you for the excellent questions and um, I hope we can continue the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to join us inside, I know that it's always very enticing to stay out there um, and continue with your uh, discussions, but I promise you we'll have ample of opportunity for this uh, tomorrow as well. Um, and um, now we, con we are continuing with another highlight. So welcome back um, to our participants here on the ground, as well as to our participants um, who joined us uh, virtually. So this is always the part which makes me really excited, but also a little scared if everything is going, <laughs> going to work out as it should be. Um, is the technology going to work? Is the moderator there and prepared? Are the panelists there? And do they know what they are going to argue and in which 
team they are, or did they make last minute changes? Um, and um, are all the panelists there? Unfortunately, one can't join us today. So we have a very last minute um, addition, who is our very, very own Molly Hall, um, who is also the mastermind behind the whole conference and put it all together. So I think before I hand over to you, I need to give Molly an extra applause because doing the logistics, the preparation, the speaker, and everything, and then jumping onto the panel and here as well and argue, that is an extra applause for just her. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, this morning when we, um, when we learned that one of our panelists can't come, and Molly said, well, if I had a little bit more time to prepare, and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah you're going to do it. <laughs> so, Catherine, why don't you join us, or why don't you join me um, up here? So, let me introduce our moderator of the night, uh, Catherine uh, kluger um, Eschbrook, um, and um, you are a true transatlanticist, um, not just in your opinion and in your beliefs and in what you work for, um, but also in where you come from. In my DNA. Yeah. In your yeah. DNA. DNA. Um, so tell us a little bit about this. Oh, my DNA is half <laughs> American and half German. It's not really a huge surprise, but I was born in this country, but in an American military hospital. So it's even, even a little strange than that. Yeah, yeah. And where does the Kluver come from and where does the oh, Eschburg come oh, from? Oh, now that's my husband. That was the easiest part of the whole equation, finding him. Um, <laughs> no, the Kluver is my very northern German father because my, my parents met, this is a funny story for all of you linguists out there, because my mother had a DAD fellowship, this is how lives get made, uh, to come to Hamburg to study the uvular R the sound in the German language. <laughs> now, if you needed a worthwhile research project, surely that one is, that one is it. <laughs> she changed that the minute she got here. Mm. And then you lived for, for quite a long time in the US. You were in Harvard. You looked at diplomacy. Yes, so I come to a lot of this work uh, because for 12 years, almost 12 years, I ran at the Harvard Kennedy School, created a program on the future of diplomacy, which was in part to look at how statecraft needs to change in the 21st century. First of all, what is statecraft for the 21st century? And a lot of that had to do with how technology changes the way in which we receive information and the way that we negotiate with different sets of information and who negotiates for us when and how on the basis of what kind of information, and technology plays a huge role in that equation. And you also worked for a city and had a pretty cool boss. I did have a very <laughs> cool boss. Michael Bloomberg, everywhere he goes, so I worked for New York City, Michael Bloomberg, everywhere he goes, and I have to laugh every time I go to the Bloomberg uh, headquarters right at the Parisa Platz. Uh, not only is he a cool guy, uh, for all of you who have been to City Lab and other places, um, but they always make sure they have the best snack bar in your imagination. And that's true even at the tiny Bloomberg office here in Berlin. They have the best snacks. If you ever get invited to be an interview guest there, come with on an empty stomach. What's your, what's your favorite snack? Ooh, it's got to be the red vine twists, because mm, you can't mm. get those in this country. Mm. Mm. Last question to you before I hand over. You're writing a book, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, I continue to, you know, in juggling a lot of different other things, but yes. And so, the topic? Well, the topic is always uh, the way that, well, because I'm so interested in changing actors in the international scene, and it's about how states and cities uh, are finding new ways of power uh, in a changing world, and uh, I really think that when we're discussing the intersection of democracy, technology, and sort of humankind and human society, truly it's in that interaction, and in my mind that locus is in the urban realm. And I can't wait to read it. And well, with this, Gotta get finished. <laughs> yeah, well, with this I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, right. Have fun and enjoy. I really appreciate that, Stormy, and it's so true. Every time you come to an Aspen event, you know that it's teamwork, 
uh, that makes the dream work. So also on my, from my side, thanks to Emma and Molly and this entire incredible team, Katya and others who I've worked with for so many years. It's really a joy and you really keep this machine running. And to our audience at home, because I was at home watching this entire conference. So now I know, as I said to Stormy, that Terry Martin is buying controlling stock and SAP. Um, you know, those are the kind of things you can learn even when you're at home. So even if you're out there in the hybrid format, you're no lesser of an audience member and in this discussion. And here, fundamentally tonight, you will get to vote because this is a discussion about promise versus peril. So the idea whether, and this is, these are the questions you have been debating all day and you have an opinion in your own mind, but what we're gonna try to do this afternoon and the early part of this evening is potentially change your mind or give you a nuanced, granular opinion of how you might think about how technology is going to change our every lives. And the good news is I don't have to do any of this alone. In fact, I am a glorified timekeeper up here because what we're gonna do is an Oxford-style debate. And any, any Oxford alums in the audience? Yes, any, any debaters? Okay, so we have a, pri now the only difference to a regular Oxford style debate is these are new teams. They did not meet at Oxford, they did not eat at the Union, they are not already sworn uh, teams. They have found themselves over the last couple of days and weeks uh, and they are putting their, you know, their, their pedal to the metal, as you will, for this discussion. So if my teams could come up and join me and I will introduce them to you as they come on up. Okay, so as I said, we're discussing, oh, yes. Well, let's have the pro side over here and the con side over here, if you can remember what side you're on. Haha, -ha, see? Right, so the advances in technology, can they propel our societies toward the better? Can they create greater equity and access to, in, in terms of democratic uh, access, in terms of democratic equity, and change the way in which we form our political choices? Or possible peril, are we, should we, must we control developments in technology and the impact on our lives because they will curtail our capacity to compromise, to interact, to be human with one another? And if so, how do we do it? Regulation, import controls, breaks in technology value chain through better education, you're gonna hear it all tonight. Uh, and I wanna just go through my teams. They will in Oxford style. Um, we'll have you vote on the questions they're debating first. So get your Slido apps out now. You've been working this all day. <laughs> and you can also do this from home, I am told. Uh, and we'll read the questions to you in just a moment. As I introduce the teams, you can get to voting. Uh, I have on the right side here my pro team. The pro team thinks, believes, as the fundamental unifying thought that new techno technologies, AI, quantum, and many of you will have watched a delightful press conference from San Jose, California yesterday with the CEO of NVIDIA who thought that beyond the metaverse, we will get to a place in which through AI we just say the word and it appears in 3D and we will see the images before we manufacture them and just think of how beautiful or not that world might be. So my pro team here will argue new technologies have great potential and will enhance open, just, and democratic societies. So that's question number one on your Slido, question number one. You can start getting to voting as I introduce these folks. Question number two, other side, our con team. New technologies such as AI and quantum computing and biotechnology and anything else pose a risk to open just democratic societies and could easily undermine them. So you can get to voting and I will let you know who is with us today. So on the pro side, and this is the order in which they will go, so don't be surprised with how I introduce them, is Lorenz Lehmhaus. He is associate partner at IBM Consulting. Lorenz, say hello. Uh, Anna Chunitsi, she's the CEO and founder of Adalan AI. Hello, Anna. Carolina Lindekamp is project lead of No Fake Corrective, Corrective uh, and does is part of a journalistic um, sort of new format conglomeration and does research on society and technology. Colony is all the way on the outside. And then Yuri Schnöller, Schnöller co-founder, managing director, Cosmonaut and Kings, of course, a uh, often seen face in Berlin circles. 
So on team two, we have Mauritius Dahn. He's a senior digital policy and educational manager at ISD Germany, uh, an increasingly known face to those of us who follow these debates on TV. Alexandre Gomez, all the way to the outside, research fellow at the Klingdale Institute. Doug Kreiner, who is the Clinton Rossiter Professor in American Institutions in the Department of Government at Cornell University, so come a long way to be with us. And then last but not least, the star of our debate, because Molly literally um, found out that she was joining this debate about, you know, 32 minutes ago, <laughs> the program officer of the digital team of the Aspen Institute, Germany. So we have a very tightly scheduled uh, debate. We're going to do it classic style, which is to say we have 16 minutes to open this conversation. And as we do, and by the way, their bios are extremely impressive, so please continue to read as you listen to what they say, what forms their opinions. I'm not reading them out for expedience of time. Um, we will go team by team. We will time and uh, we'll call time. But I need to first give you five minutes of full voting time. So if you voted already, wonderful. Um, and I will filibuster a little bit for the next eh, about four minutes as, as you continue to vote. And we'll close voting as we move into this. So how we're going to do this is the pro, time, pro team will move through all of their opinions. At first, I thought we were going to ping pong just to confuse you entirely, but we're not going to do that. The pro team will go in their entirety, and then the con team will go. Yes, teams, <clears throat> good, right? So Father still look, look at how diplomatic this is and how, how happy they are with one another. And this will, this will last for another 16 minutes, and then they will be throwing darts at one another. So as you make your final choices, I'll remind you of the questions. The pro question is, uh, new technologies such as AI, quantum, we could go down the list, you've heard them all today, have a great potential and will enhance open, just, and democratic societies. Team two, and you need to vote, new technologies such as AI and quantum computing pose a risk to open, just, democratic societies and could easily undermine them, okay? So you know about another two minutes to do that. And as we do that, let me just run quickly through um, what brings these people here today. So Lorenz Limhaus, as I mentioned, is an associate partner in the IBM, or is at IBM Consulting, but has had sort of an in, inside out perspective. He previously worked at the defense industry and in signals intelligence, electronic warfare, was a reservist in the German armed forces where he led innovation projects and unmanned systems, and then joined everyone's favorite German pet project in this space, Aleph Alpha, where he spent three years as, as head of communications. So welcome, Lawrence. Anna, as I mentioned, she's the founder and CEO of Adlan AI, building end-to-end -end solutions for AI governance, and is the founder of the nonprofit organization AI Governance International, and a founding editorial board member of Springer Nature's AI and Ethics Journal. So she thinks about it similarly to Carolina, also from sort of a journalistic angle and investigative angle in terms of what could this mean going forward. As I noted, Carolina is the project lead at No, Fa no Fake at Correctif. It's an interdisciplinary endeavor that focuses on looking at innovative strategies to counter disinformation. She has a really interesting team there, scholars, developers, journalists, bringing, and this is a new word for me as an old hand journalist uh, with a former dial-up connection, methodologies from pre-bunking and debunking. So before and after um, sort of disinformation gets constructed, leveraging civic tech to tackle the challenges posed by misinformation. And finally, Yuri, uh, as I noted, managing director of Cosmonauts and Kings, held positions in the campaigns of now get this, Chancellor Merkel, President Obama, you'll realize there was a little bit of overlap there. He'll tell us what, whether or not that overlapped. And EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. And in 2021, published the Public Arena Playbook, a hands-on, first-of-its-kind publication on political communication in the digital age. So that is your team pro. You have exactly 35 seconds to continue voting. And I'll continue with our con team. So Mauritius is the Senior Digital Policy and Education Manager at ISD, which many of you know well, coordinates the digital policy recommendations and leads Project AHEAD, <clears throat> an independent information dialogue series aimed at policymakers uh, and academia and civil society. And he taught 
because we talked about education, as an educator in the Business Council for Democracy on hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy narratives. Maybe not a huge surprise, he's on the cotton team. <laughs> Alexandra, uh, all the way to my far, far left, is a researcher at the Klingdale Institute, focuses on geopolitics of technology, digitalization. As I mentioned, do we have a split in the tech space? Will we have a split in the tech stack? Those are the kind of things that Alexandre looks at. His research revolves around the intersection of mutual influence between geopolitics and technology. Douglas, right next to him, as I noted, the Clinton Rossiter Professor in American Institutions uh, at Cornell. His teaching and research focuses, of course, on the American political institutions, deeply plagued. We have a really interesting lawsuit in front of the Supreme Court right now <clears throat> on disinformation, whether or not that should be part of the full political gambit, and I'm sure he'll talk about that and uh, has written a number of books, his most recent, The Myth of the Imperial President, How Public Opinion Checks the Unilateral Executive. Great, that, I really look forward to reading that in this particular year. And then finally, last but not least, Molly, our program officer in the digital team at Aspen, where she manages a lot of programs, including this incredible conference with an emphasis on AI regulation, cybersecurity, and digitalization but she comes at it with a long perspective on public affairs, consulting, communications for everyone in Washington, including the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, State Department, and Pfizer. Okay, boom, you're done. Voted, yes, good? Fabulous, we exactly hit the clock. Well, I'm so happy with this. All right, so let's go ahead and see the results. Can I see them here? I hope you can see them. <laughs> I, it's do -ba -do -ba -do -do. Oh, sorry. All good. Yeah. Ah, so. maybe. Ah, yes. so There we go. I just need the results. Oh, no. No. No, doch nicht. <laughs> God, also behind me. Oh, even better. Oh, fabulous. Oh, look at all these techno optimists. Okay, Team One, you have a very easy no, no, no. job. <laughs> no, no, oh, is it the other way around? Yeah. Oh, see, it would help if I didn't have this enormously strong shoulder. Mm. All right. Okay. Good. Well, sorry. Sorry, Team One. Okay, we've got it. Oh, I, all, all hype and no result. Okay, well, the thing is you have 35 minutes to change everybody's opinion. That's the good news, right? Okay, so let's get right to it. Lawrence goes first. Each of our panelists get two minutes. So that's why I said I'm turning into a glorified timekeeper here. So if you see me making faces, and we also have a bell in the audience because the Aspen team does not roll without a bell, I just learned. Um, so there you go. So if you hear that, you're over time. Um, but these people have all been busy preparing. So Lawrence, without further ado, the two minutes are yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable opponents, uh, today we will uh, sit and stand at a crossroad of history. The march of technology intersects with the fate of our democratic societies. Born and raised in the Rhineland, I'm an optimist, but more so I'm a firm believer in the potential of emerging technologies to uplift, empower, and transform our world for the better. Let's face it, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, no matter how hard we try to grasp it with some sort of legislation, uh, it just slips through our fingers like sand. Instead of condemning uh, these groundbreaking technologies, as the STEAM opponents on the other side will uh, pose, let's focus on the positive impact they already have today, particularly with countries that champion them. Uh, take Ukraine and Taiwan, two young democracies using technology as a shield and sword, providing a lifeline and enabling them to stand firm against authoritarian threats. They understand the power of innovation and defending the very fabric of our societies. Our rivals, they scoff at rules and regulations, exploiting every crack in the system. Do we really want to be left behind while they march forward with supremacy? In a time of division and discord, emerging technologies offer us a common goal, a shared vision of progress and prosperity. Yes, and I'm sure the opponent group will elaborate on these aspects. There are risks with these emerging technologies, uh, which we cannot foresee at this point in time. So dear audience, dear opposition, let us not be swayed by fear-mongering and sensationalism. Let's stick to the facts. Let's trust in the power of innovation, knowing deep down that the benefits of emerging technologies far outweigh the risks. Thank you.
Excellent. That's, that's a man who's practiced. All right. We're moving this at a clip. So, Anna, you're next. You get your two minutes. Stand up. And oh. <laughs> off we go. Oh. Um, hello, fellow pos uh, tech optimists or non-optimists. Well, actually, uh, in real life, I've switched from this table to this table in the last couple of years, and I'm going to tell you why. Well, major reason is like kind of um, high level, because I think in general, no matter what it is, it, whether it's AI, whether it's technologies, nothing you do has to be rooted in fear. Everything, if we, if we want to do something, we want, want to achieve th something, we have to move on the opposite side. Something that is rooted in a courage. And all the risk and all the safety and all the, um, all the entire AI governance field that is basically focused on the risks of AI is rooted in fear. And also, you AI Act that has been the immediate reaction to AI innovation, I think is also rooted in fear and a result of the fear. And that's why I believe that this um, regulation does not have a good um, promise of the impact. And so, moving from that, um, and from my experience building the startup in AI governance and meeting, uh, starting from also, I have, um, I have to admit that I've been doing fear mongering. I've been working on the risk side and trying to work with the companies and convince them how risky AI is. Then I saw a lot of, um, a lot of excitement about the technology and, and a lot of courage and, and a lot of um, desire to innovate this technology. And so um, this was basically sort of uh, something that infected me in some way and uh, made me see how, we, how I explain and how I see uh, today. So um, I think if we want to assess and see risks, the risks, risk measurement and risk assessment has to be rational. Again, rational and rooted in encouragement and rooted in courage rather than rooted in fear and fear mongering. So this is all I wanted to say. Excellent, right on the money, thank you. <laughs> Carolina, you're up next. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm involved with um, uh, countering disinformation, um, also through AI, not only. I've recently been to a conference where someone said what we're facing now, introducing into earlier generative AI into the int uh, information disorder, would be like Google Analytics on steroids. So, of course, these words trigger reactions, for example, similar to what we've been seeing in the survey, maybe. Um, however, um, um, I've also, I'm only working with technology for two years since I entered Corrective and the project I'm working on. And, um, I mean, innovation is there, technology is there, and we don't want to stop it. And instead of just denouncing it or avoiding it, I think we should very much look into how can we actually use it um, according to democratic values or when we're talking about countering disinformation, also according to journalistic standards. Um, and I think journalism and also other fields also already provide quite a lot of positive examples on how we can actually... Um, apply them according to our standards, um, especially in um, fact-checking organizations. There have been a lot of examples um, for cross-country um, cross um, collaborations to form databases, to train um, AI in a meaningful way so that we can deploy it to actually counter this information. Um, maybe later there will be a chance to mention some of these examples. And then the other thing that I would also um, like to point out, it's important that we look into how can we call those who have most data Data, who have the power, who are pushing these technologies forwards to account for the responsibilities. For example, talking about the, um, the big platforms. And um, like what I learned, like working in a tech project for two years now, is actually to not talk so much about artificial intelligence, but rather um, talk about machine learning and deep learning. Because I think um, artificial intelligence, um, the term always gives us a feeling, okay, you need to be like a real expert to get into it. But when we talk about um, uh, machine learning, we know there's data behind and there's people behind who are responsible. So they should actually account for these responsibilities. Excellent, thank you. Everybody has practiced, let me assure you. Yuri, last but certainly not least, the floor is yours. All right. Um, well, two-thirds said it's a risk, so I want to address you directly. How did you come here? By car? By a train? Watching on your smartphone the latest news? All of those inventions were made by people that didn't see just a risk. They saw a possibility of pushing humanity forward. And I think that's what's at stake right now. Um, we are, of course, at a crossroad, be it AI, quantum computing, disinformation, 
Terminator style uh, uh, propaganda where potentially we might be exterminated by a strange alien and I, that we see a lot of risks. And I think it's important to address and accept, yes, there are risks because human history is never a positive or a negative. It's always an incremental change towards a better future. If you look at today's numbers, there was never a better time in history to be alive than right now. And still, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of poverty, a lot of people still living in fear in unfree societies, a lot of fear about the future, about our climate, if we actually uh, mess this up and might not be able to save the planet for our children and for their children. And I think it is an insult to the next generations on this planet to think that we have the luxury to say, no, we don't want this technology. No, we only see problems. Because the past generations have passed the torch to us and said, look, this is where we had it. And there was a lot of issues and a lot of fuck ups, but there was also progress. And if we enjoy this today in our climate room with our smartphones and go back home on our train, on our TVs, and enjoy the freedom and the prosperity that we have, we better make sure that we perch part, our part, play our part in this role, and make sure that technology plays a future and beneficial role to our children. So I hope we get this right and see it as a chance. Thank you. All right, excellent. I don't know if the temperature in the room is changing, but that is for another 70 minutes from now. So now you've heard this upbeat agency focused possibility signed. Here is the Debbie Downer team. <laughs> oh, I kid. <laughs> Perhaps a more realistic team, according to all of you. Mauritius, you get to start. And off you go. Yes. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to join. As of today, we are still um, having a situation where uh, the issue that social uh, media amplifies uh, hate and disinformation is not solved yet. We see emerging technologies um, coming up and proposing already new risks uh, to liberal democracies. First, uh, generative AI enables the production of misinformation that may soon uh, be indistinguishable from authentic content. Uh, for example, in their last uh, parliamentary elections in Slovakia, just during the um, moratorium before the elections, uh, there was a synthetic, uh, syn synthetic uh, audio clip um, of the pro-West uh, candidate being distributed. Um, it was complete, a complete fake, and uh, the candidate was discussing um, allegedly um, election fraud. Um, a big uh, problem so shortly before the election. Second, we should also consider um, the risks extended uh, reality and also the metaverse post because they uh, create new immersive worlds um, that also create more extensive data trails of user behavior. And this uh, presents new risks also for the abuse in terms of targeting and tailoring, especially uh, with regards to politics. And then we also have, not but, last but not least, peer-to-peer -peer technology that was promised as a key technology for digital sovereignty, but it will help to build also more um, federated and fragmented also public spheres. So we, um, we will have to see um, how to, you know, like help developers and platforms to get the things right. And don't get me wrong, these technologies hold promises and chances, but we need to address the risks first uh, before we are overloaded with an immersive technological uh, space where um, yeah, harmful and uh, information and misinformation is flourishing. All right, right on the money. Has he just undercut his argument? I don't know, you decide. Okay, Alexandre, you're next. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to bring you the lens of the geopolitics of technology. Um, technology has always been used to assert hard power and to assert coercion upon others throughout history. Um, and when we think about artificial intelligence, quantum semiconductors, biotechnologies, these are new arenas of fierce competition between great powers, not only the US and China, but also the EU, India, Japan, South Korea, and others. Um, and these technologies also define the future of social relations and the future of the relations in the military realm from the space to the planet Earth, to the very personal relations that we have with each other. 
Think of drones, which uh, were tested firstly in Afghanistan and now are being used at a very large scale in the uh, war that is occurring in Ukraine. Um, think of what might happen if drones start being used also at scale by non-state actors. These are real risks that we testimony nowadays. Um, Think of the current uh, um, conflict, uh, to say the least, between the US, China, but also Europe when it comes to tariffs and trade wars and export controls. Underneath these elements are technologies and is the fear by even government officials of what might happen in the future when these technologies are widely adopted uh, by also, again, non-state actors. Uh, there is an escalation in rhetoric and in practice. The genius is indeed outside of the bottle, and I don't think that we, policymakers, observers, um, and people with responsibilities, can really follow all technology developments that happen every day, let alone control it and ensure that our societies remain safe. And time. Ooh, perfect. Okay, great. Well done. Mm -hmm. um, and an interesting point. Okay, on we go to Doug. Good evening. What renders the threat posed by generative AI so pernicious is that it hides in plain sight. It's capable of producing enormous quantities of seemingly authentic content that can flood the media and political landscape, at best with drivel, and at worst with outright misinformation. This in turn can hopelessly frustrate government officials' efforts to understand constituent sentiment, undermine voters' capability to hold politicians to account for their actions and decisions, and ultimately erode the social trust on which so many democratic institutions depend. I'd like to briefly just discuss three threats. First, legislators struggle to distinguish between genuine constituent communication and AI-generated advocacy. This is true in 2020 when we conducted a large-scale field experiment involving more than 6,000 U.S. state legislators. It is even more true today with the rapid advances in this technology that can't be foreseen. Second, the threat is perhaps even more pernicious when it comes to regulatory policymaking. In most advanced democracies, the locus of policymaking has shift, increasingly shifted from elected legislatures to the administrative state, creating a democratic deficit. One of the ways in which policymakers have sought to address this is by enacting into law procedures to solicit public input on pending regulations and to require, require government responsiveness to that input. Malicious actors have long sought to exploit this process to skew outcomes. However, past astroturfing efforts, as it's been called, were foiled in large part because so many comments were identical. Generative AI can easily overcome this, uh, this limitation, seriously undermining agencies' efforts to understand and respond to the preferences of interested stakeholders. Finally, social media simply gives a mechanism for it to spread like wildfire. The solutions are complex and uncertain, the threats are protean, but it is essential that we accelerate our efforts and make them commensurate to the scale of the threat. Excellent. Thank you, Doug. Right on time. Molly, you, the floor is yours. When it comes to emerging technologies, whether the increased use of AI in almost every work environment, uh, diving into the metaverse, or maybe even moving towards a cashless society, maybe not here in Germany, um, there is still a broad unknown on how our democratic societies will be impacted, but we're starting to get a sense. For me, one of the things that I think of when I consider the impact of emerging tech on democracies is, of course, the 2016 election in the US and everything that we have learned since. First, we learned that the American election infrastructure is vulnerable to cyber attacks. We saw further ev evidence of this following the following year at DEF CON, which is the world's largest hacking conference, where, which I attended in 2017, in two key ways. The first is that it was shown that it would be technically feasible to physically hack American election digital infrastructure. The second is that it proved that we can't just be concerned about the actual election voting machines being hacked, but also uh, that we have to protect the entire infrastructure behind elections, including but not limited to how results are transmitted and reported publicly. Then, and perhaps uh, even most, more relevant today, is that we learned that there was proven Russian interference via social media uh, and misinformation campaigns during that election. 
Since then, the threat of mis- and disinformation has only continued to grow, with the Global Risks Report 2024 naming it as a top risk because exactly, as my colleague said, of its ability to question the legitimacy um, and trust that we have in our democracies. My biggest concern is that we do not have an adequate media literacy nor a strong whole of society approach to effectively combat the threat of purposeful mis- and disinformation. In the United States, only 18 states as of November 2023 required media literacy and education in schools. If a free and fair democracy is a cornerstone of, de of democracy, how can we be sure, sorry, if free and fair elections are the cornerstone of democracy, how can we be sure that our security, our society is actually secure? And time. Great. <laughs> how impressive was that? Right? For two teams who did not know each other before they got together in a big huddle last Friday. Okay, so now, by the way, there are ground rules for every part of this evening. This next phase is a question phase, which is to say team one gets to ask a question of team two, team two gets to ask a question of team one. There is a four minute response segment. You can all decide how you respond. You can pre-huddle depending on what the question is, whether you wanna take it one by one, everybody gets a minute, or you wanna do two and two, or somebody does all four, your call, okay? So you now, no wait, you get to ask a question of Team one, because they went first and their opinions have settled. So, uh, one question, four minutes to respond. Whoever's asking the question, All right. go now. So team one, rising income inequality and the policy failures to help those left behind by globalization and the information economy are widely believed to be the factors fueling today's rising tide of authoritarianism and populism. Doesn't AI risk exacerbating these trends, further straining already vulnerable democratic institutions? Four minutes to respond. This part. Okay, I go first. Um, well, I mean, it's again, it's a, it depends on how you apply it. Of course, you can use it as a, um, um, as a mean to defarious people, but at the same time, I mean, you can also use it um, as a mean to, uh, to integrate people into democracy. For example, there are great um, examples. If we look at um, Estland, for example, if you digitalize elections, for example, that um, the participation rate might increase, or for example, what we're working on at correct. Um, we try to integrate citizens into journalism, into our research, and this is actually possible through civic tech, including AI-based technologies. So again, it depends on how you apply it, um, and also to whom do you actually want to leave these technologies. So. Uh, I would just argue we have two choices. Either we go the way of freedom and enabling people to give them more choices and ensuring that AI helps us, democracies, to be more efficient, or uh, the Chinese global world will actually secure this way because ultimately autocracies are always more efficient because they don't have to care anything about uh, representation or uh, uh, voice diversity. So I would argue that AI actually can help us in this way, and not just AI, we're talking about other technologies as well, to ensure that a Western liberal model of democracies, which, by the way, a uh, report came out this week, is not just under threat, but retreating. Uh, uh, so our model of, uh, how to say, selling democracies abroad and ensuring that people still consider it as a viable and best option for ensuring uh, equality, ensuring safety, ensuring freedom and liberty. Uh, so democracy needs to be enhanced by those technologies in order to make sure it is still considered uh, viable and actually the better choice for living uh, people's and society's life? Well, basically, the government is having troubles to fulfill its contract with the people, provide services that they really need. So who better to do it if we don't have the right people to do it? We don't have the people really going to the public sector want to go, oh, I want to work for the state. So who can we help? Who can we ask? A technology solution. It's actually the only solution that we have to fulfill the contract that was is actually built between the people and the state. We still have time, um, right? Yeah, you yeah. have time. You have uh, another minute and a half. <laughs> yeah, I would. Um, I would just add. Uh, well, I'm not sure what exactly, what kind of research or who actually <laughs> believes 
um, that actually information technologies helped with inequalities, especially with inequalities. Maybe it's now somehow interfering with democra democracy, but I'm I'm firm believer that we are going to find solutions to that if we again like have rather positive attitude to temp uh, to technology and encourage innovation um, in finding solutions rather than. Um, basing our decisions on fears. But in terms of inequalities, I think that digital technologies, information technologies has provided unprecedented access to people who did not have any access before. Unprecedented access to doing business. Even, even myself, I mean, during pandemic times, I was sitting in my home country and I was making business all over the world and I, did not need to be in the U.S. in like the Silicon Valley or somewhere. I mean, it provides a huge um, opportunities, and you cannot dismiss that. It provides huge opportunities in Asia, in Africa, and maybe the major reason why um, why we have an increasing inequality okay. is the result of uh, economic policies, and not the information technologies. Okay, they landed that boat with seven seconds to spare. Thank you. Now. Here comes your, their question for you. Do it. Uh, um, all right, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, you mentioned beforehand what happens if the technology comes to, you know, gets to the people or it gets into the hand of um, not the good guys. Uh, unmanned systems, not the first time we see it in Ukraine, 2014, actually onwards in, in Iraq and uh, Syria. The Islamic State used it against coalition forces. Uh, we weren't the first to use them in the, the small ones exceptionally. And today, what do you see? In Ukraine, it's the lifeline for an entire nation defending against a superior threat. So which is it? You want it? Or you don't? Okay, team two. Off we go. <laughs> we all like the positives, of course. So it's obviously a good thing that if we defend Ukraine and if we believe that Ukraine should win, win this war, then uh, Ukraine should have access to the best possible technology. That's clear. Um, the point is we don't always or only get the positives. And when, um, when we think about drones and how they can be used by non-state actors, we can also think of uh, um, situations outside of open war conflicts where we will not like the outputs. And that's also why we have a responsibility to try to regulate or at least slow down a little bit the pace of technology development and not just let it run freely. That's the fundamental problem. We let it run freely before with artificial intelligence and we had, well, elections uh, uh, being impacted all over the world. That keeps happening. That happened just uh, in my home country, Portugal, for the first time. We had external interference in our elections that just happened last week. So I want the good guys to win all the time, but my good guys are not the same good guys as someone else's. And that's the fundamental problem. That's why we need to find the right guardrails and to adjust our export control regimes, for instance, to make sure that uh, technologies are used in, with at least certain rules so that we don't uh, complain every now and then as we do every day, basically, about the negative impacts. So that would be my immediate reaction. I would just say quickly that the scale of the challenges are just immense and that they're multifaceted. So there are security aspects, there are questions about election security, there's questions about national security and the implications. And on the economic front, I have no doubt that information technology has lifted an immense number of people out of poverty in different places. However, with any sort of economic disruption, there are going to be losers. Uh, and so we have to have an economic policy response for what's going to happen to those who lose from this massive economic disruption that's going to happen in the next five to 20 years. Uh, and if we don't, we should be very prepared for there to be serious consequences, political and otherwise, within democratic societies. I'll go ahead and just add my two cents to this, and which is, um, you know, first I find it interesting that the question was on the weapon systems and not on, uh, you know, the fact that most of us talked about the threat of misinformation. Um, because obviously when it comes to emerging technology, there's, as uh, Doug just said, there's so many different facets to this. Um, and I think talking about weapon systems is an entirely different level that we have to consider maybe outside of the realm of this exact discussion, at least for my per personal preferences. Um, that being said, I mean, I think there's rules of the road when it comes to using technology 
and newer forms of technology when it comes when, in weapons, especially, you know, just to compare it for lack of a better capability to nuclear weapons. Um, you know, we don't want the bad guys to have those either. Uh, and we do everything that we can to stop that. So I think in that regard, there is no reason why we can't do that in this instance as well. Yes, I, I think authoritarian uh, states um, depend, like based on like what we have um, at the ISD found out uh, in the last two years since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, the full-scale invasion, they have been very creative in making use of these um, modern technologies. They have uh, tactics and techniques that always um, adapt to the current state of the regulation. They make use of modern technologies. We've just recently also identified um, more than 60 uh, JetGPT um, coordinated inauthentic accounts on X that spread uh, harmful messages about Navalny. Um, so we see here early use cases already. Uh, one of the largest uh, influence operations was actually about... Um, Last minute inauthentic news sites and just imagine the opportunities of ChatGPT to create such sites. And time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. Faster than the bell. Okay, this is your time to get involved in the debate. We have 14 minutes for you to ask probing questions. That seems like a lot and it seems like we're going to go multiple rounds, but we're not. I need one probing question from one of you to go to team one, and then they will have five minutes to answer that question, and one probing question to go to team two, the con side, and they also will have five minutes to answer that question. And then we're going to, and this is to get your juices flowing, one meta question to give to both teams that they can rebut themselves on and argue across the table. <laughs> Clear? Yes, I'm telling you, you have to do just as much work as they do. Okay, so who has a probing question for Team Pro? Remember, we're all trying to get deeper into the discussion, maybe change each other's minds, so let it not be an easy question. <laughs> oh, see how they're working? Yeah. <laughs> well, clearly they've already made up their minds. It's got to come from you. It can't come from me. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but we might be here all evening. They're all pro. Can't they switch the bright side? They've already switched to the pro side. You're speaking to a convinced audience. Uh, well, ooh, now, now suddenly, see, it always <laughs> there's always that little warm-up moment, even in an Oxford-style debate. Okay, so we're going to go all the way out here, actually, because that hand shot up ever so slightly before yours did, sir. Thank you. How you want to deal with autonomous weapon systems like killer robots? Great. A real easy one for the pro side. Okay. And autonomous weapons, killer robots, five minutes. Go. Well, I well, have more to do with chatbots. Does that count? <laughs> no. 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 You mean like proper weapon systems, right? Well, I would say we talked about, it was mentioned by the team earlier. I think... Uh, the question of technology is never a question of technology is never good or bad. You can use a knife to make a wonderful dinner for your wife or you can kill someone. Yeah? And the same question is when it comes to weapons and the question who uses them. Is it the police protecting a uh, citizen you know, from a harmful burglar? Is it, as we talked about Ukraine, a democracy defending itself against a slaughtering regime that is killing innocent civilians. So I think when we talk about robots and the question of ethics, that's a different ballgame. I think it was mentioned it's quite tricky to answer that in a matter of just a couple of minutes. But when we come to the question of how technology is used in order to do good, and when it comes to military questions, it's, of course, a highly risky one where I would never doubt that there are a lot of risks and a lot of ethical concerns, especially when it comes to the question of human agent and who at the end decides when it comes to lethal usage. But it was mentioned earlier, actually, by the other side, if we want to ensure that freedom and democracy prevails in the 21st century, we cannot use arrows and bows while the other side uh, is going to go into space or is going to... Uh, use sci-fi weapons against us. So I would argue in that case that with your question in mind, we need to make sure that 
free Western liberal democracies are equally equipped as the bad guys who are not going to take a day off and who actually do everything, as we can already see, and as it was mentioned by the other side, with disinformation, with a lot of bad tactics to disintegrate and to completely destroy our democratic societies from the inside. So we got to make sure we are equipped and we are ready, and you're going to kind of come here because we can scare you off. Uh, autonomous systems are not always bad. Uh, obviously, you have to put this in perspective. Um, air defense system, there is no one really pushing a button anymore. So if something, a, a missile approaches a ship, no one in the loop, shoots automatically. No time to actually react on this suspect. So in, in this respect, there are a lot of autonomous weapons or systems already out there. Um, but we are pretty clear on this standpoint. NATO is pretty clear. The Western society is pretty clear. It's the concept of a human in the loop, human on the loop as well. So there's a clear doctrine by Western governments to not go for autonomous weapon systems, where the human oversight is not guaranteed anymore, and basically we have sending something off and it will do something and we don't know really what it's going to be doing. Uh, we have a clear perspective on this issue. The other ones, as Yuri said, they don't. They don't really care about this. They don't really care if the rate of signal comes from an enemy position or their own, really. Uh, this is the disregard for who is really the human being on the other side, because this has to be taken into consideration, whereas we, uh, I believe, as a Western society, take, take care of and take pride in taking care of the people, even soldiers that we send into war eventually. The other side might not be. So we could obviously, yes, regulate it. Uh, we could have ITAR go even stricter regu regulations. Uh, we could have um, more cookie banners uh, because we want to secure a GDPR compliance. Uh, where's the value creation in this? Where it's really not just economic value creation, but the value creation for society and all of this. Um, so yes, it's, it's something that has to be taken serious. Luckily, uh, the Western Hemisphere has taken a clear stance on this. And um, well, where do we want to stand at the end of, our, of all of this? Okay, minute tw 20 to go. A minute 10. Or your side. Uh, I maybe I, I can add. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, first thing, I don't want to sabotage my team members, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to slightly disagree on something um, about the example of knife, which I usually always disagree. So also I have to disagree with it now. Um, well, I would not say, uh, even though I'm in a pro side, I'm very on a positive side of um, use of AI technologies. Usually, um, I don't necessarily see it in all cases as neutral technology. I mean, knife is not as powerful as autonomous um, weapon system can be. I mean, knife has probably just one use case. You can uh, stab someone and kill with it, but uh, the autonomous weapon systems can actually, is much more powerful. It can basically to easily say kill more people at, and maybe it can become unpredictable because it's AI and sometimes it's un unpredictable. So as uh, Lawrence already said, um, Western society has already has its stance on it. And I think definitely there are, and there will be some technologies to actually be really concerned and to either prohibit its use or either be really careful and really highly regulated. And Just time. Like, yeah. See, this is where the gray zones begin <laughs> to happen, which is why your questions are so important. So one question for team two, and I know you've been busy getting that ready. Look at that hand just shot up right there. Practice makes perfect. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you want to, in a way, stop the race. Uh, of technology, right? So if we take the adversaries and the bad guys, um, they will keep developing it. Um, I'm interested in, don't you see the, uh, the opportunity in developing, keeping up the race and also defending our democracies by external influence? And so the question is, why do you want to stop the race, um, improving the technology based on the code of ethics um, of democracies to stop the interference of, uh, in a way, the bad guys. Five minutes and go. Yeah, I may, I may start. Um, I don't think the point is whether we want to stop the development of uh, technologies. Uh, again, the genius is outside of the bottle. That's the idea that I like. And we don't really have an alternative um, because otherwise we'll not be able to defend ourselves. That's clear. Uh, the question is, and going back to the original question that triggered this debate and our position, uh, is um, 
is technology going to be harmful or not to our societies? And our position would be, yes, it will be, regardless of how we keep defending ourselves, because we need to do that. In any case, what we see with development of technologies is that there's an impact in society. Societies are disintegrating themselves. We, he, we know that there, is, there are these bubbles in, in the in, in online, right? So everyone can only see their own point of view. Um, there's less communication, and also there's the divide between, and that's something that was not sufficiently addressed, I believe, in this debate. There is a, di a divide between people who do have access to all these technologies and those who don't. And the communication channels between the two groups are less and less uh, prevalent in our societies nowadays. And that's the problem. It's uh, the realization of the challenge that uh, we are putting forward here tonight, I think. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, th I, I would echo everything that Alexander said. Um, I don't think anyone is saying that we're going to put the genie back in the bottle or that we're going to totally stop. But uh, look, compare this to the situation we find ourselves in with social media. For so long, there was no real regulation of it at all. There was, it was sort of left to uh, the corporate titans that, that developed these tools. Uh, and it was the Wild West. And now we have all of this data that suggests how harmful it is to all of us, but particularly to children uh, and to young people. And it's so much harder to regulate end use products post ex facto than to be proactive with it. And we should recognize just the scale of the threats that we face. Uh, earlier today, it was mentioned uh, transparency and the, the need for transparency. And we, de we debated what the, the meaning of the word is. But what are the training sets that are being used, even in some of the more benign technologies that have nothing to do with autonomous weapon systems? Uh, how are biases that sort of, you know, in the nature of the data that's being scraped, that's being fed into the algorithm, going to reproduce themselves? And with what consequences? And so I think what Team 2 is arguing is not that we're going to shut off the world uh, and that autocracies will have these wonderful toys and democracies will have nothing. Nothing, but that it takes responsible use by all of us to not delegate the decisions over how this technology is going to be developed and how it's going to be used to a handful uh, of very, a very small elite of corporate actors. And instead, it's for whom uh, and under whose auspices. Uh, and that we all need to be involved and we need to go into it very wide-eyed uh, to the risks. Two minutes. To summarize a little bit what Doug said, I think, what we're looking for instead of um, you know, stopping the race is finding the right rules of the road that we can all agree to. Um, you know, and for instance, here in Europe, obviously just last week, the EU AI Act um, uh, was approved by the EU Parliament. And I think that's like a really great first step moving forward, as we saw back in, what was it, 2015 with the GDPR. Um, you need these first steps to continue to be able to move forward in a way where we are being conscious of our ethics, where we are being conscious of the impact on our democratic societies, and we, where we are taking the data that is now available to us and trying to improve on the technologies that we have in a way that ensures that our societies continue to benefit. Yeah, thanks for the question. In 2024, it's 4.2 billion uh, people who will go to the polls, and Gen AI offers huge opportunities for political campaigning. And in their terms of use, they say this is not allowed, but in the reality, we see like actually the tools are used, for example, in Indonesia to create like a, a chatbot to create targeting. So, how can we hold the companies accountable if not by, you know, like um, regulation that applies with our fundamental rights, but that um, I think you also mentioned it, that uh, it foresees code of conduct, that foresees better safety by design. Um, it's not stopping the race, but it's finding an approach that, um, yeah, that goes a along also with our democratic values and with our fundamental rights. Excellent. With 20 seconds to spare. Okay, now, this is the tricky part of the audience participation bit because now you have to have come up with a question that's 30,000 foot enough that provokes both of these teams into rebuttal type answers, right? This is a wholly participatory exercise. <laughs> so, with that in mind, we have two more audience questions. And I'd love to get a woman in this conversation. Oh, now we've set the bar too high. But these people are all prepared. You're, you know, just as on the spot. There you go.
If you're watching at home, we're having a moment in technology here. Hello, hello. No. Yeah. Aha. <laughs> the risks of relying on technology. Um, so I'm going to give this a shot and try and find something that applies to you both. Sure, it's going to be great. I think the, um, the main problem that we're encountering here is the lack of understanding. So humanity has had a um, long track record of implementing things and commercializing them before understanding the risks in depth. Um, and I think um, on both sides, it applies that for the people who are pro-technology and freedom around it, um, there's a lack of willingness to uh, try and understand in depth the risks that might arise, because also that um, might undermine the development of technology. But on the policy side, a lot of the time I see technology and cyber policies being made by people who have the policy um, and the, the geopolitics aspect quite well understood, but not so much the technological aspect understood. Um, so when the policies are drafted by people who don't understand technology, um, then that comes into conflict with the ones who do push the development of technology. So how do we resolve this conflict in order to find a balance between the two sides that you are representing? Oh, that is a great question. I love that for both teams. Okay, fantastic. Each of you has four minutes to respond to this question based on your perspectives in team, and then you can rebut each other for another six more minutes. Yes? Should we start over there? Everybody's looking at me unhappy. Okay, all right, fine. We're starting with team two this time. Four minutes for, from the con side, four minutes from the pro side, and then they get to go head to head one more time. And then of course it's your chance to, for the final vote. Okay, over here, team two, over to you. I'll kick us off. Um, my favorite answer to this question is education. Um, and this really rests in uh, kind of what I was starting to get at in my opening statement, which is media literacy. And generally speaking, more training and um, in general understanding of what the media landscape is, how to think critically about it in a way that is nonpartisan, coming from a very American perspective. Um, you know, the fact that Americans don't even agree on whether or not media literacy is a non, like learning about media literacy is non-biased is schwierig, as the Germans say. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's, it's really disheartening. And I think a lot of this um, can be solved through further education and um, focusing on making sure that everyone actually understands what tools are available to them and um, moving forward on that point. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll chime in. Um, yeah, on, on the one hand, of course, we need um, regulators and policymakers to have a an understanding of technologies. For example, how will, um, how will criminal codes be enforced in the metaverse, for example? How to document actually content on, then on the other side, on the hand of the uh, platforms. But of course, regulators uh, will have to, to get better in understanding the technologies. However, at the same time, um, companies, specifically developers, coders, will also have to have an understanding, you know, like of uh, democratic risks posed by technologies. And they can look at like how were technologies exploited in the past and try to apply this um, knowledge to the current projects. And here we have to become much better. We have to get civil society um, providing these trainings. We, have, uh, we need to have like, good models to provide civil society in turn with funding to provide such trainings. And yeah, it ties in with the argument for education. Yeah, maybe just to yeah, uh, strengthen that idea, I think uh, there is clearly a gap um, in government circles, in policymakers, in the knowledge they have on the technicalities of what they are regulating. I think there is accurate. Uh, but at the, there is also a lack of understanding, indeed, of you know people working on the technologies of the impact they may have. Uh, if you talk with a startup, they will be very excited about the product they are developing. They are looking at the you know the output, the impact uh, that they may have in a specific niche, and the, we need to bring these people together so that the negative effects that technologies may have are at least. Uh, um, yeah, or oh, are addressed in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, so we need more ethics uh, um, and more, a more ethical way of developing technologies. And we also need to educate uh, uh, policymakers. That's missing. And um, yeah, we need to, you know, as with everything in life, we need to, to discuss and sit together and find solutions. Yeah. One last minute for your answer on substance to the question, team two. 
Sure, at the risk of uh, giving uh, Team One uh, ammunition, I think there, there's certainly truth to the, the more regulation that we try to do, especially given the informational asymmetries, it's going to lead to inefficiencies and there are going to be costs to that. Um, however, uh, the risks here are really substantial uh, and some are known and they're clear. Uh, there's misinformation, micro-targeted misinformation, uh, nihilism of people just not believing anything because they don't know what to believe or not to believe and so they drop out of the political process. And then, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to quote Don Rumsfeld, our <laughs> illustrious former Secretary of Defense. They're the known unknowns and you have Turing Award winners that are talking about you know, the, the threat to autonomous AI uh, algorithms that are no longer uh, responsive to human control. Given the scope of the threat, I think that we have to err on the side of taking this very seriously and cautiously, uh, even though there are clear costs to doing so. Okay, 350, yep, four minutes, perfectly on the dot. Okay, your question, or your responses, I'm sorry, to this question. Well, I mean, there's nothing you can say against education. There's also regulation that is respecting the freedoms and liberal democracies. Nothing against that either. But I think you're working on paper here. Because the reality is actually, I mean, we can now lean back and discuss regulation for maybe, let's say, five years. And then it takes another, if you're thinking of an EU level, like another few years until it's finally implemented on a national level. Unfortunately, technology will continue developing. And also, the technology will be applied in, in the time. So I think these um, in different aspects have to happen in parallel. And the other thing is also when we talk about media and information literacy education, we do that a lot at Corrective, and uh, there's a lot happening also to counter disinformation. It's a very fragmented field, but the challenge there is how do we actually reach the target groups that are particularly vulnerable? when it comes, for example, to disinformation. And there, actually, if you're looking at innovative ways um, to, um, well, to spread the word and to educate people, why not use, for example, AI te and technologies to, to do so? So there's so many, I could name so many great projects who, who, who are doing this. And um, just leaning back now, first educate everyone and keep them away from the technologies and first regulate and not apply the technologies. I think we will definitely lose the, um, the race. Absolutely, and I think if regulation is your primary answer, then you're already lost. Regulation is an utter battle cry for people that don't really foresee and predict what's happening. Why? Because as the team mentioned, we can only regulate what we can understand. The problem is, and believe me, I work with a lot of politicians, a lot of them don't understand what they're voting on. Actually, the vast majority, you get your papers in the morning, you say you're going to vote yes on this, you're going to vote no on that. Do you actually think those people who make the regulation for us know what they're voting on? No. Uh, and that's a sad fact, and I actually think to even go further, if we want to save democracy, and as it was mentioned, and I couldn't agree more with the threats that you highlighted, being from disinformation and others, we need to reinvent the system. The operating model is the problem. Uh, bureaucracy is the problem, because our processes take way too long. And if I think about a friend of mine uh, who came from Ukraine, who uh, is a doctor, and who took him six months to get a license because the, uh, the, the administration was not able to translate his document in time, when AI could do this in a matter of a day, and he could actually start working, saving lives the next day, he would be willing to do so, but he's not able to do so. And I think when we talk about all this matter, what we need to understand, we need to go beyond our typical toolbox of thinking. And when we just say, oh, we got to regulate this, we got to educate here, that sounds nice, but it's not going to change the issues of the problems of tomorrow. We got to anticipate how technology is going to change our educational system and what we can do about it and then predict what our good resources in order to regulate, yes. But we first got to see the opportunity and the chance and the innovation. When we talk first about regulation and shut everything down, we're going to lose. Um, before I get to the policy side, when it comes to technology, there's one thing we could all do, it's called open source technology. The more we know about the technology and the more people know about the technology and know what has been coded somewhere, the better we'll be able to detect threats, work with them and implement them in better and non-harmful ways. Um, but on the policy side, it's, is it really technology? Or is it, if, if someone spreads misinformation, is technology to blame that it works? Or is it the narrative of a state, a government, or politics 
that is not strong enough to people to convince people that, well, this sh is stupid. This is a narrative that I don't agree with. Uh, you see that in Scandinavian countries. Uh, if a narrative is spread about how good Russia is, they are pretty exactly knowing where this is coming from. They have a strong narrative. They have a strong position. They have a common view on what is good and what is bad. So basically, policies should direct into this direction which has nothing to do with technology, but do people trust in what we say? All right, that caps it. Nope, you're out of time. Okay. <laughs> But now is the time when you can debate one another because this is the open rebuttal phase, my favorite time. Uh, six minutes each side because you went last with your arguments. You now get to aggrieve them and they get to aggrieve you for six minutes. And go. Maybe I'll, I'll just start. Um, yeah, you um, already tried to capture um, current regulative initiatives as, you know, like breaks to, to progress. Um, let me clarify that um, frameworks like the AI Act or the DSA uh, or the DMA, they are like very innovative open. They are open to technologies. This is like why some people, um, even who would argue on ours, I'd say they are not specific enough because they are already so vague so that they are technology friendly and they already have exceptions for sp particularly small uh, and medium-sized companies, um, including startups. Um, at the same time, um, we also, of course, from the regulator side, have to support companies in being compliant. Imagine an instance owner um, suddenly having to fulfill specific content and moderation notice and takedown mechanisms. Um, if they don't do it, if they don't have the pl plugins, for example, yeah, we will see a lot of um, um, problematic content flourishing on these technological innovations. I'll just go ahead and jump in quickly. Um, I think on one point that Lawrence or, or Yuri said, you know, misinformation actually is not a new concept, right? Um, we used to call it propaganda. <laughs> uh, and it just is really the technology that has changed how we receive it and how prevalent it has gotten. And, you know, both between misinformation and disinformation, of which there is a very clear difference, um, which I'm not gonna get into the technical definitions and purpose of time, but my point being, mm -hmm. our strategies have to evolve um, and we have to deal with what makes us different from how it was before. And so in that, in, in, in that point of view, this is where we need the shared rules of the road, the regulation, the at least, if it's not regulation, at least norms, um, and understanding of how we want to move forward to defend our democracies from some of these threats that are being adversely affected because of the role that technology is playing. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on something that was said earlier, uh, that our democratic model is retreating and that technology is the only solution. I don't really think that's true, per se, because technology was also what led our democratic models to retreat in the first place. So we need new norms, indeed, to make sure that uh, um, technology, at least in our societies, is used in a way that is uh, uh, in line with, uh, with our values. Um, and the technology should not be blamed because it works, but that's, that's removing the human agency of the discussion. Technology works because engineers make it work. Uh, uh, that's not really the point. The point is what do we want to do with this technology? And to what extent do we want to protect our societies um, from what this technology can be can can do if it is misused, and that's where we, we humans and at the politician and and the policy making level and the politicians level needs to 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 be addressed. We need to have a, a more a knowledge and information being shared between civil society uh, um, and the policy making circles to make sure that our uh, uh, um, our focus is clear and to make sure that we just uh, um, that, that, that we, we use technology in a proper way. Um, technology itself is nothing without what we make uh, out of it. You have one minute. Two. Sure. And change. 
Okay, uh, quickly, I, I, <laughs> I like the line, if, if regulation is the answer, you've already lost. And uh, there's got to be some truth to that. However, I'm sort of reminded of the, of the Churchill quote, you know, it's the, it's the worst damn response except for all the others. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I would ask, what is, the, what is the response otherwise, you know, if it's not government involvement in some ways? So some of it might be regulating the technology and the way in which it's employed or uh, mandating open source or, you know, various things that are, that are beyond uh, uh, aspects that I study. But I think the other aspect of the policy response that does require recognizing the, the different nature of the threat posed is just that there's going to be fallout. There are going to be winners. There are going to be losers. There are going to be inequalities. So there are some things where regulation might do a good job at, which is sort of finding, uh, you know, sources of bias when you get biased results, when they're reinforcing existing biases in, in society. Are there ways in which we can uh, regulate against that? Because after all, these would be uh, having AI perform roles that previously were not done by AI, and they're against existing laws. So it's just sort of finding ways uh, to ensure compliance with this new technological world that we, that we will be living in over the next five to ten years you know, with our existing uh, values and, and in many cases with our existing laws, but also really taking uh, seriously sort of what are going to be the results of, of the implementation of this technology uh, across the economy uh, and having a, a policy response to it and that it's in large part uh, uh, failures, uh, uh, policy failures in the past to other major economic disruptions that have caused a lot of the problems, uh, political problems that we have and the, the uh, challenge that the democracy faces, and that if politicians are not attuned to that, or we as democratic citizens aren't attuned to that, and encouraging our elected officials to think about how we're going to mitigate the, the, the potential uh, negative effects for millions of people, uh, even as many others are our advantage, that, that we will have lost a great opportunity and caused a lot of problems for democracy. And time. Six minutes to rebut. Okay, I start. Um, yeah, I do agree on all of your points. Basically, AI is unprecedented technology with its benefit, and it is also unprecedented technology with the risks. It is really high risks. Like, for example, even ChatGPT could be able one day to teach someone how to make a chemical weapon just right in their garage, just buy some, some of the uh, materials in the pharmacy and make a weapon. Um, it's really high risks, but between right and wrong, there is a field. And in this field, we innovate AI as much as possible, but we also innovate on governance as much as, much as possible. And when I say governance, I don't necessarily mean regulation because I don't believe regulation is a good solution in a way that regulation is static, while AI is adaptive and AI is moving very, very fast forward. Even with the EUAA Act, we saw that how much longer it took when ChatGPT has been launched. It stretched the entire process for one more year at least. So we need to innovate something at also, also a technological solution probably for the governance. And this is also what I'm trying to do, what our startup has trying to do. Like uh, when I say end-to-end -end solution for AI governance, I usually mean not only software solution for AI governance, but also social innovation solution for AI governance. And this has been my biggest work um, recently in the last two years. Before the software, the most important part for me personally is to innovate on social innovation, to create some different kind of approaches to AI governance. That that is able to address different contexts of AI applications because AI is highly context dependent and it is not static, it is adaptive and moving. So we have to also move with our governance solutions as well. Um, I got a wrong window. Um, yes, you're right. Um, actually, I'm, I'm surprised that you mentioned that perspective that technology should be made in our views and not should in inherently have our perspectives. Uh, I agree. Uh, the other ones don't. But the other ones are investing 150 billion plus, that other country being China, um, basically outnumbering in, in every facet possible, just putting more weight into this game. Um, and our answer is regulation. Uh, regulation which is not flexible. Um, up to, well, basically, I'd say last year, December, what was really cool was was called scaling law. So basically, the bigger a language model gets, the more it can do. And that's when we put regulation in place. Well, since then, we go the opposite way. It gets smaller, very smaller. Every week, it gets smaller and more, more uh, performant, actually. 
So we have regulation which doesn't take this into account, and here we are. Uh, what now? How, how do we go around with this? And isn't it basically, because you, you mentioned Donald Rumsfeld, in another context he said, uh, if there's a 1% chance, <laughs> um, there is a 1% chance. Um, the other ones are not going to shy away from it. Uh, the other ones are not going to go, oh, they have regulations. Oh, they're developing something. But where are we in this race? And I, I, I really admire the question that was raised in, from the audience. It was like, all right, and I believe we're not one to all uh, stop with this race. But we can't. It's simply that we can't. The outcome, you say, would be questionable, unfortunate, potentially positive. I don't see it. Uh, if we don't command where this technology is heading, we have to set the rules. And whoever owns this technology gets to make the rules. It's something that social media has taught us over the last years. If you own the technology and you champion it and you're the sovereign of this technology, you set the rules. So we should, yes, we should win this race. And I don't see why we should not. I'm just going to weigh in a very simple question. Do we believe democracy is in a good state right now or we don't? And that's actually to, to the two-thirds in the audience who said that we predominantly see risks. Because our societies are eaten from inside out from populism. People are not happy with what's going on in the capitals. People are not happy with the results governments are producing. People are not happy with the regulators trying to figure out what all these complex problems should produce. So I would argue what you just highlighted is a lot of nice talking. But the question is, are we able to deliver results to the people? Because if we don't, we will see very quickly, easily, slowly, one democracy dying after another, fa falling to the lurch and the promising tales of populists. We might see it in the US again this year. We might see it at the European elections. We might see it even here in Germany at the state elections this fall. So my question is, can technology, and this is the question at heart, help us? solving those problems that our democracies are inherently flawed and inherently incapable of solving? Or do we believe it's too dangerous, we got to stick away? That's the question I think we all have to ask ourselves. 40 seconds, Carolina. Yeah. This has been like a very strong word at the end, I think, but um, to me the answer is obviously quite clear. And one thing is, um, also we've been talking a lot now on regulation, and I don't think that we want to be the anti-regulation team or anything. It's only that, and we have a lot of positive examples from journalism, actually, where we believe in co-regulation. So there has to be a framework, actually, that sets certain rules, um, but also then also needs to be self-regulation from the sector itself um, to actually make sure that, um, uh, that to safeguard democracy. And I think we can also apply the same ideas, actually, when we think about, for example, um, AI regulation. And then the other thing is, maybe we have been talking a lot about what we can do, for example, against this and misinformation, but we can also tackle the whole um, topic from another perspective, and this also concerns policymakers. What, when we, what can we do for good information, for facts, and for democracy? And time. Fantastic. I'm really impressed at the level of debate that we've had and the speed at which we've had it. I think also the comprehensibility of which we've had it, because I have had no problems following. But what I have learned is that in both sides, there's a fair amount of overlap and potential gray space and gray matter, which makes your task none the easier right now. Because your task now, having listened to both sides, including this rather spirited rebuttal, is to revote the question. And so I ask you again at home, here in the room, to reopen your Slido app, to reach for the device that now harbors your innermost secrets, <laughs> and uh, vote again. And I will give you the questions again, because maybe now, despite all of these clarifying comments, you might be a little confused. Team one, the pro team, was arguing, has been arguing for the past 70 minutes that new technologies, AI, quantum computing, we didn't get to biotech, we didn't get to synthetic computing, we didn't get to those issues, but that's for another debate, have great potential and will enhance open, just, and democratic societies. Team one, the pro team. I'll remind you that they lost in our first poll. Team two, new technologies, pose a risk to open just democratic societies and could easily 
undermine them. You've heard a couple of ideas on regulation, on education. You've heard other ideas on forecasting, get ahead of, getting ahead of the wave, moving away from politicians making decisions, framing that debate. So you now have another about three minutes and 20 seconds to make your voice heard in this vote. We'll put the vote up again. I've just been told that we'll first see the slides, but then ultimately Slide. we'll see some percentage points. So yeah. is it already, well, is it still, it's, yeah. it might still be running because people still have two minutes. So we'll give everybody two minutes, but I will remind you that this conversation was nothing if not full of rich quotes, and I will give some of them back to you because uh, I will certainly use them. If regulation is your primary tool, then you've already lost. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we had the, the critical point that if, of course, you do not educate your legislators to make the kind of decisions and change the entire gambit of learning within a society to get ahead of these problems, you will lock yourself out of the kind of ne necessary decision making we need moving forward. And with 20 seconds on the clock, that, oh, I have a feeling it's still moving. It is beginning to, we're beginning to close on out. <clears throat> How narrow, uh, see, we're going to need the percentage points, Aspen colleagues, because uh, this is within a hair's range of voting. Okay, and with that, I have nine seconds to go on our vote. Somebody correct me on time, but that's what I've got. Yes? Okay, I know. It's the anticipation in this room is just palpable. I can, I, ah! Okay, so it's, according to me, one person voted, and now uh, here, at least, it's neck and neck. But we're going to need those percentage points. OK. And scene. OK. Can we so also vote? If you're seeing what I'm seeing. We need a second for the percentages. Yes, I know. That's why I'm filibustering over here. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're seeing what I've seen, this team did a pretty good job, yes? Because. Those sliders have slid. Thanks, Slido. Uh, those sliders have slid. And they have slid so much that we have, quote unquote, met at least sort of in the middle. Because as I think you're taking away from this first day of this incredibly timely and relevant conversation, because as the ambassador said this morning, we're of course heading straight into a spring, last spring debate. Uh, in the EU-US Trade and Technology Council, after which its entire nature might be transformed. We might be having these conversations again on a bigger scale through the G7, but that these conversations and the way that we think public policy for the 21st century, the way that we think our democracies for the 21st century will be vital in terms of how we govern, the way that we defend ourselves, the way we educate ourselves, and most importantly, the way we prepare the route and road for the next generation. So with that, let's, can we see how close our percentage points actually are? Beginning and end. Okay, let me get out of the way. Okay, so the very risk adverse group, remember you were all con in this room, or 65% of you were, 35% of you, these people had to win back 20 some, per, almost 20 percentage points, and they did. Look at that. All right, so 14 points plus, percentage points plus for our pro team here, narrowing the gap within a 2% statistical error range. I say that deserves a huge round of applause <laughs> for our debaters who kept it timely, crisp, to the point, but made, I think, all of us see where our agency needs to go because I think all of you have proven so vividly what it needs first and foremost is agency and all of us in this room. So thank you again for doing this, for preparing so exceptionally well, for being here. Thanks to Aspen and thanks to all of you. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we're gonna do a group picture.
<laughs> and um, I don't think I promised too much before the debate about our wonderful moderator. Time to give her a big applause because that can be very confusing. So while all of you come up here and the picture is taken, <laughs> I want to thank you again for being here until the very end and for engaging. Um, this concludes the first day. Um, we have another whole day lined up tomorrow with very exciting um, speakers to join us. For example, one of Biden's economic advisors. Um, she's going to be here on the ground, but she's joining us virtually. That is going to be exciting. We are going to have a fishbowl discussion in the morning about the future of transatlantic relations. We're going to talk about sustainable trade and we are going to have breakout discussions on export controls, technical issues, but also competition and digital issues. So please join us. Get ready to get engaged. This concludes the first day. Um, for the speakers um, and for our sponsors, we have a little dinner prepared and the team can tell you where that is going to be. And for the others, please join us tomorrow morning again and we are very much looking forward to it. And thanks to Baden-Württemberg and our sponsors again. So thank you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. And thank you so much for my wonderful team. I mean, they have been working so hard in the back to make all of this possible. So yeah, give them a big shout out.